A very warm and good morning to all dignitaries on the dais and the dignitaries who are virtually with us. All the head of the department, of the faculty members, staff members, participants and dear students and all to the inaugural function of two days national webinar on agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation organized by Junagadh Agricultural University under National Agriculture Higher Education Plan under IDP Junagadh. Let's flow with the richness of Junagadh Agricultural University in be witnessed of invocation song of Junagadh Agricultural University, Hey Samas Jagatar Prashivuram, presenting a invocation song. Hello, Dr. मैं तो काफी देर से डेड हूँ Oh, 
गाथा गुर्जरी मेहमान नवाजी से भरी भूमि प्रेम शौर्य सुशोभिता आतिथ्य में अपराजिता समस्त जगत कृषि मूलम है संस्कृति कृषि वसलम शिव क्षेत्र सागर सोम का ठाकुर बसे श्री द्वारिता सागर सोम का ठाकुर बसे श्री द्वारिका गांधी सुदामा भक्त नर सिंह की कथाए वैष्णवी है समस्त जगत ऋषि मूलम है संस्कृति ऋषि वसलम Namaskar and good morning to all, honorable chief guest, honorable president of today's function, respect guests of honors and special invitees of today's inaugural function, all vice chancellors of other SDAU, SAUs, expert lead speakers, deans and directors, head of departments and research scientists, faculty members, students, distinguished guests. members of press and media ladies and gentlemen i cordially welcome you all in this two days webinar on agriculture residues and waste utilization for energy generation organized by the college of agriculture engineering and technology junagadh agriculture university junagadh under the aegis of nahep idp icar i feel proud privileged to welcome our chief guest of today's function respected sri rc pardu sahab the honorable minister of agriculture rural development and transport a great visionary for the state agriculture department development and farmers welfare a well regarded personality his continuous support and encouragement for the development of agriculture universities in the state is and 
the encouraging the faculty and the students sir i cordially welcome you on the behalf of honorable vice chancellor junagadh agriculture university junagadh and the jau parivar i hearty welcome the president of today's function and honorable vice chancellor junagadh agriculture university junagadh respected dr vp chotia sir sir it is your uh, motivating force and always with us and helping us to organize this kind of the national importance event under his leadership junagadh agriculture university has received many distinctions including the rank first in recent review meeting of the idp nhep sir i cordially welcome you in this inaugural function it is my immense pleasure to welcome guest of honor of today's function visionary and outstanding personalities exemplary experts in renewable energy and agriculture engineering area the great administrators embedded with incredible zeal to action dr ns rator saab honorable vice chancellor mpvt udaipur and former ddg education icar new delhi dr bs negi saab the advisor ministry of new and renewable energy new delhi dr algu sundaram saab the ddg engineering icr new delhi i am also very much delighted to welcome all the special invitees of today's inaugural function and renowned personalities dr r m chauhan honorable vice chancellor sdau sadar krishnagar dantiwada dr d d jagdale joint secretary ministry of new and renewable energy new delhi dr k k singh saab the adg engineering icr new delhi and dr vk vijay the professor iit delhi and national coordinator of unnat bharat abhiyan i warmly welcome our director of extension education dr h m gaji prasad director of students welfare dr v r malam deans of various faculties dr n k gotia sir dean of agriculture engineering and technology faculty dr p h taksab the dean of veterinary science and fishery science dr k a kuntsab the principal college of agriculture and dean of abm faculty dr s g savliya sir the dean of agriculture faculty and the principal college of agriculture mota bandaria dr p monoth the associate director of research junagadh agriculture university junagadh and dr k c patel director of it jau junagadh i also heard hearty welcome all the chairmen co-chairmen of different technical sessions dr murari sham former director sprayri volavidya nagar and uh, project coordinator aicrp on renewable energy shores dr sudhir jain professor and head department of renewable energy mpvt udaipur dr sailesh bhai makadia the radha energy group rajkot all the expert lead speakers dr sandeep gangil the head agriculture engineering division and lcpc uh, crp on ea ci bhopal dr sunil dingra and dr n k ram the terry new delhi dr a k sharma principal scientist uh, sadar saran singh uh, national institute of bioenergy dr maduri nara the spray anand dr dadich the head of department soil science and agriculture chemistry sknau jobner dr anil pawar research scientist mpvt udaipur dr dk vyas the anand agriculture university godra dr jyoti the director of sustainability kis group bangalore dr ragunath ceo and md kis group bangalore mr vijay kalawadia the ceo radhe group rajkot i also welcome all the head of departments college of agriculture engineering and technology who are present here particularly dr uh, uh, hd rak dr uh, uh, rajveer yadav dr kb jala and uh, dr dr mn davi as well as i also cordially welcome all the head of departments of uh, all the colleges and uh, uh, who are joined here with online faculty members students of the jau all the members of organizing committee distinguished guests members of press and media and uh, all the students and faculty of other universities ladies and gentlemen friends as you know that india has more than uh, 
683 million tons of crop residues of different crops are produced of which major part is the used for as a fodder fuel and in various industrial process however about uh, 178 uh, million tons of surplus crop residues are available around the country it is estimated that about uh, more than 87 million tons of surplus crop residues is burned in different crop lands and due to this it is estimated that the crop in situ it releases the 627 kilotons of uh, pm10 and 406 4,677 kiloton of carbon monoxide to the atmosphere annually in India, as well as large quantity of other agriculture waste, as well as the animal dung and others waste also available for the energy generation. The successful strategy is required to mitigate the challenges. Also, it required to develop a road map for sustainable utilization of crop residues and other waste. this can be achieved through encouraging the farmer to switch over to other cropping cycles which have low lignin content as well as to promote the conservative farming all over the country to reduce the soil compaction and to maintain the soil fertility utilization of crop residues in state level power plant enable mechanism of crop residue biomass aggregation create market for crop residues based briquettes decentralized use of crop residues and gasification biochar and other uh, other products the training program or this webinar will is aimed to improve the overall uh, competency of the undergraduate students of the university along with the strength of the existing academic institute licensing and to improve the entrepreneurial skill among the undergraduate students once again i cordially welcome all of you in this two days seminar thank you jai hind thank you sir for your warm welcome with the words now it's time to welcome with the fragrance of flower and for that i would like to request dr p m johan sir to welcome our honorable vice chancellor of university dr b p jovatia sir with the fragrance of flower Thank you, sir. As per our Indian tradition, we start, we begin with every function with enlightening the lamp to have the positiveness, positive energy. For that, I would like to request all the dignitaries to join the lightning ceremony to open up the inaugural function of this two days national webinar on agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation. <laughs> Thank you, all the dignitaries. We are energized with the positive energy, and we are ready to open up this two days strong deliberation on the given theme. Now, moving with the flow, I would like to request our special invitee, 
ADT Engineering, ICR, New Delhi, and the esteemed faculty members and personality, Dr. K. K. Singh, sir, to say a few words on the occasion. K. K. Singh, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, most respected uh, chief guest, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Gujarat, Shri R.C. Fadu Sahab, respected Vice Chancellor, Junagadh Agricultural University, respected Vice Chancellor, MPUAT, Dr. N.S. Rathor Sahab, Dr. K. Algu Sundram, DDG Engineering, other Vice Chancellors, faculty staff of Junagadh Agricultural University, and experts in uh, renewable energy field. Dr. Chohan has briefly informed about availability of crop residue in the country, as well as surplus crop residue in the country. I will briefly inform about uh, what are the programs and plans of government for crop residue management for energy generation. Uh, as you all know that National Green Tribunal has been working for last three, four years for reducing the uh, environmental pollution. Recently, Commission on Air Quality Management has been uh, constituted. So government of India is having uh, very uh, big scheme on crop residue management. So not only this scheme, Indian uh, tractor industry is largest in the world. Indian power machinery industry is second largest in the world and worth about $10 billion. Indian food processing sector is worth 30 trillion rupees. So, but especially for crop residue management, government has central sector scheme on promotion of agricultural mechanization for in situ management of crop residue in the states of Punjab, Haryana, UP, and Delhi. During last three years, about 1800 crore rupees have been uh, released to different states. And during last three years, 10 power machines were subsidized for management of crop residue in the field in situ itself. And during last three years, more than 1.5 lakh machines have been supplied to farmers on subsidy. Around 31,000 custom hiring centers have been established. Also, there is a scheme on submission on agricultural mechanization since 2014. So since 2014, 12.67 lakh machines have been sub supplied on subsidy to farmers. This is huge amount. And under submission on agricultural mechanization, more than 27,000 custom hiring centers have been established. As a result of this, India is net exporter of agricultural machines. Just for some idea, uh, in Indian exports, of agricultural machinery is around uh, $1 billion and import is around $400 million for last two, three years. So net, India is net exporter of agricultural machines. So out of uh, 1,800 crore rupees, Punjab got maximum amount about uh, 800 uh, crore rupees, Haryana around 500 crores, UP around uh, 374 crores, and Delhi, very meager, four crores. So 
not only machines, these machines were given to farmers on subsidy. There was subsidy of 50% for farmers and 80% for custom hiring centers as well as group of um, uh, group members like societies, etc. So, and in this scheme, all other government schemes are on 60-40 basis, means 60% to the uh, from the center and 40% from uh, state government. But this scheme is 100% uh, uh, supported by central government. Not only these machines were supplied, but a lot of uh, information, education, communication activities uh, were conducted by uh, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, KVKs, and state governments for showing the benefits of crop, crop residue management and environmental and soil health pollution. You will be surprised to know that during last three years, around 1,900 awareness programs were uh, conducted, more than 28,000 demonstrations, around 700 training programs, 130 Kisan Melas were conducted at Panchayat and Block and District level. Student mobilization programs were conducted, around 1 lakh students of 800 schools were involved. For wider publicity, around 10 lakh leaflets, pamphlets were distributed, around 260 TV programs and panel discussions were organized. 3,000 3, hoardings were placed, 35,000 posters, banners, and so many advertisements in print media. Again, this uh, residue burning is not only the problem of North India. In North India, mainly paddy residue burning is there, but in Central and uh, Southern India, uh, Central India, uh, maximum wheat residue burning is there. So Indian Council of Agricultural Research is monitoring crop residue burning events throughout the year in all the states. We have seven multiple satellites. So 14 locations of each and every um, place is monitored every day. So this is very accurate data. And we are informing all the state governments monthly that this is the burning uh, events in, in your state. And we write the uh, letters to chief secretaries wherever uh, uh, the maximum burning is there. Punjab is the uh, burning maximum rice residue and Madhya Pradesh is burning maximum wheat residue. So with this tremendous effort, uh, during uh, harvest season in North India is uh, 1st October to uh, 30th November. So in Punjab, Haryana and UP, burning events were monitored. So during 2019, the burning events were about 19% less than 2018, 31% less than 2017, and 52% less than 2016. So around 52% reduction in three years. But during last year, there was a little uh, increase in burning events in Punjab due to farmer protests. But in Haryana and UP, still uh, the burning incidences reduced. So, but last year, not only in C2 management, we tried to promote ex C2 management options also. Then, the machines like balers and rakes were also included in uh, this scheme, uh, but there was a cap on subsidy. So not only uh, farm machines are being supplied, but government is promoting uh, replacement of short duration, uh, replacement of long duration varieties to short duration varieties. And during last year itself, there was a reduction from uh, 8.3 lakh hectares to 4.8 lakh hectares in Punjab itself. Short duration varieties, which will ultimately result in uh, no burning or less burning. And not only 
this replacement with short duration varieties also crop diversification was uh, emphasized and during last year itself uh, the area un uh, under paddy reduced from 31.4 lakh hectares to 27.3 lakh hectares so now around 4 lakh hectare area under paddy was reduced in punjab with this effort and area under cotton increased from 1.1 lakh hectares to 2.4 lakh hectares area under maize increased from 2.4 lakh hectares to 5 lakh hectares almost double area under sugarcane increased from point like 0.9 lakh hectares to 0.95 lakh hectares area under burning during 19 2019 only 1.1 million hectare out of 3 million hectares in punjab was burnt that was 36% reduction in 2018 it was 1.5 million hectare in 2017 it was 1.8 million hectares so continuously decline in burning area also again government is planning for some ex situ management options there are various ex situ management options like conversion of crop residue biomass into pellets and utilization of biomass pellets as a fuel in power plants this scheme is going on second one is industrial level plant for production of compressed biogas or bio cng from paddy straw ministry of uh, bio, uh, petroleum and natural gas is working on network for bio cng supply through existing uh, network of uh, petrol pumps another option is alcohol production from paddy straw and composting of paddy straw utilization of agro agro residue based power uh, biofuel for power generation these plants are working some plants are working on uh, partial uh, residue load but recently during last two years 200% paddy straw based power plants are there in operation and they are supplying power to the grid and they are earning um, to the tune of around 15 crore rupees every year by investing uh, around 150 crore rupees also uh, this option of uh, bio cng or compressed biogas uh fra is uh, uh, most promising and it may be integrated with existing retail networks of oil psus and other industries relying on gas based energy it will provide off take assurance for crop residues to the compressed biogas project developers and government has allowed procurement of ethanol produced from uh, other non food uh, non food uh, uh, feed stocks but paddy straw based um, ethanol uh, power projects are coming in a big way so out of uh, these different ex situ management options industrial level production of compressed biogas and bio cng seems to be most promising and sustainable option of crop residue management here it is win win situation the biogas or uh, bio cng provides energy and digested straw may be re recycled in fields to maintain soil health in long run however this is very capital intensive option so establishment of a plant of 40 ton uh, straw per day handling capacity may cost around uh, 35 to 40 crore rupees so we have given all these uh, possible options to commission on air quality uh, management and they are uh, um, consulting with different uh, ministries and uh, these are still at the planning stage and hope very soon uh, some uh, uh, big scheme may come under ex situ management options also so uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for providing the real statistic on the topic and thank you for your valuable time now moving with the flow i would like to invite 
joint secretary mnre new delhi and the esteemed personality dr d d jagdar sir to say few words on the team. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Good morning. Uh, Namaskar, sir. Welcome, sir. Dr. Namaskar. Dr. Namaskar. Dr. Thank you. Uh, all the excellencies, dignitaries, uh, Honorable Minister uh, for Agriculture, Rural Development, Transport, Government of Gujarat, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. VP Kovatia, uh, other dignitaries, esteemed guests, my dear students. Uh, it is it is extremely pleased and honored to be amongst you on this day when we are really debating and uh, looking at the tremendous opportunities that the agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation uh, brings to all of us. This is a very important subject and has been dealt by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy uh, by bringing various options uh, before you. I think my previous speaker deliberated on the various aspects that have been taken, including the programs that are conducted by the ministry. Uh, the oldest and the largest program that this ministry has been uh, really implementing is the biogas generation, uh, which has evolved over the last four decades. And still the, the, the potential that it exists and the amount of research that it, uh, it provides is tremendous to utilize the waste that is generated uh, uh, in the from the agriculture sector, uh, let me give you a brief about uh, our our renewable energy aspect. And in fact, uh, as you all are aware, that we have a massive target of uh, had a massive target of 175 gigawatts to be achieved by 2022. And uh, further, our honourable minister has given us a an, another milestone to be achieved by 2030 is 450 gigawatts. So the ministry has been coming out with various programs to deal to achieve this ambition, and this ambition is is bringing a lot of competition, a lot of competitiveness amongst different technologies, uh, different resource streams. We have seen the growth of solar for the last decade. We have seen for the growth of wind for the last uh, two to three decades, and uh, the aspect of energy extraction from agriculture residue. Uh, has been implemented by the ministry since last 25 years, right from Pegas-based cogeneration to biogas generation, biomass uh, combustion-based burning, and uh, the programs keep on evolving. The, 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 the amount of energy extraction options keep on evolving. Uh, today, as you all are aware, we have 10 gigawatt plus of energy generation, energy generated out of the biomass, uh, which includes Pegas-based cogeneration. And I'm pleased to state that we had conducted a, a resource revaluation study last year. And the total amount of energy that can be extracted by the, from the surplus agriculture residue has now gone up to almost close to 42 gigawatts. So this 42 gigawatts, and this keeps on increasing. Today we are at 10 gigawatts, so that brings us an another opportunity uh, to really enhance our areas in the field of research into this sector. What are the various options that can bring on to the table by, by extracting energy out of the agriculture residue, which includes waste and the organic waste. And of late, the two programs uh, which have been evolved, one obviously the biomass-based cogeneration, and the, the other is the program on waste to energy. Now, waste to energy includes biogas, bio CNG, and we also included the municipal solid waste to power. So all these elements have been now supported with uh, central finance assistance by the ministry. Bio CNG, which is, uh, which is now supported under the Satat program of the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. We at MNRE are giving uh, a, a central finance assistance to assist the production of bio CNG from the organic waste. And this waste to wealth mission, which is now being really taken at the government of India level, will see a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, revolutions in the, in the sector. We see a lot of investments coming into the sector. And for the research, government and the, 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 the academia, the government and the industry. And we appeal to these three sectors and we as a government I will be keen to really participate in the research programs that would bring, uh, that would come out uh, with various options to extract energy out of the agriculture residue and uh, waste and utilize the waste for extracting energy. I'm pleased to also share with you some of the other highlights that the ministries and country is progressing. We are one of the uh, few countries that have been now selected as the global champion for energy transition. 
uh, when we say it, this has been done by the United Nations and we'll be representing at the United Nations during the upcoming uh, summit in September 2021. So what makes us a global champion? Now, when we look at the various programs that this ministry and the India government is doing in order to move towards a clean energy transition, that is where actually the India comes up with such massive programs. Today, our installed capacity of renewable energy is close to 92 gigawatts. We have a somewhat around 50 gigawatts under various stages of implementation and, uh, and few other, few another 20 gigawatt odd would be and at various stages of tendering. Now, when such massive programs are implemented, what it has given to the ultimate consumer is the cost benefit. Such competitive nature of this industry has brought the cost of energy generation to a, to a level of almost two rupees for a solar generation. And if you look at the yesterday's wind auctions, it is almost 2.8 rupees per unit is the cost of renewable energy generation. So it has breached the, uh, the marginal cost of fossil fuel, uh, gener the energy generation from fossil fuel. And that is where renewable energy has been playing a very, very major role into the, into the sector. Going forward, we have seen the, the every decade comes out with a new revolution. The next uh, revolution that we expect, and India has already announced its entry uh, into the hydrogen mission uh, when Honorable Prime Minister declared that we would be go going for a national hydrogen mission in the budget. Uh, Finance Minister, Honorable Finance Minister also supported this during the budget speech. So ministry is coming out with a, a draft on the national hydrogen mission. And this also provides an opportunity for uh, producing hydrogen from the agriculture residue from the waste and several technologies along with the academia can be looked at uh, to produce hydrogen out of this. Where hydrogen as an energy carrier will provide a very, very clean method, clean transition for the very hard sectors to decarbonize, such as uh, whether it's fertilizers, whether it's steel, cement, aviation, and other mobility sectors as well. So there is a massive growth. Uh, students and together with uh, with the research organization that are present in this in this esteemed forum today uh, we at the ministry would definitely support any that initiative that comes forward uh, to bring in cost competitiveness to increase the efficiency to to bring in more avenues from to extract energy out of the waste and it would be our honor we also have a national institute of bioenergy which is very uh, which is promising in terms of uh, working on the biofuels and the biogas sector so together it's basically it's this this forum which i uh, which i would think would really lead and i would look forward to the outcome of this uh, this webinar uh, at the end of the program about what are the new methods that we really look at what is the expectations from the ministry to support the academia and the research together to, to enhance our capacities and to bring cost competitiveness to move towards a cleaner transition as our goals are increasing day by day and uh, it would be my pleasure to look for your report, uh, Professor, at the end of the webinar and, and really uh, take the feedbacks that really emerge out of this uh, to move forward and, uh, and really discuss and deliberate. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, live webinar. Uh, I would look forward to all your uh, feedbacks and uh, from ministry, uh, we would endeavor to work together towards the clean energy transition goal of this country. Thank you, uh, all the esteemed guests, delegates, and uh, thank you. All the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining and uh, highlighting the schemes of the Ministry of Non-Renewable and uh, new, new and Renewable Energy. And uh, really, we are very pleased that uh, you have given a very uh, informative talk. Thank you very much, sir. For thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, moving ahead, I would like to request Vice and Honorable Vice Chancellor of MPA University <coughs> and guest of honor of today's function, Dr. A. S. Rato, sir. To give remarks on the occasion, Dr. A. S. Rato. Ah, good morning to one and all. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, Junagadh Agriculture University, Chowatia Saab. How are you? I, I am really grateful that uh, you always remember me on such an occasion. Uh, Dr. P.M. Chohan Saab, um, Registrar of this uh, university and other faculty members, like, uh, those who are organizing this uh, uh, 
uh, webinar on a very special issue that is agriculture how to use agriculture residues and waste uh, utilization for energy generation i understand that our minister might have discussed some of the issues and my previous speaker might have given some information related to uh, uh, that how we can trap the agriculture residues and how we can use this for a power generation or energy generation so thank you thanks a lot uh, as far as uh, in present context is concerned uh, you must be knowing that uh, uh, india is, is standing on third position as far as the uh, wa world at world level as far as the total electricity production is concerned and same thing is true with the a third level we stand on the position as far as the, our electricity consumption is concerned uh, the, as far uh, uh, in the month of a march uh, uh, last march the total electricity production was around 3 lakh 70000 megawatt of electricity and uh, if you see that around 57% is from the fossil fuel based power plant which has got a uh, total efficiency hardly of 41% because uh, here uh, mainly <clears throat> the process of conversion into mechanical energy because it has got a three steps uh, uh, electricity generation one is that a chemical energy is converted into the thermal energy uh, with the help of a some boiler which ha which has got efficiency more than that of a 90% but unfortunately the turbine which is being used to convert the this energy into the mechanical energy they are highly inefficiently hardly 55 or 60 percent efficiency the most of the turbines are working and later on the mechanical energy is converted into electrical energy if you combine each and everything then uh, theoretically one can predict that uh, hardly of a 41 percent of efficiency is being obtained uh, with the help of a our fossil fuel based power plant and uh, at present uh, we have got a, a 50 around 57% of our electricity with the help of fossil fuel that it is a highly inefficient i can say but we don't have any other option that's why we are more dependent on this 15% is with the help of hydro hydro is a part of new and renewable energy sources and exclusively wind and solar they uh, come if we combine that around 21% of uh, electricity generation is with the help of a wind and solar and if we combine hydro wind and solar then around uh, you can say 36% uh, is the contribution of renewable energy sources and remaining 6% from the natural gases 1% nuclear 1% diesel that is the scenario prevailing but basically thing is that a, a, when we are talking about a conventional uh, centralized electricity generation which is uh, predominantly based on a fossil fuel based power plant which has got a very low efficiency and then they are being generated at a some common place and then distributed then transmission and distribution came into the picture unfortunately in our country theft is also a uh, dominated and then if you combine transmission distribution to the extent of 25% loss, losses and 10% of your uh, theft and other thing so hardly of 10 or 15% of the things will be available at the users end and that's why in a present contest for a country like india which has got being distributed in a 28 state and eight union territory and very a different type of terrains are available mass many places we have got a, a hilly area where electricity transmission distribution is also a, a a problem that's why in a present contest everybody is talking about a decentralized electricity generation either with the help of solar energy or uh, wind energy or bio energy in the field of bio energy i would like to congratulate uh, junagadh agriculture university that uh, they have selected a very good uh, a topic that uh, how to make use of agriculture residues and waste uh, for the purpose of energy 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 generation in uh, our country different type of statistics are available but if you see through the google and search engine then we can easily find out that around in our country per year around 400 to 450 to 500 million tons of a biomass per year is available and roughly i would like to mention that a, a in case if you have got a 1000 tons of uh, waste material then you will be in position to produce 50 megawatt of electricity and but the cost of establishment is around 800 crore and roughly 20 tons of a biomass is required 
पर मेगावाट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिसिटी जनरेशन विद एक्सपेंडिचर अबाउट सिक्सटीन और टू सेवेंटीन करोड ऑफ ए एक्सपेंडिचर सो दैट्स वाई देर इज ए पॉसिबिलिटी दैट वी कैन स्किप स्पेशली द ट्रांसमिशन एंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन लॉसेज एंड इवन वी टू सर्टन एक्सटेंट वी कैन रिड्यूस द थेप्ट इन केस इफ एग्रीकल्चर रेजिड्यूज एंड वेस्ट कैन बी यूटिलाइज डिसेंट्रलाइज डिसेंट्रलाइज वाइज and at the point where electricity is required and at the point itself we can generate electricity and in present context as well there is a a need to promote the changes from energy dependency to the energy autonomy we want that we should not depend on a gujarat electricity board or rajasthan electricity board but we should have our own autonomy as far as the electricity or energy generation is concerned even we we are not supposed to always speak on electricity it is energization which is more important and it is not a for all purpose it is not a electricity which is utilized but we can use the a different type of sources for getting a energy say example we if you are interested for pumping out water it is not advisable to use the your electricity for the purpose of this one in case if it is a shallow shallow well a depth well so here you can use a different type of a liquid fuel for the purpose so it is more important that we should have energy availability rather than electricity availability and as i mentioned that a, in case if uh, uh, in case if we have got energy autonomy then definitely we will shift from external control to the self reliance and in energy field uh, when we are talking about uh, atmanirbhar bharat perhaps uh, Uh, it is a one of the option that if we are interested to have a self reliance and uh, in the energy field then we are supposed to trap the, some renewable energy sources and agriculture residues and waste uh, are a quite promising option so that's why in a present context everybody uh, most uh, everybody used to say that uh, there is a need to change from centralized electricity generation to decentralized in electricity generation and perhaps uh, agriculture residues which is available in a bulk quantity it can be easily used for the purpose of a energy generation or even most of the waste material i don't want to cover the all waste material because list is a quite long it is start from a, a you can say forest waste or agriculture waste or a woman waste or your kitchen waste or industrial municipal solid waste there are lot of different type of waste are there which are creating a nuisance in the environment that's why there is a need to control uh, their nuisance effect uh, with the help in case if we will convert them into the energy sources and it it is observed that a, as far as the biomass is concerned whether it is a energy plantation or a, any tubes and bushes or gra grasses or any organic material which is available as a result of a agriculture operation or forest uh, um, uh, operation and uh, it has been observed that there is a uniform distribution uh, of a biomass over the world surface and it is it is in contrast with the finite source of energy that's why biomass uh, is not only giving the uh, feed and fodder and fuel fiber and fertilizers but mainly it can be used for the purpose of a process seed or it can be uh, used for the purpose of electricity generation it has also been observed that a less capital intensive conversion technologies are available as far as when we are using the biomass for the, for the purpose of a power generation and attractive opportunities are available for the local and regional and at the national level as well and it has been observed that as a example in our country when we are talking about hilly area vindhyachal area or aravalli area so on this hilly area lot of a biomass availability is there they are being ultimately creating a a new sense so that's why and even uh, it has been observed that a techno economical viability of a an energy generation with the help of agriculture residues and waste is quite promising and uh, there is a drastic reduction of a greenhouse gases with the help of a, a agriculture residues and waste if you are converting it in, into and making a combustion process and that's why it uh, offer a lot of opportunity to the farmer and to the entrepreneur and even to the rural population so that's why we will have to see that how we can use it um, and, uh, and there is a, a, a important thing that a generally biomass or agriculture residues which we are using uh, we use uh, using uh, for uh, for the purpose of getting a heat and then 
for the purpose of a cooking energy and even process it even if you see the traditional cook stoves it has got a hardly of a 10% of thermal efficiency so nowadays a improved cook stoves or smoke less is uh, cook stoves are available which can enhance the thermal efficiency to the tune of 25% or so so generally uh, for if we are interested for biomass and if you want to see that uh, why biomass uh, and how biomass is uh, utilized in every body life we can easily say that uh, when biomass is burned and the stored energy is released in, a, in the form of a heat and that can be utilized for the purpose of a process heat or cooking purpose even many different type of biomass is available uh, wood chip is there corn and some type of a garbage and they are also garbage is also creating a nuisance in the environment and they can use to produce a electricity number of successful event has been um, observed at a number of places and people are using it and biomass can be easily converted into liquid fuel that is called as a biofuel that is also an option i am sure that one of our few of our speaker will also elaborate that how we can use but this is a general uh, observation our statistics gives an impression that uh, if uh, when the bio scope of biomass is uh, considered as a traditionally then approximately 18000 of megawatt of electricity one can easily produce and but if we combine and expand the scope of biomass then at least of a 50000 megawatt of electricity with the help of available biomass we can generate in our country and this biomass may be wood or agriculture residues or solid waste from the municipal municipality even landfill gas is a option biogas is also option alcoholic fuel like ethanol and methanol they are also good option in this case and uh, when we are talking about wood it is not a, a refined wood but a small logs and chips and bark and sawdust and uh, which account around 44% of the biomass energy one can easily use in our country last year it it was observed that we have produced around 112 million tons of a rice and as a result of this this around 34% of a uh, rice straw uh, of a 352 million tons of a agriculture residues we have produced with the help of a rice uh, because last year the statistics gives that around 352 million tons of a crop residues and which includes around 34% of a rice straw and 22% the wheat because last year uh, our wheat production was around 106 million tons and whereas uh, rice production was 112 million tons but the interesting thing is that uh, around 352 million tons of a uh, agriculture residues was available and if, um, if you see that uh, most of the things uh, whether it is a cotton chili pulse and oil seed residues they are mainly used for a household purpose but uh, if we consider wheat maize jowar bajra and ragi and other thing these residues are mainly used for cattle fodder but even then if a, some option is available at the farmer end they are ready to sell their crop residues provided they get a, some decent remuneration and alternatives that is a basically observation and uh, rice, uh, rice husk is mainly used in a boiler it has been observed successfully even ntpc has shown this thing that uh, we can easily use it so basically a, uh, we can prep the crop residues for the purpose of electricity generation for that a, a, on a mission mode we are supposed to work on this uh, there are a lot of uh, different type of uh, options are available under thermal Uh, thermochemical conversion for a process direct combustion is a one of the op option incineration uh, which is being used for heat generation is also option pyrolysis or destructive dis distillation or charcoaling is also option and which lead for further if you will add more of air then it uh, pyrolysis process will reduce to the gasification lot of updraft downdraft and cross draft gasifier is available i am sure uh, our uh, other speaker will uh, give a more light on that how we can and what is a basically difference between a destructive distillation pyrolysis uh, charcoaling and, a, and even a gasification uh, what are the internal uh, anatomy is there as far as the updraft downdraft and cross draft gasifier is concerned even biochemical conversion process there are lot of alcoholic fermentation process is there anaerobic anaerobic digestion and uh, even, even aerobic fermentation is there bio phytolysis and hydrogen reduction there are a lot of processes are available i don't want to go in in 
in detail in this case but as far as the agriculture residues is concerned if you see in a in a malina in a philippines a 3 megawatt of electricity plant is established based on a dendrothermal power generation system a dendrothermal means a, in fact when we are saying there there are two option of electricity generation with the help of agriculture residues and waste one option is that let us externally burn this biomass and in externally combustion engine heat of combustion gases that can be used to run the gas turbine or gas engine or steam vapor turbine or steam vapor engine there are different type of thermodynamic cycles are being utilized if you are externally burning this biomass then it is known as a dendrothermal power plant and successfully in a philippines a 3 megawatt of electricity plant based on a therm dendrothermal power plant is available if a steam or organic uh, vapor which we are generating if we are trying to uh, moving through the gas turbine then a breton cycle came into the picture as far as the thermodynamic cycle is concerned i don't want to give a technical terminology but simply i would like to mention that a, there are different type of thermodynamic cycle like breton cycle stirling cycle ranking cycle in a stirling cycle the heat through heat exchangers we are supplying the uh, the heat heat of combustion gases through the gas engine and uh, uh, successfully once you will run this stirling engine then you can use for a electricity generation even for chaff cutting or uh, or even for a uh, water pumping and successfully stirling engine has been uh, tried up to the level of a 10 hp stirling engine um, and similarly in a ranking cycle steam and vapor turbines are being used or steam and vapor engines are used that is a basically the a internal uh, flu, uh, things uh, as far as the dendrothermal power plant is concerned in a gasification process a important thing is that a uh, prior to gasification process we will have to see what is a densification densification means a, how to increase the density of a loose biomass and with the help of a uh, different type of a methods available like your, your briquettings and um, your uh, pelletization or cubing you can convert the different type of loose biomass into compacted one so that a transportation cost and storage cost can be minimized so uh, once the densified forest material or densified agriculture residues are available then we can go this material <coughs> under gasification the gasification is a basically a type of a parcel combustion where a limited air or whatever air uh, which is entrapped within the fuel is being used for the pur pur purpose of combustion it is not a complete combustion but it is a type of a reduction where a, a gas is being generated that is basically known as a producer gas it can be used for the purpose of a running of diesel engine and petrol engine i think our dr tk bhattacharya sahab is also sitting in our uh, group so he will give a more of light on this uh, this aspect i don't want to cover but i would like to mention that uh, there is a good scope in case if agriculture residues is to be trapped because in most of the village if you visit uh, outside of the village you will get a different type of a smell it is because of a organic matter which are there available nearby the village pond or somewhere and uh, they are being uh, buff, uh, started uh, a type of a fermentation and as a result of this they are badly smelling and same thing is uh, true in a uh, most of the uh, urban area as well where the municipal solid waste is creating a nuisance in the environment so that's why it is it is must that a some uh, some technique is to be utilized how that a how successfully we can use the agriculture residues and waste utilization for the energy, energy generation so uh, with these words once again i would like to thank give my sincere thanks to all of you and i i understand that uh, this conference will be uh, 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 attended uh, and uh, dr algu sundaram ddg engineering will also give some of his uh, of views and dr k k singh has already uh, discussed some of the thing my old friend dr b s negi from i don't know whether he will join but he, i have seen his name in the list so he is also advisor to our mnre so definitely he will also discuss uh, i don't know sir he is there is all right there? okay very good uh, very good i can see my two old friend dr tk patacharya and uh, dr bs negi both are there so and that is good uh, place uh, with the help of this type of webinar we came across with our friends uh, 
and uh, with this word thank you very much dr chauhan and uh, vice chancellor of this uh, university for giving me this opportunity thanks a lot to all of you thank you sir thank you very much thank you, thank you sir for highlighting the hope of this uh, my residents and we will try to enter the maximum advantage from that so now moving with the flow i would like to request honorable vice chancellor of sba sardar kushinagar and special invitee of today's function dr r m johan sir to highlight on the theme namaskar sir namaskar, namaskar. Uh, chief guest of our today webinar and uh, honorable minister of agriculture rural development and transport government of gujarat respected sri ashish patu sir uh, guest of honor and honorable vice chancellor mpvt udaipur dr rakesh sir uh, dr algo sundaram sir dg engineering icr new delhi dr vidhi chotia sir honorable vice chancellor junagadh agriculture university uh, dr pm chauhan rajista and uh, his organizing team all the distinguished guests members all dean directors and all attendees joining with me for a thoughtful event organized by junagadh agriculture university under the banner of NAHEP IDP so it is my pleasure to share my views on this auspicious occasion of national webinar on the subject agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation agriculture residues are highly potent but under utilized part produced post production of agricultural commodities crop residue on the soil surface are responsible for cooling the soil increasing the soil moisture and limiting evaporation crop residue protects the soil from erosion and serve as source of carbon crop residues are being burned openly which contribute negatively to the environment especially rice and wheat straw are set up to fire intensely by farmers with a view to destroy those easily and to combat insect pests and weeds the consequences of this burning practices are very harmful like loss of nutrition of the soil emission of harmful gases and sometimes out of control fire hazards destroy many standing crops and wild life renewable energy is expected to play a significant role in power generation despite highly developed agriculture sector there are only a small number of biomass power plants which burn progressively to identify possibilities for renewable power generation the quantity of crop residues their energy potential and potential electricity generation should be analyzed the production system of biomass is labor demanding mainly in its operation and maintenance such employment enhancing development opportunities could come to an important role in economic means to raise the level of development in rural areas the other important economic facet of biomass system are the much lower investment cost for job created compared to industrial projects petrochemical industries or hydropower plants several low cost by products are generated in the production and conversion of biomass which can be successfully utilized to enhance rural economies this includes livestock fodder tree and grassland streets branches and fields for use as fuel wood and conversion of waste products to emit for for rural resources 
renewable energy sources and technologies have potential to provide solutions to the long standing energy problems being faced by the developing countries india the second largest agro based economy with around the year crop cultivation generates a large amount of agriculture waste including crop residues according to the ministry of new and renewable energy india generates on an average of 500 million tons of crop residue per year however there is still a surplus of 140 million tons out of which 92 million tons is burned every year majority of this crop residue is in fact used as fodder fuel for other domestic and industrial purposes in the absence of adequate sustainable residue management practices stubble burning in punjab and haryana in northwest india has been cited as major cause of air pollution in delhi the solution to crop residue burning lies in the effective implementation of sustainable management practices with government intervention and policy there is an urgent need for efficient machinery for collection handling and transportation of agricultural waste for conversion of bio energy into green fuel the revenue of energy generation from agriculture residue and waste will help the farming sector to become energy self reliance and extra income agency central pollution control board punjab pollution control board and environmental prevention and control authority initiated the process of mapping volume for crop residue and locate the exact crop burning locations i am here with saying some initiatives to be adopted for the effective utilization of agricultural residue incorporation of crop residue into soil through adoption of conversion agriculture practices to prevent soil erosion from wind and water and to augment the soil moisture incentivize purchase of head ap seeders turbo seeders shredders baling machines and zero seed compatible fertilizer drill to facilitate in situ management of crop residue and retaining the straw at surface mulching promotion of use of crop residue for preparation of bio enriched compost vermi compost and its utilization as farmyard manure promotion of use crop residue for process heat electrical power generation and production of cellulose ethanol in ppp mode promotion of collection of crop residue for feed bricks making and its transport to fodder deficient area use of crop residue for paper board and panel and packing materials there are some key technologies available for conversion of agro residue to energy namely biomass gasification in which gasifiers of different fuel features and capacities are available to convert variety of crop residue to produce clean sand gas and produce of gas for thermal application other biogas plant which is farmers friendly technology converts biodegradable materials so easily into clean combustible gas and in addition to that it provides rich fertilizer to promote organic agriculture and other in brick machine which can be used to make fuel bricks by densification of biomass waste it has a large application in boiler industry that replaces traditional black coal and by pachar a fine carbon rich porous product obtained from thermochemical conversion of crop residue called pyrolysis at low temperature 
in an oxygen free environment it mainly interacts with the soil matrix soil microbes and plant roots help in nutrient retention and set off a wide range of biochemical processes just like in other rural productive activities bioenergy requires clear established legislation and property rights since the product energy is related to different markets and thus different marketing rules it is very probable that its commercialization from the field to the final user crosses different paths than that of conventional agriculture or forestry produce the energy use efficiency of biomass is i think the most hindering parameters in the utilization as a fuel source i hope that during this two days technical deliberation the renowned scientists will highlight how to mitigate the environmental issues along with increasing the energy use efficiency of the biomass i am sure the national webinar on agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation will inculcate knowledge about the importance of energy and its judicious use among the participants with these words i look forward to having fruitful session and and request all students and faculty members to acquire the best of this technical week i extend the organizers a grand success and fruitful outcome in the benefit of farmers and scientific communities thank you bharat mata ki jai thank you for your very good work and hope well, this is for the event moving to the flow now i would like to request advisor mnr government of india new delhi dr g s neeti sir to say few words on the topic the village function thank you sir namaskar yes uh, namaskar namaskar thank you uh honorable minister of agriculture rural development and transport government of gujarat sri r c fazlu ji dignitaries distinguished participants ladies and gentlemen men it's a great honor to be part of this group to address such an important event the theme of which is highly relevant in the present scenario where agriculture residue and waste are posing serious threats to environment and which if processed properly has tremendous potential for energy generation and climate change mitigation i congratulate junagarh agriculture university for organizing the webinar and want to thank them for inviting me to participate in the in the seminar i come from uh, ministry of new and renewable energy therefore i would uh, like to begin with a brief uh, uh, background big uh, introduction about the renewable energy development uh, in the country and finally then i will come to the theme of the event are you all are aware mnri is actively engaged in promotion of uh, renewable energy for various applications across the country you are aware there has been visible impact of renewable energy development and deployment in in an, in indian energy scenario during the last 6 years renewable energy for us in india is associated with enhancing energy security and providing environmental sustainability it also provides lifetime energy solutions to inhabitants of how thousands of remote villages and hamlets decentralized energy systems solar home and community lighting systems irrigation pumps aero generators biogas plants solar cookers biomass gasifiers waste to energy projects solar water heaters solar concentrators for industrial process heat applications and improved cook stoves are being used in the 
most remote and inaccessible areas. The widespread dissemination of such simple but extremely useful renewable energy products are supported by the government. Solar energy provides us with the ideal resource to provide clean power across the length and breadth of the country. The enhanced target of 175 renewable energy power by 2020 set by the government in 2015 has given impetus to renewable energy power deployment in the country. As a result, the total installed grid power generation from renewable power has crossed 90 gigawatt, close to 23.5% of the total installed capacity in the country. It was around 6.45 during 2015-16. Solar accounts for approximately 38 gig gigawatt, out of which four gigawatt is generated from rooftop systems. Wind accounts for around 39 gigawatt installed capacity. And there has been you know, significant cost reduction in power generation from solar and wind, uh, as also was highlighted by uh, Mr. Jagdale, Joint Secretary, in his, in his address. In addition, 14 gigawatt, approximately, 14 gigawatt is produced from off-grid projects. Renewable energy-based, distillized, and distributed applications have benefited millions of people in Indian villages by meeting their cooking, lighting, and other energy needs in an environmental friendly manner. More than 55 million biogas bio plants have been disseminated across the country. Recognizing the vast potential and the success in SPV power deployment, the government is aspiring now to achieve 450 gigawatt capacity from renewable energy by 2030. In SPV, high efficiency with manufacturing quality, reliability, and warranty conditions are key elements for the success of SPV power projects. Looking at global experience, huge investment on technology development and innovation have played a key role in vast, in fast development and deployment of SPV power across the globe. The SPV technology is developing fast Currently, efficiencies of SPV modules in the range of 20 to 22 percent have been reported by lead manufacturers. Atmanirbhar Bharat, I mean, the, uh, launched by the government uh, recently, is an important step taken by the government of India to strengthen and augment manufacturing capabilities and capacity in the country. For solar PV, the recent launch of the performance linked scheme, PLI, by the government of India for high efficiency SPV module is a great step to boost domestic manufacture of high efficiency SPV modules in the country. It gives ample opportunity to Indian SPV development uh, industry, SPV industry, to invest on R&D for technology development and development of production technology scaling up its manufacturing capacity of SPV modules with quality at global level. Looking at the perceptible large market in India, export potential and the rich experience, the industry has to gear up its efforts, mobilizing investment and collaboration with lead overseas manufacturers for development and manufacture of high efficiency, advanced solar cells and modules. Now coming to the theme of the event, biomass-based generation is one of the major focus area of renewable energy program in the country, in India. MNRA has been promoting bioenergy through combustion, cogeneration, and gasification power for power generation applications. Bioenergy is also being promoted for biogas generation, utilizing different wastes, different feedstock as fuel for cooking, power generation, and bio-CNG gen, uh, generation. Waste to energy projects have also been supported for energy generation. The strength of biomass residues in India mostly lies in agriculture sector. It has already been uh, talked about uh, in detail by, uh, by, by Dr. K.K. Singh Saab and Dr. Rathor. I have not heard uh, the earlier 
the, uh, the, 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 the uh, lectures of their less speakers. I mean, Dr. Vijay has also attended, he must have covered most of the important issues. However, crop residue bio assists, bio masses are distributed resources that is also known with variation in availability and its characteristics. Overall, India produces, I was going through some literature uh, yesterday and found out that uh, uh, overall uh, production in India is 686 million ton gross residue biomass on annual basis of which 234, 234 million ton, which is approximately 34% of gross is estimated as surplus for bioenergy generation. Stubble burning adds significant emission load to our already choked cities. And we, and, and in, in the R&D and some demonstration activities have proved that uh, biomass pellets are the most, are one of the most efficient biofuel manufacturing processes to produce coal substitute. So therefore, the focus of utilizing the agriculture residue should be not only including this uh, subtal, which is a serious threat to our environment, should be not only for biogas generation, but it should also be for processing them for producing pallets, which can substitute uh, coal in our power generation stations. Urban and industrial waste to energy, waste to energy projects also offers tremendous potential for environmental protection and energy generations. Every ton of waste processed avoid one ton of CO2. It reduces the volume of waste by 90% and has great potential for green jobs. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential on harnessing these agriculture residue as well as the waste generated from uh, industrial municipality and uh, urban areas. And I was going through the, uh, the, the technical program of the event. I'm really impressed with the technical program of this webinar, which covers all important aspects of agriculture residue and waste for energy generation. And I'm sure this webinar will give us some new ideas to take this sector forward in a more secure manner. I'm of the view that concerted efforts are needed to develop a strategy with action plan for mapping agriculture residue and wastes at state level to utilize these biomasses for energy, uh, effectively for, uh, for, for energy generation in cost-effective manner. With this, I wish the webinar a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining the webinar. And I hope that uh, in future also, uh, the seminary will certainly that uh, will take uh, uh, the, uh, our collaboration with the university. Thank you very much for the joining the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now it's time to listen an esteemed personality and Arida Chair Professor CRDD. NC, Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, MHRD, Government of India, IIT Delhi, Dr. B.K. Vijay, sir. Sir, we are honored to have you and time to listen from you, Dr. B.K. Vijay, sir. Hello. Ah, ah, Vijay. Just a minute. Vijay, eh? So, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, Junagad Agricultural University and other eminent speakers. Thoda camera ko apna chehra thoda niche ja raha hai. Thoda camera ko. Ah, good. Thank you. Thank you. 
and my friend and colleague professor pm chauhan so ye jaan ke badi khushi hui ki now you are organizing this webinar related to agricultural residue and waste utilization for energy generation jab se covid hua hai tab se aap dekh rahe hain ki puri duniya badalne lagi hai hum bhi badalne lage hain और पूरी दुनिया का जो ग्लोब है जो इकोनॉमी है जो सिस्टम्स हैं उसमें बदलाव आ रहा है मैं पिछले साल भर में एक कार्यक्रम है शिक्षा मंत्रालय का उन्नत भारत अभियान उसको देखता हूं, उसके लिए कोऑर्डिनेट करता हूं देश भर में तो उसमें उद्देश्य ये है कि किस तरह से हमारी हायर एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट अपने आस के गाँव को गोद में लें उनके साथ काम करें अपने स्टूडेंट्स को वहाँ पर भेजें अपने फैकल्टी मेंबर्स को वहाँ के भेजें ताकि उनको समझ में आए कि जो रियल लाइफ चैलेंजेज हैं जो सिचुएशन है हमारे देश की वो क्या है और उनके डेवलपमेंट के लिए हम सब अपना सहभाग दें देखने में ये आया कि जैसे मैं आईआईटी दिल्ली में पढ़ाता हूँ मैं अपनी क्लास में जब पहली क्लास लेता हूँ तो स्टूडेंट से पूछता हूँ भाई कितने लोगों ने गाँव देखा है सो सो सवा सौ की मेरी स्ट्रेंथ होती है हर सेमेस्टर में तो उसमें से मुश्किल से दस बीस लोग इस बीस लोग बीस बच्चे ऐसे होते हैं जिन्होंने गांव को देखा है थोड़ा समझा है अस्सी परसेंट जो हमारे को आई में पढ़ने वाले स्टूडेंट्स हैं उनको पता नहीं है कि गांव क्या होता है कैसे होता है क्या रियलिटी है देश की और अभी भी देश की लगभग सिक्सटी एट परसेंट पॉपुलेशन गाँव में रहती है तो हमें समझना पड़ेगा कि हमारे देश को अगर विकसित होना है आत्मनिर्भर बनना है तो हमें गाँव की समझ गाँव की इकोनॉमी और जो हम बात कर रहे हैं बायो इकोनॉमी और क्लोज सर्कुलर इकोनॉमी उसकी बात करनी पड़ेगी पिछले साल भर में जब देखने में आया कि पूरी दुनिया का जो इकोनॉमी है वो किस तरह से अमेरिका की इकोनॉमी किस तरह न्यूयॉर्क की इकोनॉमी इस स्थिति में आई कि वो अब भारत की तरफ देखने लगे हैं हमारी जो ट्रेडिशनल फिलोसोफी है जो हमारी कल्चर है जो हमारी सोसाइटी है हमारी सॉल है उसको पूरी दुनिया बड़ी गहराई से देखने समझने की कोशिश कर रही है हमारे प्रधानमंत्री उसको लेके आगे बढ़ रहे हैं कि किस तरह से हम अपने गांव को हमारे कस्बे को हमारे शहर को हमारे देश को आत्मनिर्भर बना सकें तो ये सब व्यवस्था में जब देखने को आया कि जो एग्रीकल्चर की खाली कंट्रीब्यूशन जो पचास से ज़्यादा हुआ करती थी सैंतालीस से पहले अब तेरह चौदह रह गई है इकोनॉमी में और सबसे ज़्यादा रोजगार अगर देश में सब लोगों को देते हैं तो कृषि और कृषि उद्योगों के माध्यम से होता है तो हमारी जो पॉपुलेशन है आज अगर पढ़े लिखे दस करोड़ से ज्यादा लोग बेरोजगार हैं उनको रोजगार भी चाहिए गांव में चाहिए अगर शहर भरते गए आज दिल्ली की स्थिति यह है कि हर अक्टूबर नवंबर में इतना पॉल्यूशन हो जाता है कि सांस लेने के लायक स्थिति नहीं रहती कम बेस सभी शहरों की यही स्थिति है तो हमको सोचना पड़ेगा कि हमारा डेवलपमेंट का मॉडल क्या हो हमें किस तरह का डेवलपमेंट चाहिए हमें किस तरह की सोसाइटी चाहिए हमें किस तरह के रिसोर्सेज को यूज करना पड़ेगा आप देखिए कि पिछले सौ वर्षों में जो हमने डेवलपमेंट का मॉडल एडॉप्ट किया वेस्टर्न मॉडल ऑफ डेवलपमेंट उसमें उस हमारी सॉइल पॉल्यूटेड हो गई हमारा वाटर पॉल्यूटेड हो गया हमारा एयर पॉल्यूटेड हो गया हमारी हेल्थ पॉल्यूटेड हो गई हमारा माइंड सेट पॉल्यूटेड हो गया तो अब हाइस्ट लेवल पे ये सोच आई है कि नहीं हमें आत्मनिर्भर बनना है हमें जो क्लाइमेट चेंज हो रहा है उसको प्रोटेक्ट करना है और उसमें रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी और एग्रीकल्चर सिस्टम्स को भी यूज करना पड़ेगा ताकि हमारे गाँव की सर्कुलर इकोनॉमी बायो इकोनॉमी की जो हम बात करते थे और जो आत्मनिर्भर गांव की बात करते थे गांधी जी का जो सपना था उसको हम चरितार्थ कर सकें तो अभी इस विषय पर बहुत वक्ता ने अपना प्रवर्तन दिया है और समझाया कि किस तरह से हम एग्रीकल्चरल रेजिड्यू और वेस्ट को यूटिलाइज कर सकते हैं मैं खाली दो वीडियो छोटे दो दो मिनट के दिखाऊंगा आप लोगों को और बताऊंगा कि किस तरह से हम लोग उसमें मदद कर सकते हैं एक वीडियो है आईआईटी दिल्ली का कि मैं 200 घरों से किचन वेस्ट लेता हूं बायोगैस प्लांट में डालता हूं बायोगैस बनाता हूं फिर जो बायोगैस बनती है उसको प्योरीफाई करते हैं जो टेक्नोलॉजी आई दिल्ली ने डेवलप की है और पिछले नौ साल से मेरी गाड़ी बायोगैस से चल रही है उसको पेट्रोल पम्प जाने की जरूरत नहीं है और मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ पेट्रोलियम ने भी वो स्कीम एडोप्ट की है और सतत स्कीम के सस्टेनेबल ट्रांसपोर्ट अल्टरनेटिव टूवर्ड्स अल्टरनेटिव ट्रांसपोर्ट कि किस तरह से हम कंप्रेस बायोगैस को बायोगैस को व्हीकल में यूज करें ताकि डीजल पेट्रोल को बचा सकें ट्रैक्टर में उसको यूज कर सकें दूसरा एक लांबा कांगड़ी पंजाब में विलेज है जहाँ पे गांव के लोगों ने कोशिश की 
कि हम एक ऐसा बायोगैस प्लांट बनाएंगे जो गांव के सारे गोबर को कलेक्ट करेगा और फिर उसे बायोगैस बनाएगी उसको पाइपलाइन फ्लेक्सीबल पाइपलाइन से पूरे गांव में डिस्ट्रीब्यूट करेंगे और पिछले चार साल से उसमें भी बड़ा अच्छा योगदान दिया है कि कोऑपरेटिव रूप से वो बायोगैस प्लांट चल रहा है हर घर में सुबह शाम गैस पहुंचती है एलपीजी की जरूरत नहीं है जो खाद बन रही है उसको टैंकर में भर के हर खेतों में वो ले जाते हैं और गाँव की इकोनॉमी में उसने बहुत बड़ा योगदान दिया है ये दो छोटे छोटे वीडियो आप देखेंगे तो समझ में आएगा कि किस तरह से हम वेस्ट को यूटिलाइज करके उसको एनर्जी में कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकते हैं तो मैं थोड़ा सा वो वीडियो दिखाना चाहूंगा आपको एक मिनट आ रहा है तो ये बायोग आप देखिए कि होटल्स हैं वहां से और जितने घर हैं वहां से किचन वेस्ट हम कलेक्ट करते हैं और उसको पलवराइज करते हैं फिर बायोगैस प्लांट में डालते हैं तो ये हमारा 25 क्यूबिक मीटर का बायोगैस प्लांट है जो ट्रेडिशनल केबीआईसी टाइप बायोगैस प्लांट है और आप देखिए कि कभी हर सीजन में वेरिएशन होता रहता है कभी क्या सब्जी का सीजन है कभी क्या सब्जी का सीजन है तो वेस्ट जो है हमारे किचन वेस्ट वो भी अलग अलग तरह के आते हैं उसको किस तरह मेंटेन करना है किस तरह से हमारा जो बैक्टीरिया है वो उसको पीएच मेंटेन रहे और एडजस्ट करे तो उसमें एक स्टूडेंट पीएचडी कर रहा है आई दिल्ली में कि किस तरह के अलग अलग सीजनल वेरिएशन के किचन वेस्ट को हम यूज करके सस्टेनेबली बायोगैस प्लांट को बढ़ा सकें ये जो किचन वेस्ट है वो आप देखिए कि ज्यादा है अलवराइज हो गया फिर इसको उठा के बायोगैस प्लांट में डालते हैं क्योंकि अभी सीजन गाजर का और यह तो लाल रंग का कलर आप देख ही सकते हैं कि जो गाजर का वेस्ट है जो जूस सेंटर से आता है और जो गोभी है वो चीज पलवराइज होकर जा रही है अंदर सारे हॉस्टल से में से आता है और फिर ये बायोगैस प्लांट जो बायोगैस बन रही है वो ये हमारी बायोगैस प्योरिफिकेशन लेबोरेटरी है आई दिल्ली में और पिछले सात आठ साल से चल रही है हमारा एक ग्रामोदय परिसर है सात एकड़ जमीन आई कैंपस में उसका नाम रखा है हमने ग्रामोदय परिसर जो हमारे सेंटर फॉर रूरल डेवलपमेंट की जितनी भी लेबोरेटरीज हैं यहाँ बनी है ताकि प्रैक्टिकली गांव में क्या क्या पॉसिबल है फिजिबल है ये जो ब्लू कलर का है वो वाटर स्क्रबिंग सिस्टम है स्क्रबर है जो कि बायोगैस को प्योरीफाई करता है तो नीचे से हम गैस पास करते हैं ऊपर से पानी पास करते हैं टेन बार प्रेशर इस कॉलम में मेंटेन करते हैं फिर पैकिंग मेटेरियल इसके अंदर भरा हुआ है तो जो कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड है वो फिजिकली डिजोल्व होकर वाटर में नीचे से आ जाती है प्योरीफाइड मीथेन ऊपर से आती है जो तो मीथेन आती है वो लगभग 94, 95 परसेंट मीथेन होती है उसको हम कलेक्ट कर लेते हैं बैलून्स में फिर उसको ड्राई करते हैं और फिर उसको यूजिंग हाई प्रेशर कंप्रेसर ये वाटर पंप है देखिए आप जो कि इसको प्रेशराइज वाटर ऊपर से पंप करता है ये रोटामीटर लगा है देखिए कितना वाटर फ्लो रेट है कितना गैस फ्लो रेट है वो हम मेजर करते रहे कंट्रोल करते हैं तो हमारी इतनी प्रैक्टिस हो गई है कि हम प्रेशर वाटर फ्लो रेट गैस फ्लो रेट से कर सक, कंट्रोल कर सकते हैं कि कितना प्योरिटी की हमको गैस चाहिए नब्बे परसेंट चाहिए नाइन्टी फाइव परसेंट चाहिए नाइन्टी एट परसेंट मीथेन चाहिए ये हाई प्रेशर कंप्रेसर है विच कैन कंप्रेस बायो गैस टू टू हंड्रेड बार जैसे कि सी एन जी फिलिंग स्टेशन पर टू हंड्रेड बार पर हम गाड़ी में भरते हैं वो सेम हमारी जो गाड़ी है वो सी एन जी व्हीकल है सी एन जी की जगह हम बायोगैस भरते हैं बस 
ये देखिए इस कंप्रेसर से चला के और फिर बायोगैस पीछे रोज बढ़ते हैं तो रोज हम गैस बनाते हैं रोज पांच किलो के लगभग गैस बनती है और रोज हम इस गाड़ी में बढ़ते हैं रोज इस गाड़ी को चलाते हैं नब्बे हजार किलोमीटर इस गाड़ी बायोगैस पे चल चुकी है पिछले नौ साल में इंडिया की अकेली पहली गाड़ी है जो बायोगैस पे इतने किलोमीटर रन हो चुका है फिर इसकी हम इंजन की परफॉर्मेंस देखते हैं एमिजन देखते हैं एमिजन आर बेटर देन डीजल एंड पेट्रोल एंड सी तो ये गाड़ी एम ने हमको दी थी सारी स्टडी करने के लिए समझने के लिए और इसी के बेस पे इंडिया में बायोमीथेन का स्टैंडर्ड डेवलप हुआ तो इस, ये तो इस गाड़ी के बारे में दूसरा जो लामा कांगड़ी का है वो मैं आपको दिखाता हूं ये पंजाब के होशियारपुर जिले में विलेज लामा गाड़ी सत्तर घर है इसमें और आप देखिए कि इन्होंने गोबर कलेक्शन के लिए स्पेशल ट्रोली डिजाइन की और एक मोबाइल ऐप डाउनलोड किया अभी अभी वीडियो आ नहीं रहा है वीडियो आ नहीं रहा है अभी उसको ऑन आप उसको हाँ अभी आ रहा है अभी आप चालू करिए थोड़ा सॉरी आया नहीं क्या अभी नहीं शेयर हुआ है अभी नहीं हुआ सॉरी एक मिनट आया क्या नहीं नहीं आया सॉरी स्टॉप करता हूँ आपको बनना फिर कुछ कर जाके इसमें साफ सुथरा क्यों बनाया जा सकता है इस पे लाइन गाँव ने डिजाइन किया ट्रैक्टर को ली किस तरह की पीछे ले लीजिए अब ठीक है अब देखिए कि वहाँ पे मोबाइल एयर डेवलप किया कि कौन आदमी कितना कंट्रीब्यूट करता है बेइंग मशीन ट्रोली में लगा रखी है और वो ऑटोमेटिकली मोबाइल ऐप के थ्रू पहुंच जाती है कि कितना गोबर किसने कंट्रीब्यूट किया डेली और ये बेइंग मशीन है फिर ये एंट्री हो जाती है और फिर गोबर इसे पूरे गांव में सुबह सुबह ये घूमता है ट्रैक्टर ट्रोली और गोबर को कलेक्ट करता है तो वहाँ पे 200 क्यूबिक सौ क्यूबिक मीटर का बायोगैस प्लांट है जो पहले तो दीनबंधु मॉडल को उसको डेवलप किया और वहां पे जाके ये पूरा पूरा ट्रैक्टर इसमें खाली हो जाता है ऑटोमेटिकली आप देखिए बायोगैस प्लांट में रखा हुआ नीचे से खुल गया और नीचे सारा गोबर नीचे चला गया देखिए फिर एक मशीन लगा रखी है वो उसको आगे होल में ले जाएगी और वो मिक्सिंग तो पानी के साथ मिक्स होगा ये देखिए मशीन चलाई और पानी के साथ मिक्स होके वो जो स्लरी है वो अंदर बायोगैस प्लांट में चली गई फिर टैंकर को साफ कर देते हैं और फिर इसको कवर कर देते हैं जहां से हमने गो इन्फ्लेट किया गोबर को और बायोगैस प्लांट में चला गया फिर बायोगैस बनी है उसका एक इंजन सेट लगा रखा है देखिए और पाइप से पूरे गाँव में गैस डिस्ट्रीब्यूट होती है उसमें मीटर भी लगा रखा है किसने कितनी गैस कंज्यूम की है तो पूरे जी देखिए आप जो सत, और ये गैस किलोमीटर है जो कि रोज करता है कि किसने कितने गैस कंज्यूम की है स्लरी को इस टैंकर में भर के वो हर खेत में जितना जितना कंट्रीब्यूशन उतनी स्लरी वो दे देते हैं उसको फसल बेची हुई है इसमें पानी के नाल मिक्स करके फसल बेच लगाया जाता है यह प्रोजेक्ट के नाल पिंड में साफ और सुथरा बनाने बहुत ज्यादा मदद मिली है और ये बाकियों के लिए भी कई बार इरिगेशन के साथ भी स्लरी को खेत में चला देते हैं ताकि स्लरी और पानी इरिगेशन के काम आ जाए और उसका बहुत इफेक्टिव यूटिलाइजेशन हो रहा है उनको पेट, पेट, जो आपके केमिकल फर्टिलाइजर्स हैं यूरिया डीएपी उनकी जरूरत नहीं पड़ रही 
और गांव में आप देखिए इस कॉपरेटिव को इतना है कि इनका पिछले पांच साल में जो बैलेंस है वो लगभग पांच करोड़ से ज्यादा बढ़ गया है तो मुझे लगता है कि इतना ही समय था और बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं आपके इस कार्यक्रम के लिए धन्यवाद थैंक यू सर जूनागढ़ अग्री यूनिवर्सिटी and the registrar dr chauhan who invited me for this wonderful morning event as an inaugural function of the agriculture residue and waste utilization for energy generation webinar so i am very glad to participate in this event and thank you to both of you for inviting me i joined little bit late at 9:45 i don't know who else and i am sure one of my colleague from delhi dr kk singh spoke i don't know what others spoke about but i did not listen up to that i joined somewhere when dr rator was speaking <coughs> sorry for the delayed entry and the vice chancellor mp uat and my former colleague ddg education formerly uh, dr rator vice chancellor sdau my colleague from delhi dr kk singh adg and uh, Dr. Negi, Dr. Vijay, good morning to all of you. Uh, I am very glad, as I said earlier. But when I when I read when the, Dr. Chauhan sent me the invitation, I read only the first half of your title: agriculture residue and waste utilization. The second half I did not read because that is energy generation. So I have made up my mind to speak mostly on agriculture waste and residue management. and while dr rator and others were speaking i was just uh, trying to see what is happening in the energy from agriculture waste and i am sure all of you are energy experts i am not directly energy expert slightly in the subject because of my job now 32% of energy is from biomass in india that's what the google says and 70% of the indian population basically depends on biomass based energy approximately 5 gigawatts of power are being generated in india from biomass energies and it is a big number and we need to really look into the subject very seriously i am sure my colleague from delhi dr kk singh would have spoken about it we are facing a big menace of biomass in punjab haryana because the farmers burn the biomass there the rice straw and because of burning Uh, there is a, everybody blames this burning as a major cause for the smog formation in delhi but i will tell you this burning causes only 17% effect on the smog formation other 83% is from uh, construction dust from in, from automobile emissions industrial emissions and lot of different other things then we had a pro uh, project project originally proposed by the engineering division based on the works done by our aacrp center at pau ludhiana this was in situ management in situ management as you all know is uh, basically plowing the field and uh, sowing the next crop which is mostly wheat and sometimes potato or other vegetables using happy seeder and uh, double mold ball plow reversible mold ball plow and all that so that resulted very good uh, uh, very good uh, results in the first two years last year there was a kind of reversing of the results in punjab but there were uh, some gains in haryana so there is a kind of uh, uh, you know uh, good improvement we could reduce the burning by 52% number of incidents reduced by 52% in the first two years in 2018 it was 52% less than in 2016 it's a big achievement of a single project 
which was worth only 1,161 crores. And we have created through DOAC, lot of custom hiring centers for this uh, uh, in situ management of crop residues. And a lot of subsidies were given and a lot of farmers used either the custom hired machines or bought out machines. So it was a good project and uh, the DOAC is trying to continue with this project for one more time, which we will know only when the EFCs are uh, finalized. But my dear friends, the government of India has also formed a committee with engineers in it to look at the ex situ management. So I'm talking about the, you know, the waste utilization or management of agriculture waste. The ex situ management to myself and Dr. K. K. Singh and several others, several experts in the subject. Some of you may be in the meeting today. We have looked at many, many different options. The bioethanol production was one of the major options that we looked at on industrial process. And that part, we are now working out the economics of that. That is one of the most recommended activity. But even then, the, the government's secretary say that carrying out the biomass greater than 15 kilometers may be uneconomical because of the transport cost and other things. Number two is handling is difficult. You have to you know, bail it out and then carry it and this and that and all that. And what would happen if we go for biogas production in the farm? by the farmer for his family. And if there is extra energy, you can send it to the grid. And all such options are being looked at, my dear friends. But sooner or later, we will come out with some of the XC2 management solutions. This XC2 management, this, this, there cannot be for a problem, there cannot be one single solution. There can be a number of many solutions. In situ is one of them, and which resulted in good results. And XC2 may result in good results and we are working out the economics of two, three different options. So let us see what happens and uh, understand that if somebody can develop a, 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 a mi microbial consortia, which will basically decompose this rice straw, generally, you know, um, without much of water, you know, that solid decomposition should take place with less water content within a span of about 20 days then you are on for a very good award from the government of India. We are getting some consortia of microbes from IARI and from uh, some private industries. Uh, they are good, but you, know, you need to have some kind of uh, trial runs on it and then see how best they perform. But only 70% decomposition occurs, whatever coming from the private industry. IRA claims very good results, and we are testing it on the field now in these seasons. The season is only in October, November, November, October, November, and sometimes early December. Once you lose it, it is law, it is gone, the season is gone. So if somebody wants to work, you are all in biogas management people. If somebody wants to work on that, please take it as a challenging project. If you come out with it, you will be noted by the country, definitely. That's an important, it is not only in Punjab, Haryana, and Western UP, now we are beginning to see the burning incidents happening across many states of India, including Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, where they burn wheat straw also. So therefore, these are all the issues. You know, we face a lot of issues because of biomass. That is the, you know, Dr. Rathor very explicitly told us. Sometimes they become a big menace for us. How to handle it, how to treat it. You know, first of all, they should not spoil the environment. Second of all, what best we can take out of it for our, for our use economically. So these are the things you are talking about, biogas and the power generation, these, that, and all that. But this bio, bio, bio mass can also be used for different various other purposes. And I wanted to quote certain examples. When I read only the first half of it, I thought of few, few ideas in my mind. But, but certain ideas I just want to propose in, in front of these people, which are being successfully implemented in many places across the country particularly in Southern India. One, one, one typical example I will tell you is, you know, press mud. The press mud is a kind of industrial waste from the sugarcane industry. I have been a teacher of, of uh, you know, this subject of bio, bio waste utilization, uh, bio moss and waste utilization in an undergraduate agri engineering for a very long time. During those days, I used to take my students to the nearby food industry, sugar, sugar mills, because our, 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 universe, our, our institution was located in a place in Kaveri Delta of Southern India, 
where a lot of sugar cane were produced. Sugar, banana, and rice were the major crops because plenty of water over there due to Kaveri River. So sugar was one of the three major crops. So many, many sugar mills across the country, huge sugar producing mills. So we, I used to take my students to these sugar mills and I found, you know, 30, 30 years ago, I'm talking about 30 years ago, whatever the, the, the after the spending of everything, the waste coming out, solid waste coming out will be thrown on the yards near the sugar mill, sugar industry. And that will be kind of not utilized because it's a BOD, COD requirements are very high and all that. And it was a kind of serious menace for the, for the company. And where to dispose it of was another major issue for the company. And there was one, some of the times these companies were taking it out and then throwing it nearby fields. And some of the, the, the public interested people come comply to the, you know, com, uh, government, government sealed one or two companies and we had to intervene, intervene and technically solve the problem and then reopen the companies. And now all of, all of you must know that, 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 that the press mud has become a valuable a fertilizer by basically treating it with the turning it back and forth. I'm sure many of you must have seen if you are coming from the sugar mill industry area, basically turning it will, will aerate it and then aeration cools down, aeration changes the bio, some, some microbes added here and there and they, they every five, five kilograms bag is sold at a rate of five rupees, which was otherwise a waste, absolutely menace. It's not only a waste, it was a menace problem for the, for the whole environment and the company and the people around. So, you know, the small treatments will, will, will result in a greatest yield. The companies are making you know, tons every day and the tons, five kilograms sells, selling at five rupees and if they are making say 100 tons a day, imagine the type of revenue they will generate from it. It's huge. And as you all know, you all observed that in a sugar mill or in a rice mill, in a sugar mill, sugar can bagas, in a rice mill, rice husk. In both cases, they are using it for, for burning. In sugar mill, the burning of the bagas is mainly for cogeneration. And you may have seen the cogeneration plant. You are all energy people, so you, you are, what I am talking to you may not may be very primitive, but that, that may, there may be students they should know. And rice husk, rice husk also, they burn in most of our rice mills back in Southern India, they burn the rice husk completely for generating steam. And the steam is used for cooking the rice for parboiling. And the steam is used for heating when it is going for drying, a lot of different purposes. But that's a grossly underutilization of the whole rice husk. You know, that's a very valuable byproduct of a rice industry. Rice milling industry generates 20% is rice husk. Basically in a rice, 20% is rice husk. 5% is brown. Brown is now utilized for, for, uh, for oil extraction, but this 20% rice husk is again a big menace, huge problem because the silica content is more and you know, the uh, lignin and this, that and all that and disposing is a serious problem. So burning it, after the burning it becomes uh, simple white ash, whatever fly ash we call, the fly ash is again it flying all over the places, it's a problem. Now we have fly ash based bricks all over India, everywhere. The fly ash big brick is only very little percentage is added when it's going to, it's adding on a lot of economic value for the rice industries, for the rice millers. It's a big, big economic return for them. So my dear friends, simple utilization, Kairpit is another one. Energy generation is one major aspect. Definitely we need a lot of energy, but economic utilization, when there is not a possibility for energy generation, all our biomasses, all our biomasses absolutely can be utilized. There is no, it is a byproduct anymore. All of us can understand that we don't call it a waste. Waste the terminology, waste is gone. It is a byproduct from an industry or byproduct of agriculture. The byproduct of agriculture must be economically utilized. It, it may be extraction of color, color components. It may be extraction of some industrial components from it or it may be extraction of some additives for the food, whatever it is, they are all food materials. Eventually, many major, majority of their components can be utilized in some form or, form or other. Like what you do in petroleum, petroleum refinery, everything in the petroleum refinery is utilized. Nothing is thrown out. Similar is coming out in all the food industries, all the agriculture industries. So therefore, nothing can be thrown out. 
biogas production is one of the major uses in this country is now following up but i want to mention that there are n number of lot of different other uses and those n number of uses uses must be explored at another example i want to quote is you know india is 50% 50 india grows 50% of mangoes in the in the world major mango producer in the world actually and lot of mango is produced all over the country where i come from lot of mangoes are produced there also and lot of mango pulp industries are there the mango stone which is that nut you call nut or stone we call stone technically mango stone contains 10% oil in it and mango stone oil is a very valuable you know for industrial purposes you know it's if you take out its 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 qualities like it's a freezing point and then boiling and then you know operating point or whatever thing you think about an oil it offers the best quality industrial oil it has a lot of value not not only mango stone oil but also the moringa seed oil moringa seed oil is 5000 rupees per kilogram or so it is used for aircraft lubrication because its freezing point is very low so aircraft lubrication is done by <laughs> oils like moringa seed oil so there were my dear friends yeah number of alternative uses or there for bio biomass not only energy generation and economic returns for the industry for the farmer for the country by economically utilizing every part of a biomass we not only take money earn money from it but also we are relieving our environment of any pollutions any unwanted disease spreading any unwanted un 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 un, un, un unpalatable looks on the on the you know just now before me dr uh, vijay had shown some some kitchen waste utilization plan it's a beautiful scenario of somebody is collecting the kitchen waste or is this where is this kitchen waste going it is thrown in our place it is thrown on the street and yet another thing is you know and and, and, and i don't know all of you are energy people i will tell you one more one more quick idea in this case i don't know why we are not pursuing on it though i am telling to my ai crp people in many times rice husk can be utilized not for only steam generation that's the lowest method of using it there are higher methods of using it one one of the best methods of using rice husk 20% of rice husk means 20 million tons per year trust me because if you assume 100 million tons of rice are being produced 20 million ton is rice husk huge rice husk has a silica this silica is amorphous silica this amorphous silica is very good for capturing the photo solar energy you are better than i am and technology is available and technology is not popular here i don't know why and many people when i was a director back in tamil nadu that was a rice industry rice based institute originally so therefore anybody along with the rice problem will come to me so many there were many industry people they wanted technology on rice husk ash silica rice husk silica technology is there is a technology but technology is not where is it not why is it not used why are we not getting to i don't know maybe some of you when you speak later you may answer what i am talking about now but rice husk silica is one of the best silica trust me and there was another i, I visited a rice industry i am talking mostly <laughs> rice based things earlier i also spoke about the rice problem in punjab haryana now i am talking about the rice issues in tamil nadu there is a huge rice mill in kerala this man produces what processes 400 tons of rice a day something like 400 tons is a huge rice mill basically 50 50 ton per day is a is a large rice mill 400 tons is a very large rice mill and this man is not using the rice husk for his burning he is in in near near thrissur near kerala agri university area somebody visiting this this kerala agri university area please visit his industry it's a beautiful 100% utilization of everything coming out of his plant 100% he uses eucalyptus that bark that area a lot of eucalyptus and then you know that uh, whatever lot of trees kerala so lot of barks are coming up and they, he buys this bark at the rate of 2 and a half rupees 2 rupees per kilogram and uses them for his for his steam generation absolutely 
and i asked him i forgot his name pradeep or something he was a middle aged man 45 year old man very progressive thinker an educated progressive thinker i say why are you not using rice husk he says there are a lot of industries who want to take my rice husk and burn there i sell it at 3 rupees to them and buy the bark at 2 and 1/2 rupees for me i save 50 paisa per kilogram i buy 50 tons a day imagine one month how much i will save basically my dear friends there is business in everything there is money in everything there is saving of environment in everything you and i will have to tell the people thank you so much ah, i am done dr chawan Mr. Announcer or Miss Announcer, I am done. Please. Thanks, Kapil. Yes, sir. Ah, somebody is awake. It was really nice talk, and we honored with your presence. Thank you, sir. 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 and i would like to request our honorable vice chancellor of university dr bp jogatia sir and president of today's function for presidential speech dr bp jogatia sir thank you <coughs> honorable sri uh arshi paldo sir minister of agriculture rural development and transport government of gujarat respected dr ns rathod sir vice chancellor mpuat उदयपुर राजस्थान स्पेशल यूनिवर्सिटी डॉक्टर आर एम चौहान वाइस चांसलर एस टी ए यू सरदार कुशीनगर रिस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर अलगू सुंदरम साहब पी डी जी एग्रीकल्चर इंजीनियरिंग आई सी आर न्यू दिल्ली डॉक्टर बी एस नेगी साहब एडवाइजर एम एन आर ई गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया डॉक्टर डी डी जगदाला साहब जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी एम एन आर ई कपूरथला डॉक्टर के के सिंह साहब एडीजी इंजीनियरिंग आईसीआर न्यू दिल्ली डॉक्टर वीके विजय एमिनेंट प्रोफेसर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया आईआईटी दिल्ली और डायरेक्टर ऑफ एक्सटेंशन एजुकेशन डॉक्टर गाजीपुरा डॉक्टर गोटिया साहब डीन फैकल्टी ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर इंजीनियरिंग डॉक्टर खूट साहब डीन जीआईएबीएम and principal college of agriculture and agriculture dr tak sir dean faculty of veterinary science dr sawalia dean agriculture and agriculture and dean horticulture dr chohan registrar and copio of idp dr monoth copio idp and adr <coughs> dr malam dr ac patel and uh, all the head of the departments of different faculties faculties from the different institutes across india and dear participants friends we all know that with a population of nearly 1.4 billion and uh, one of the world's fastest growing major economies india will be vital for the future of the global energy market in expanding economy population urbanization and industrialization means that india sees the largest increase in the energy demand than any other country our country is the world's third largest energy consuming country thanks to rising income and improving standards of living energy use has doubled since 2000 with 80% of demand still being met by coal oil and solid biomass on a <coughs> per capita basis biomass has always been an important energy source for the country considering the benefit of it so far it is renewable widely available carbon neutral and has the potential to provide significant employment 
in the rural areas. About 32% of the total primary energy used in the country is still derived from the biomass and more than 70% of the country's population depends upon it for its energy needs. Agriculture in India has witnessed increased cropping intensity, expansion of irrigation, greater use of modern chemical inputs, mechanization and diversification to high value crop over the years. During the different crop harvesting seasons, crop residue of the different crops like rice, wheat, sugarcane, maize, cotton, mustard are abundant in the country. The current availability of crop residue in India is estimated to more than 683 million tons from the different crop produced annually corresponding to the potential of about 18,000 uh, megawatts. Apart from this, about 7,000 7, megawatt additional power could be generated through Bagasi-based generation in sugar mills. These residues are used as animal feed and as a source of domestic and various industrial processes. Despite of this, about 178 million ton of the surplus crop residue are available in the country. A large portion of unused crop residues are burned in the field primary to clear the leftover straw and stubble after the harvest as narrow timelines between one crop to harvest and sowing of other crop. Intensive use of mechanical harvest, harvesters forced farmers to burn crop residues in the preparation of the land for the next crop. An, estimate, an estimated 87 million ton of the surplus crop residue is burned in different crop lands. Crop residue burning also emits different greenhouse gases to atmosphere. More than 8.5 million ton of the different greenhouse gases emitted to the atmosphere from burning of crop residues. It should also be noted that polluted air is the second highest health risk factor in the India. Studies have also reported that the several ill effects of crop residue burning on soil, organic carbon and fertility, including the reduction in the productivity in the long term. The problem of on-farm burning of crop residue is uh, intensifying in recent years due to, uh, due to shortage of human labor, high cost of removing the crop residue by conventional methods and use of combined for the harvesting of the crops. <clears throat> the residue of rice, wheat, cotton, sugarcane, jute and rapeseed mustard are typically burnt on the farm across the different states of the country. The problem is more severe in the irrigated agriculture, particularly in the mechanized rice wheat system of the Northwest India. Gujarat has long been considered one of the most progressive states of India on both the industrial and agriculture front and considered as a growth engine of India. Gujarat is endowed with abundant natural resources in terms of fertile land, river system, good soil and climatic condition in many parts of the state and good support in the terms of input industry and most importantly, enterprising people and technical talent. The utilization of crop residue varies across different states of the country. Traditionally, crop residue have numerous competitors competing uses such as animal feed, odor, fuel, root thatching, packaging, and composting. The technology, uh, technological interventions can mitigate the gap between crop residue handling and management by incorporation of crop residue into soil through adoption of conservation agriculture practices. Promotion of use of crop residue for preparation of bio-enriched compost 
वर्मी कंपोस्टिंग बायोचार एंड इट्स यूटिलाइजेशन एज ए फार्म यार्ड मेन्यूर प्रमोशन ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी फॉर ऑप्टिम यूटिलाइजेशन एंड इन सीट मैनेजमेंट ऑफ क्रॉप रेसिड्यू टू प्रिवेंट लॉस ऑफ अनवल इन वेल्युएबल सोइल न्यूट्रिय मिनरल्स एंड इम्प्रूवमेंट ऑफ जनरल सोइल हेल्थ प्रमोशन ऑफ डायवर्सिफाइड यूज ऑफ क्रॉप रेसिड्यू फॉर वेरियस पर्पज इज लाइक पावर जनरेशन एज इंडस्ट्रियल रॉ मटेरियल फॉर प्रोडक्शन ऑफ बायोथेनोल पैकिंग मटेरियल फॉर फ्रूट्स एंड वेजिटेबल्स एंड ग्लासवेर एटसेट्रा प्रमोशन ऑफ एडेप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजिकल रिसर्च फॉर मैनेजमेंट इन द फील्ड ऑफ बायोफ्यूल बायोमास गैसिफिकेशन बायो सी एन जी बायोगैस टेक्नोलॉजी बायोमास ब्रिकेटिंग एज डिफरेंट स्टडीज इंडिकेटेड दैट द कम्बस्टन प्रोसेस प्रोपर्टीज वेर इंक्रीज बाई ट्वेंटी परसेंट आफ्टर वन बायोमास वॉज मोल्डेड इन टू सोलिड ब्रिकेट्स बायोमास ब्रिकेट्स एमिशन ऑफ ग्रीन हाउस गैस इज ओनली वन नाइन्थ सेट ऑफ कॉल ब्रिकेट्स आर यूज डोमेस्टिकली इन इंडस्ट्रियली फॉर हीट एंड पावर जनरेशन दी अदर टेक्नोलॉजीज फॉर बायोमास यूटिलाइजेशन आर को जनरेशन ऑफ प्रो प्रेसिड्यू एंड डेवलपमेंट ऑफ रिलेटेड एडवांस मशीनरीज फॉर the effective utilization of such agriculture residues formulation and implementation of necessary policy measures for control of crop residue burning through suitable laws legislation executive orders etc extending subsidy to the farmers for hiring resources conservation machinery from the custom hiring centers agriculture service centers and promotion of establishment of new csc or uh, uh, agriculture service center to ensure availability of such machines to the farmers at the time of crop harvesting the use of renewable energy from biomass is one of the few proven cost effective and available technology that can decrease the co2 emission traditional use of biomass for heating and cooking in households is by far the largest source of renewable energy in india bioenergy consumption has increased steadily with population growth for decades even though at a slower rate than overall energy supply complete penetration of the clean cooking fuels in rural india requires a multi layered approaches junagadh agriculture university under green initiative took firm step toward the utilization of renewable energy sources and solar solarizing the agriculture and uh, efficient management of agricultural waste through deployment of many initiatives like installing uh, 18 rooftop solar power plant in different buildings on the campus end of campus with installed capacity of about 500 kw the department of rri has also designed and developed uh, 13.5 kw jeu model agrivoltic system jeu uh, model agrivoltic system integrating photovoltaic based electricity generation and crop production from a single land the agrivoltaic system implementation provide a suitable solution to the farmers as well as rural people who benefited the pro, uh, produced energy another advance advantage is would be the transportation losses may decrease and extra income can be generated by the energy supply to the grid that will also help to reduce the migration of the rural people to the urban solar pump of 13 kw capacity installed at different farm the cumulative solar installed capacity of junagadh agriculture university is uh, uh, 5 to 6.5 kw which earned carbon credit of approximately 180 ton 
per year and still many solar roof top power plant are in installation process junagadh agriculture university also installed biogas plant for of 260 meter cube capacity and 3 kilowatt wind turbines at the campus the department of renewable and renewable energy engineering is working in the field of conversion of crop residue into the suitable energy carrier ex situ management of surplus crop residue being burned in open field for solid biofuel and biochar and concent uh, concentrating on development demonstration and upscaling of different and new renewable energy technology with clean environment to enhance the productivity and doubling the farmers income department of re h designed and developed an open core down draft gasifier having capacity of 80 mega joule per hour the shredded biomass like cotton stock and castor is used as a feed stock in open core down draft gas uh, design gasifier without converting into briquettes the gasifier converts the loose biomass to gaseous fuel and produce about 25 to 30 percent biochar as by product as by product which can be used as soil amendment for the carbon enrichment i am optimistic that this national webinar will greatly impart knowledge among the scientists researchers and students to develop the indigenous technology which utilize surplus agricultural residue and boost the momentum of atmanirbhar bharat for the sustainable agriculture to fulfill our honorable prime minister's vision to double the farmers income by 2022 Thank you, Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, Jai Jai Garvi, Gujarat. Thank you, sir, for your valuable remarks. Now we are leading towards the conclusion of the inauguration function, but it's not actually the conclusion because the fruitful deliberation will be going on in the few sessions next upcoming session. So right now, I would like to request. ADR and Nodal Officer ICR of our University, Dr. P. Monal Sir, to present both of these. Uh, uh, अभी मुझे सूचना मिली है माननीय कृषि मंत्री श्री जो इस वेबिनार में हाजिर रहने वाले थे लेकिन असेंबली आज उनको डबल असेंबली का टाइम दिया गया है यानी कि उनको जल्दी जुड़ना था वहां पर असेंबली में क्योंकि गुजरात विधानसभा असेंबली अभी चल रही है और उन्होंने जो टाइम दिया था हमें लेकिन आज दो असेंबली एक साथ करने की प्लानिंग हो गई और वो आज नहीं जुड़ पा रहे हैं और उन्होंने इस वेबिनार की सफलता के लिए शुभकामनाएं दी हैं तो मैं माननीय मंत्री साहब का खुद को आभार ही हूँ और आशा करते हैं कि वो इस वेबिनार की प्रोसीडिंग्स हम उन्हें भेज देंगे और उसका वो आ, हमें मार्गदर्शन देंगे धन्यवाद गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल ऑन द ऑकेजन ऑफ नेशनल वेबिनार ऑन एग्रीकल्चर रेजिड्यू एंड वेस्ट यूटिलाइजेशन फॉर एनर्जी जनरेशन बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड इन जूनागढ़ एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी अंडर दी National Agriculture Higher Education Project Institutional Development Plan. Uh, at the end of the inaugural session of this program, two days uh, national webinar, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor and the President of this uh, session, Dr. V. P. Jodhia Sir, our uh, guest of honor. Dr. N. S. Raghur Sir, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of M. P. U. A. T. Udaipur. Another guest of honor, Dr. L. K. Sundaram Sir, our D. D. G. Engineering, I. C. R. New Delhi. 
uh, our honorable vice chancellor sbau dr rn chauhan sir then advisor ministry of new and renewable sources of energy government of india dr neji sir dr chandale joint secretary ministry of new and renewable energy sources dr kk singh adg engineering icr new delhi dr kk vijay vk vijay the eminent professor iit delhi unnat bharat abhiyan and the dignitaries from our university university officers dr h n gajibara sir director extension education organizing secretary and registrar and co pi of this project dr p n chohan the dean and principals of various colleges dr n k gotia uh, dean agriculture engineering dr p s ta dean college of veterinary science and dean college of fisheries uh, dr khoob sir dean and principal uh, bgi abn and college of agriculture principal college of agriculture mota bandaria and dean of agriculture and horticulture dr sg sawalia director student welfare dr v r malam it director dr k c patel all hod from agriculture engineering college as well as the all the faculties of junagar agriculture university the idp staff who are involved in this uh two days webinar program uh virtually organized two days webinar program it is my proud privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion first of all i thank our honorable minister of agriculture rural development and transport rc bandhu sir for accepting our invitation of course he was not able to uh, present due to unavoidable circumstances by i but i am thankful to him i am also thankful to our honorable vice chancellor director of research and uh, ai of this project dr vp jodia sir who is really a guiding force uh in the organization of this wonderful program very rightly selected subject and all as all you have uh Heard from different expertise expertise regarding this program. We are in the third year of the uh, almost at the end of the third year of this project. We have done a very commendable job under this uh, program, and this is all due to our honourable vice chancellor, his visionary ap approach. So, I'm thankful to you, sir. i am especially thankful to our guest of honor especially the uh, did, uh dr n s rathor sir vice chancellor of mpat previously he was ddg and uh, aspect director of nsgp project uh, so i am very much thankful to you sir because you are the real uh, advisor for getting this project and uh, in this project whatever we have done it is only due to you sir and uh, you have remained present in this program and given and like and like and the uh, very good uh, uh, information regarding uh, waste water utilization waste utilization and the agriculture utility energy uh, utilization for the energy generation
special thanks to the Dr. L. K. Algu Sundaram, who is the DG of Engineering, and he has given very good data regarding the waste utilization. I am very much thankful to the Dr. B. S. Nagi sir and Jagdale sir, who has attended this program on behalf of Ministry of. a uh, new and renewable resources energy and provided the uh, the schemes which they are running in this uh, special subjects thanks are also due to the dr vk vijay who is working in the iit delhi and uh, i mean and professor and running the unnat kushi abhiyan and he has shown a uh, very good uh, video he is also working on this subject since uh, last three four decades so i am thankful to you sir i am very much thankful to the dr k k singh adg of engineering for providing uh, this uh, good information related to the icr schemes thank you sir and thankful to the our honorable vice chancellor sgau arun chauhan sir who has also given a uh, very good information related to this subject and remain present uh, in the inaugural session thank you sir thank you i am very much thankful to our registrar ha uh, ha uh, friends uh, we have a very uh, renowned dignitaries with us uh, from niti ayog uh, ms nilam patel she is interested uh, to deliver uh, his talk her talk madam i welcome you are you there hello ms nilam patel are you there i just received a phone call from you that you are interested to deliver a talk are you there wait viral jorjo jara mera phone kare jorjo uh so we are uh, uh, sorry that uh, we are interrupting the our uh, uh, what of thanks and uh, would like to definitely listen the niti ayog member uh, because the very important policies uh, nowadays uh, framing out by the government of india in this regard and she would, would like to share with her experience and uh, and we are very fortunate to listen her okay yeah next okay so uh, she has conveyed that uh, uh, she is right now in meeting but uh, she will definitely join later on and uh, would like to deliver in some technical session so i have request the uh, dr mona to continue with what of thanks okay okay sorry so uh, regarding the organization of this today's webinar the organizing secretary of our uh, registrar and co-pi of this project dr pm johan and his team from the uh, department of renewable energy and uh, staff from the registrar uh, the all credit goes to uh, him for the uh, very successful uh, organization of this program thank you thanks to all the university officers especially the dr daji prasad that presentation education who remain present uh, dr 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 vr malan sir and all the deans of the junagadh education university different faculty dr gorkia sir dean agriculture engineering college dr tak sir uh, dean college of physics as well as uh, dean college of veterinary science Professor Dean 
PGIADN and Principal College of Agriculture, Junagar, Saulia Sir, Dean, College of Agriculture and Horticulture, Principal College of Agriculture, uh, Bandaria. Uh, thanks to all the HOD of our uh, Agriculture Engineering College, especially the Chahan Sir, Rabi Bhai, Gala Ji, uh, HOD from Family Department, and all other who have joined from the uh, online and virtual meeting. The special thanks to the IT director who has shared this uh, wonderful facility for conducting this virtual program uh, for the two days. Thanks to the all uh, IDP staff who are day and night working for making success this program. Thanks to the press and media who are going to cover this program. Since last two days, they are, uh, they are covering this program as well. So thanks to all the uh, press and media person. Thank you all for giving me the chance for vote of provide vote of thanks. Thanks all. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. T.K. Bhattacharya sir. Uh, Bhattacharya sir, thank you very much sir for joining and we will definitely listen to you during the technical session. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya, Emirates Professor uh, and uh, uh, the ex-dean of the Jabalpur uh, Agriculture Co Engineering College and uh, he has willingly accepted our invitation and uh, he has remained uh, throughout the session. Thank you very much sir for joining. Thank you, thank thank you, you. Professor. Thank you very much. I must clarify that the uh, we will be meeting Shah's back at 30 in the afternoon for technical session where we will be having a fruitful discussion, interesting discussion on the topic of futuristic advanced technologies for bioenergy and generation for sustainable development where Dr. N.K. Gopia sir will be chairing the session, Dr. Sudhir Jain sir will be co-chairing and Dr. Professor Yugi Devariya will be reporter. So I request... Speaker now. We will be having... Uh, Dr. Sandeep Gandhulkar, Dr. Madhuri Nara, Dr. S. Dadich, and Dr. N. L. Pambar as our speakers who will be discussing on the various topics during the technical session. So I would like to request all the participants sharply join at 2.30 in the afternoon. Thank you, sir. Nagel sahab, namaskar aap join honne ke liye khub tuk dhanyavad. Namaskar, namaskar. Bhaut bhaut dhanyavad. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, 2.30 will be here. 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 2.30 will be here.
हाँ सर A very warm good afternoon to all of you. After the inaugural session of the two days national webinar on agri residue and the waste utilization for energy generation, now we reach to the first technical session of the national webinar. The technical session one is on futuristic advanced technologies for bioenergy and generation for sustainable development. The chairman of this technical session is Dr. N. K. Gotia, sir, principal and dean CAET. Co chairman is Dr. Sudhir Jain, sir. And report here is uh, Professor Yubi Gogoria. I would like to give a brief detail about the speakers of the technical session. One, Dr. Sandeep Gangin, sir, Principal Scientist, Farm Machinery and Power and Head, Agriculture, Energy and Power Division from CIAE Bhopal. Dr. Gangin, sir, has uh, uh, very rich uh, experience in the field of energy and generation. He has total five projects still that handle with six international institutes visited many international uh, uh, exposers and uh, he has uh, received many awards, fellowship recognizations from many institutions, including FAO Fellow at AIT Bangkok, COE Fellow of 21st Century Center for Excellence on Nanoscience Japan. He scientific article he published in various advanced engineering technologies, obtained Elsevier's review, uh, review recognizations and many more. We welcome you, sir. The next speaker on the session is Dr. Madhuri Nara, Principal Scientist and Head, Bioconversation Technology Division, Sadar Patel Renewable Energy Institute. She is responsible for planning, coordination, and lead the research activities of bioconversion technology in alternative transport fuel from biomass, as well as algae and industrial waste utilization. She has developed two, process, two processes in the area of bioenergy as a lead and applied for patent for the same. Field level biomethanization plant based on kitchen waste and dairy waste were also in, uh, installed and under her supervision. We have with us Dr. Sunil Kumar Dadich. He is a HOD of Department of Soil Science, Soil Science and Agriculture Chemistry.
from uh, Sri Karan uh, Karan Narendra Agriculture University, Jobne, Rajasthan. Sir is working outstandingly in the field of biomass energy. He installed under his supervision installed successfully a bio CNG production purification and bottling unit of 120 meter cube uh, production capacity. He was the principal investigator under the IKBI project of that. He organized very 21 uh, summer schools. Uh, regarding the advancing organic manual production and biogas technology for entrepreneurial development, organized six capacity building programs and many more published uh, research papers in his figures. We have with us Dr. N. L. Pawar, sir, professor, uh, assistant professor of renewable energy engineering in the Faculty of Engineering at MPAUT, Maharana Pratap University of Agriculture and Technology, Udaipur, Rajasthan. He is awarded. He has been awarded the PhD from the Center for Energy Studies, IIT Delhi. Areas of interest that he has are the varied from analysis of thermal system, energy efficiency and management, actively working in the field of biomass, biomass gasifier, modified cookstoves and solar thermal device applications, published more than 100 papers in international national journals and books. So we have the enriched speakers with today's technical session. Now I'd like to hand over the session to the chairman of this uh, technical session. Thank you. Here's the, uh, we have seen that uh, Today's uh, co-chairman, Dr. Sudhir Jain, I welcome to him. And the persons available here at DAIS is uh, Dr. P.M. Chauhan, who is the uh, organizing secretary of the seminar, and Dr. K.B. Kala, and our all faculty members. Dr. Sudhir Jain uh, is a co-chairman. Whenever you feel that you have uh, something to say, please, uh, uh, interfere whenever you want to interfere. Yes, definitely, definitely, Gontya sir. Definitely. And uh, our one of our colleagues, Professor U.D. Dobaria, is a reporter today. Uh, with these uh, things, so we have four speakers. So I, mean, I invite the first speaker, Dr. Sandeep Gan Gangil, from the uh, CIA Bhopal. Is he there? Yeah, please. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think I think I'm audible to all. Yes, yes. If you are audible, please. Start. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you to Watiya Sahab and uh, Chohan Sahab and all the organizers, organizers, organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak on this occasion. And I'm also that means I'm looking Jala Sahab. Jala Sahab is uh, my basically M.Tech uh, batchmate uh, in Pandagar University. Hello. So, <laughs> so it's a nice to see uh, all of Jala sir. I think it was a long time ago, but I think it was a long time ago. So uh, now let us, uh, uh, I, I'm also that I'm uh, looking that uh, Sudhi Jain sir is here. Uh, we also know them. And my teacher also, Dr. Vatacharya sir is here also. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, I am uh, today basically, uh, as it has been given to me, that uh, I will present uh, something on that uh, how we can convert the waste to wealth. That means how we can use uh, what is the, uh, the waste available, uh, particularly in uh, rural sectors, uh, particularly in villages, and how to convert them to uh, the uh, energy and value added products. Uh, I will discuss uh, something regarding the technology, something regarding the concept that we should follow for implementation at a national level also. So uh, let me share uh, my presentation. Uh, I think it is shared now. Yes. yes. So uh, basically, uh, Today I'm going to discuss uh, on the waste to wealth. That means what is the waste available in a rural sector, particularly, particularly at a village level. That how effectively we can convert those uh, waste uh, as we consider them as a waste uh, into the different uh, types of uh, using the different type of system into the energy and value product. And uh, this is particularly in relation with the ex situ management of uh, the crop residues, particularly. Uh, as uh, in the morning, uh, our uh, DTG engineering told that uh, we have implemented the institute technology at a national level, in which uh, uh, that means some institute that means uh, uh, incorporation of the crop residue at the field 
was suggested and implemented also there are few results which uh, uh, are good also but uh, i will not discuss much about the in situ uh, management in ex situ management uh, uh, first of all uh, my thinking and particularly the concept is that uh, uh, only using a single technology and single method uh, we cannot manage the crop residues uh, effectively so uh, there should be a proper combination of uh, in situ plus ex situ management technologies to utilize uh, the crop residues in situ for in situ as uh, we think that around 30 to 50% we can leave for uh, the in situ management but the rest of uh, the material should be left that means should be taken out from uh, from the fields and that to be properly taken out using the different machines and uh, by doing the proper transport and then storing properly and converting them into the different uh, type of uh, other energy uh, that means or uh, maybe uh, uh, in a valued product so i will discuss all these things so for ex situ management uh, uh, basically here are uh, today's topic is mostly concentrated not only the biomass it is mostly concentrated on on, on a farm based available in our country obviously all these uh, crop residues are available and that can be managed or that can be converted into the energy and value added product particularly nowadays paddy straw is uh, being discussed a lot it is uh, being considered a lot uh, and government is giving lot of emphasis how to manage the paddy straw particularly in punjab and uh, uh, haryana and uh, at other places also <clears throat> but uh, if we see in totality uh, regarding that uh, what is the residues available for uh, uh, we can say for uh, management uh, at a national level there are n number of uh, n types of the residues available that uh, needs to be managed uh, at present uh, though the paddy straw is uh, highly that means in a demand at present uh, even though the forest origin residues are required because uh, they 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 also uh, produces uh, some uh, Uh, residues which need to be managed properly so these are the basically few names of uh, the crop residues or uh, farm origin residues that uh, we need to manage uh, this is uh, just a brief about that how much quantity that me that uh, we may have for uh, for management at a national level our uh, data is not important because the data uh, suppose i have taken from one source uh, there may be many other sources that may differ from uh, that means that data may be different in other different different uh, uh, sources but the main thing is that we have sufficient amount of uh, the biomass available uh, and uh, that is need to be managed particularly around uh, i think 90 to 90 90 to 100 million tons uh, need to be managed uh, particularly we can see here that surplus crop residues are uh, available uh, and uh, those are at present being burned at a different uh, <coughs> fields and creating the pollution so we need to manage it and uh, our idea is uh, one one idea has, uh, has already been implemented in situ and and the end how we can uh, that means have a uh, collaboration collab that means a combined approach of in situ and ex situ management technologies in which uh, we have already uh, several technologies like uh, Uh, we should collect uh, this uh, crop residues and then this crop residues should be converted into the different forms uh, what maybe those different forms uh, for example uh, we can convert into uh, like the briquettes we can uh, generate the uh, uh, energy using uh, the crop residues uh, using the thermochemical conversion technologies also and also uh, using the biochemical conversion technologies also so these are basically conversion uh, from the crop residues to uh, the energy and uh, we can also generate the value added products the value added product maybe the char maybe the activated charcoal maybe the activated mm -hmm. carbon maybe uh, some chemicals also because uh, nowadays uh, by crude research is also taking place which are basically concentrating on how to generate uh, the by crude and then how to get out uh, Uh, some valued highly value added products from the crop residues so it is just another scenario which shows that at present particularly let us see that how we can utilize the crop residues crop residues uh, particularly at present if we see in our country uh, around 
4,800 megawatt capacity power plants are available. Those directly use the crop residues for, or I, I should say, the biomass for generation of the electricity. But uh, around 50% uh, uh, of that is not working. 50% is working. So uh, requirement of those, you can just, uh, uh, we can see here that uh, around 40 ton per day per megawatt biomass is required. So using this particular uh, uh, value, uh, we can find out whatever available. Suppose crop residues, let us uh, consider here that uh, surplus crop residues if available at uh, uh, 145 million ton in a year, then uh, using this much of uh, basically available installed capacity, we can use uh, nine, around 20 to 25% of uh, the biomass uh, at a national level. But uh, only 50% only of uh, this much capacity is actually working at present. Uh, this is uh, basically the scenario of uh, national level, 4,800 megawatt. So this need to be managed. And uh, in uh, particularly now, it is to be managed, it's OK. But the question is, if we want to say, we want to discuss about the equity management, the first important thing is how to guess, how to basically take out the crop residues from the field. All these operations as shown on this particular slide, uh, like uh, the chopping, like the racking, like the baling, like the loading, like the transportation and stacking. All these are very important energy, also consuming the energy, also involving the cost itself. So all these things very need to be managed so that the material can be collected and kept at a particular site. And later on, it can be given to the different utilities like the power generation plant, like the uh, power generation plant using the biogas technology because there are two routes of uh, uh, utilizing so much huge quantity of the biomass. One is uh, utilizing the crop residues uh, uh, through, uh, through the combustion. That means uh, there are power plants available which are basically burning the uh, uh, crop residues and then generating the steam and then steam is being fed to the turbines and turbine is creating the electricity. This is a one method. Another method is uh, utilizing the uh, biogas technology, particularly all the crop residues after uh, that means uh, uh, giving some uh, treatment, mixing with the cow dung, mixing with the water, then biogas is being generated and that biogas is uh, directly fed to gas genset or gas engines, big gas uh, engines and that uh, electricity is being produced. So this type of system, one or two systems uh, are already working. That means uh, the power plants working on a, a huge size of uh, uh, biogas <coughs> generation, electricity generation plant. So this type of uh, basically supply chain is uh, utmost necessary and it needs to be managed properly because at present, uh, number of the machineries available to collect the, uh, collect, uh, uh, the biomass is very less. We also do not have appropriate transportation mechanism and also not appropriate uh, uh, collection and storage mechanism in all over the country. Few states, particularly like uh, if we talk about the Punjab, there there is a problem of uh, uh, paddy straw. Uh, paddy straw. Uh, there uh, few chains are available, but that is also not managed properly. So this is uh, one operation like uh, we need to collect the uh, bales. That means uh, biomass in such a manner. And there are a uh, few systems, new uh, machineries have come into the market, which are basically uh, making the bale in a, in a form of, uh, uh, that means uh, cylindrical type of bales. And uh, uh, now, because it's not only, because I'm not talking only about the pedestra, because if we want to work on uh, some other biomaterial, then also uh, that means uprooting, collection, and uh, there are many other things which we need to work on, like on a, on a cotton stock, like on a lantana, we need to basically uh, do the uprooting and then collection, then shedding also, that uh, shedding also on the field, then it will be loaded on a, uh, on, a, on a trolley or tractor or truck, then it will be conveyed to the plant side. Plant side may be for the bracketing, plant side may be for uh, the power generation and other places. Uh, like uh, at present, uh, because uh, there are uh, few, uh, that means uh, whatever system is available for uh, conveying the grain is uh, directly used for conveying the crop residues. Those are not proper actually, uh, because they 
basically uh, uh, conveys a less amount of uh, biomass from here to there. Uh, there is a that means uh, more energy is consumed and also the cost is high. Uh, but for uh, uh, conveying, we need to do, uh, I think if we do, uh, for example, like the billing, like the densification on site, uh, then uh, we can uh, have a high amount of transportation uh, in uh, case of uh, uh, like uh, straw. So uh, this is a one uh, that uh, this slide, but particularly I want to show here that uh, if we uh, basically collect the biomass, this is a uh, one typical case of soya vine straw. If we collect the biomass, then the lead distance is very important because in supply chain, from where we are collecting and from where uh, we are storing and where where we are basically using the biomass is important. The cost is basically important, which basically changes uh, on the basis of uh, how much lead distance we are collecting and how much transportation, that means long transportation we need to do. Uh, particularly, for example, here, from if we do from eight kilometer lead distance, the cost may be only uh, like uh, 22 rupees, but it may increase if it is to be done at 84. So uh, basically, it is need to be optimized. Uh, in morning, uh, like uh, DDG engineering stated that uh, around 15 kilometer, 15 kilometer of uh, uh, the lead distance is uh, is uh, almost economical. We can say. Uh, however, it depends on the situation. However, it depends on the crop. So basically, this is crop specific, and also the intensity of the cropping in, uh, also depends particularly uh, on the crops and uh, cropping intensity. So what we will do? Suppose we have already collected the material, we have stored it, and then now what need to be done? The first thing that we can do, which is technology is already available and that can easily be implemented at a national level. Uh, also, because the commercial uh, uh, commercial firms are available for making the such type of plants are the bricketing plants, uh, like the bricketing technology we can directly introduce at a national level. Uh, one, uh, for example, this is a banderless bricketing that uh, figure is showing the banderless bricketing because bricketing is two types. One is a bricketing with a binder and the one is a bricketing with a, without binder. Any kind of material that is uh, woody in nature, having a lignin sufficient lignin can be bricketed, particularly bric that means bricketing with the, without binder. Uh, these are some uh, uh, biomaterials that can be bricketed easily, like the oil seeds uh, material we can also take, pulses, uh, uh, stocks we can also take, and other biomass like uh, uh, bamboo and other things that can also be bricketed using some changes in uh, our systems. So bricketing technology at present, there are uh, three kinds of uh, systems available in India. One is a piston press, yeah. and other one is a screw press and uh, also pelletizing. All three are uh, popular. So piston press is also available. A screw press uh, is also a uh, good one. Uh, this is scientific, technically, uh, this is a screw press mechanism in which a screw is there, material is fed from top side. It is basically uh, compressing the material and uh, material is coming uh, out from the die and uh, the bricket is being formed. Similarly, in Western press, material is being grinded, then putting in a hopper, then uh, one, uh, uh, one system is there, which basically uh, presses the biomaterial uh, using the piston and ram through a die and we get a bricket. And another one is a pelletizing machine in which uh, our system is uh, rotating and uh, we are getting the brickets. So bricket without binder, we are grinding, then drying, and then uh, just uh, putting the material into the bricketing machines and uh, which uh, after technique, when the material is coming out from the die, it is being cooled itself and the bricket is being closed. But uh, if uh, we are doing the brickets with the binder, then grinding, then mixing of uh, uh, the material with a uh, binder. It may be molasses, it may be other one. It depends on the selection. Uh, some Sometimes uh, the cowding is also used for uh, uh, giving the binding property. Sometimes the soil is also being used. So this type of uh, uh, process is there in which we can have our brickets. Uh, this particular <coughs> slide basically shows that if uh, we want to do the uh, bricketing, then uh, 
with the winder we can uh, without winder we can have a that means a larger diameter bucket uh, but uh, normally with winder we uh, produces uh, the bucket with a lesser diameter and uh, the density of obviously the piston press system or we can say the the bucket made uh, with uh, without uh, binder is high particularly 1 to uh, 1.2 uh, specific gravity uh, in case of uh, where is uh, uh, others uh, particularly like uh, uh, the bracket with binder is around 600 uh, uh, kg per meter cube so this is a process if we want to make the bracket uh, whatever bushy material or normal material is there that is being uh, basically shredded or grinded here the shedding is there and then it is fed into the directly into the machine and then we are making the brickets. Now here uh, I want to state that in a bricketing, basically whenever it depends on uh, the particularly dye. Dye means from where that we are uh, extruding the material. If we are extruding the material at a, at a, at a uh, lower uh, diameter dye, then obviously the power requirement increases. Power requirement is shown here that uh, people say that the power requirement is high uh, particularly in bricketing, many people uh, give this type of statements, but it is not true. Uh, the, in a bricketing, a uh, very less amount of uh, uh, energy is consumed, particularly, for example, 0 0.05 to 0 0.07 uh, kilowatt per uh, kg is consumed. Uh, the lower data is also 0 0.06, it's uh, wrongly typed here. So that means uh, uh, bricketing is a good one, particularly, and uh, in this case, now coming directly to the how much uh, value addition we can do. That means uh, because today's topic is how we can obtain uh, the wealth from the uh, waste. So from the waste, if we collect it and if we sell in a market or if we sell to uh, the power plant or some other plant like a bricketing plant, that uh, one person can obtain a, a benefit of rupees only uh, 400 to 600 rupees per ton. But if uh, uh, we, he is selling, that means he is collecting and plus uh, doing the bricketing also, and then selling to like the industry because uh, binderless uh, briquettes particularly are being used at a, at a, at a, at a uh, industrial uh, places uh, frequently because at industry uh, at present uh, um, there are boilers available and boilers are very easily 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 accommodating the briquettes and uh, they are uh, consuming and they are producing also but uh, uh, their main problem is that they need a more amount of the bucket and that much bucketing system that uh, at present we do not have so uh, using the collection plus bucketing we can uh, that means one can get around uh, 8 uh, 1600 to uh, around 1600 rupees per ton benefit and if we do that means the collection then the bucketing and that bucket is used for power generation then he can uh, uh, that means have a value addition of 2500 per ton of biomaterial so this type of value addition we can obtain. Now coming to the bucketing without binder, sorry, with binder. This is a machine which uh, we have and this type of machines are available at uh, different places also in which uh, the material particularly, this is a uh, mix of uh, uh, paddy straw plus cow dung and uh, uh, plus uh, water. Then uh, that uh, mix is basically fed into this uh, 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 machine and this machine is make, making this bucket and after drying this is a bucket with a binder and this like we can see here and this is a very good fuel uh, here you can see that uh, what is the combination that i'm showing but different type of combinations can be used at a different uh, uh, for the different crop residues for the different uh, 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 that means uh, whatever available in local area so this is a technology that is basically local specific and uh, this particular combination can be made. However, the system uh, is uh, almost uh, same because we need to just uh, manipulate uh, our system in such a manner uh, that uh, they can create uh, the bricket of uh, such nature. This is a basically bricket which can be easily used at a domestic level that uh, is as shown in this particular slide. Uh, so now coming to the uh, benefit of uh, bricketing technology, if we see that if we install a uh, bricketing technology of uh, uh, having a capacity of uh, 1,500 kg per hour, then uh, then uh, we can see uh, if uh, we do the calculation, the calculation has been done. Uh, like uh, we 
can create a mendes in a yes camera to isme sahi hai yes somebody is hello all are requested to mute yourself okay so uh, thank okay thank you sir so let let me continue so if we talk about that if we install a one plant of 1500 kg hour it basically creates a, this much of amount that means 8000 to 9000 band days at the plant also plus whatever the business that has created uh, that means in a local area for uh, uh, biomass handling uh, 4000 man hours for production 2500 and if we see economic benefit because whenever renewable energy technology is concerned we need to basically mention about the environmental benefit so here that uh, if we install 1 uh, kg per hour and use this particular uh, machine at a full capacity then uh, it will basically reduce uh, the burning uh, in the area of 6000 hectare uh, which will save the board of this much of nature and then we talk about the co2 reduction uh the co2 reduction per annum will be 5500 tons so this type of calculation this is economic calculation and environment benefit of a specific bricketing technology so what i want to mention here that bricketing is a technology that can directly be introduced to uh manage the crop residues and uh, uh this is a one of uh, the uh, one 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 which should already always be in a in a in a gamut of uh, technology that uh, can be introduced for uh, the exit management of the crop residue now coming other things now till now we have discussed that uh, how to collect the biomass how to store and uh, particularly how to bricket it now let me uh, discuss something about the conversion so conversion biomass whatever biomass is available that can be converted through uh, basically three routes one is a biochemical one is a thermochemical and then one is a basically the convergent chain platforms and on the basis of all the three are uh, uh, routes of giving that different type of outputs uh, in a biochemical probably my next speaker uh, will speak and uh, today now i will uh, mostly concentrate on thermochemical and uh, uh, so our aim is basically to get a heat or energy or a power and uh, can be generate the fuels and also the chemicals chemicals means the value added chemicals and uh, some other materials that uh, we can obtain which has the higher values at a market so <coughs> now here is a thermal degradation of the biomass thermal degradation of biomass if we are heating the biomass uh, then it basically converts into the three parts one is a, a solid which uh, may be the char that we will discuss further Uh, whatever uh, that means uh, the vapor is being produced and those can be condensed that converts into the bio crude or bio oil and whatever is not being condensed is uh, uh, basically the uh, gases that can be burned and those are uh, combustible gases so this this is a basically a basic principle of thermal degradation of biomass and depending on the heating depending on the air availability depending on other things Uh, that means the process parameters basically the quantity of the solid liquid and uh, gases form changes now uh, let us directly come to one method of utilizing the uh, crop residues or a biomass which is the combustion which is basically the complete oxidation of the biomass to convert the biomass into the heat and the water theoretically speaking and uh, if it is uh, not theoretical then practically uh, some shoot particles is coming out some other uh, problems are coming out and uh, uh, basically uh, some uh, pollutants is also coming out but theoretically speaking the only the co2 should come out h2o should come out and uh, uh, only the heat should come out this particular method that means uh, method is being used uh, that means the combustion of the biomass combustion of the crop residues in a a uh, big size uh, biomass based power plants uh, and here is the table which shows that this type of power plants are available particularly in case of punjab that we are showing here at present uh, around 4800 megawatt capacity is installed in india in uh, punjab that we are showing here and uh, in this one we can say that uh, uh, several are op in operational those are working on a uh, crop residues especially on a paddy straw 
but not using the paddy straw fully. That means they are not working 100% on a paddy straw because of few reasons. One reason is uh, they do not have, uh, that means the capability, their systems do not have the capability to utilize complete paddy straw. And the one, some do not have the complete supply, uh, that means the supply of the crop residues uh, for full year. So this type of uh, 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 plants are available. Those plants uh, basically <clears throat> need to be work on a, that means 100% uh, paddy straw, but at present they are working only at a 40 to 50% of uh, paddy straw. Other fuel they are using the wood chips and other biomass. So uh, that we have conducted one study in which uh, it was found that if uh, uh, they are able to collect the biomass from uh, 40 to 50 uh, kilometer, then they can run the show. But uh, if it is more, then it is very problematic for them. Uh, the cost of uh, the electricity varies from six to seven rupees per unit. And uh, uh, that uh, some people say that is a higher one. And uh, we don't know whether it can be lowered uh, later on because of the upgradation of the technology or not at present. But uh, whatever technology available at present uh, says that yes, from six to seven rupees per kg per unit of electricity can be produced using the crop residues, and uh, uh, paddy straw can easily be used as a as a as a biomaterial as a feed material for for generating the electricity. One is that means it is our calculation that if we want to utilize uh, the complete uh, biomass that means complete paddy straw of the Punjab in Punjab itself, then what is the mechanization required to collect those, to store those, store that amount of the bio, uh, biomass, particularly the paddy straw. So like uh, 10,000, around 10,000 of uh, rake choppers and rickers will be used. So this type of things are basically needed to implement an uh, ex-situ management uh, technology of uh, uh, using the paddy straw in a biomass-based power plants. Uh, and the one is uh, the biomass that, that we are discussing at present at uh, uh, the combustion systems. The uh, combustion system, one was the very high level of the combustion system in a megawatt, 10 megawatt, 20 megawatt that we have discussed uh, just uh, in a previous slides. But now uh, it is a, uh, and this system, this type of system are several systems are available. One is uh, uh, from us, that means from CI Gopal. Uh, it is a uh, some one system which basically generates the heat capacity of two to ten kilowatt, and uh, it is a rapid combustion system. So this type of system uh, enhances the efficiency. In morning, uh, Dr. Rathor was telling the uh, normal uh, cook stoves are having the uh, that means the efficiency of only eight to ten percent, and uh, with the help of uh, that means the uh, enhancement in the technology, uh, we have this uh, high. Uh, the thermal efficiency of the system, particularly here, is a thermal efficiency of 37 to 40% uh, we can achieve. And uh, this type of systems uh, we already have, and uh, also there are a few other uh, uh, um, organizations also have developed this. <coughs> now coming to the gasification. And the gasification is a basically partial oxidation. This is one met another method in which we can convert the biomass into the electricity using the gasification route or uh, biomass into the uh, fuel gas. Particularly, this is a partial oxidation of the biomass in which uh, we have a furnace that is called the gasifier in which the body biomass is fed and that is basically oxygen is uh, being regulated. So we are basically reducing the oxygen supply into the furnace or in a gasifier and that basically produces a gas which is flammable in nature. So, the flammable gas is uh, normally we uh, know it as a producer gas. Uh, there are literature which also states as it as a synthetic gas. And uh, uh, while doing so, uh, some amount of the char and obviously gas is also produced. And uh, this particular gas can be used for two purposes. One is uh, to give the thermal application. That means the burning of the gas in a burner and then to use the heat generated. The other use is use this particular gas after cleaning into the uh, gas engines or gen sets and generate the electricity. So these are two types of methods, two types of utilization is there. So basically, uh, this particular statement only says that uh, 
in case of the calcification, we, can, uh, we need to give around 33% uh, of the theoretical stomatic ratio, that means the air, uh, that means the gas, the, sorry, uh, oxygen supply should be reduced so that the partial oxidation takes place. Uh, these are the different type of uh, gasification system. One is updraft gasifier, one is a downdraft, one is a crossdraft, and uh, some is uh, some uh, that means a slightly uh, high level of the technology, which is uh, a fluidized batch gasification system. Each one has a merit and demerit, uh, particularly, but for Indian application for getting the synthetic or producer gas of uh, low level of the tar content, uh, normally it is it has been recommended that we should use the downdraft gasifier. So down, uh, producer gas application uh, we can do for thermal application and also we can do uh, the uh, shaft power application. That means we can generate the gas that is need to be cleaned and then fed into 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 the gas engines so that we can generate the electricity. Whereas, whereas uh, we can also clean the gas and then we can directly fed to the diesel engines, particularly if you want to run the diesel engine in a dual fuel mode and then we can, we can save around uh, uh, sufficient amount of uh, uh, diesel, sufficient amount of energy. For example, here we can replace the diesel if you want to operate our diesel engines in a dual fuel mode, we can easily, we can easily basically save around 60 to 70 percent of uh, 70 percent of the diesel using the biomass if we use the gasification technology and if we use the downward gasifier cleaning then sending the clean gas into the air intake manifold of uh, the diesel engine uh, to operate the engine in the dual fuel mode so uh, the shakwar application of the gasifier basically require a very uh, that means the cleaning of the gas and at present uh, the gas, con that means the tar content in a gas, if you want to use the producer gas for engine, gen engine operation, then it should be less than 50 milligram per normal meter cube. Uh, normally, it is uh, very difficult to obtain, uh, but uh, uh, obviously, if we use two or three uh, series filter, we can obtain it. So major concern in using uh, the shaft power application of the producer gas is the tar content, which uh, adversely affect uh, uh, the engine performance. And uh, uh, this type of research is uh, being done previously also, and nowadays also being done. Uh, but uh, that means the technology is available <coughs> and can be implemented if required. Now it is a one example in which two technologies which we are discussed till now has been clubbed together to generate the electricity. The biomass is, a, biomass is available, it has been shredded, it has been powdered, then, then, then we have made a briquette. So one technology is there and it, it has been clubbed with other one. One is another one is the gasifier. So the briquetting plus the gasification system, then gasifier has been, the gasifier is available, the gas is generated, producer gas is generated, it is clean and then it is fed into the one gas engine, which is basically producing the electricity. This type of system is available at CI Gopal, and also we have implemented at a village level also. Uh, there is a one village which is called Nana, in which uh, uh, this system has been installed, and it operated uh, sufficiently to generate the electricity. Uh, we can also uh, get the thermal uh, output from uh, the Pacifican system. Uh, one system is, uh, is shown here uh, from where we can take the output of you can just see uh, around uh, uh, 100 kilowatt uh, thermal output we can obtain and it can be used for community cooking and also for giving the energy to uh, the boilers at a at a small scale uh, agro industry industries now coming to another aspect uh, which is uh, basically that means the conversion of the biomass uh, uh, into the energy and uh, value added product. Char and biochar, as far as uh, I think, is a value added product. Though, though, though there is uh, some uh, uh, that means resistance uh, uh, by a few people, few scientists uh, with respect to the charring and biocharring also. But uh, according to me, uh, this is a value added product. So, in this is created using the pyrolysis. In the pyrolysis, basically, the material is heated. <clears throat> 
in absence of oxygen theoretically and uh, uh, because of this one uh, we basically remove uh, some amount of uh, uh, moisture and lighter volatiles from this one and then whatever is uh, left is called the char like here like this is a raw material if uh, suppose it is a powder it is not necessary to powder it uh, then it is uh, pyrolyzed then we can obtain uh, uh, char type of substance like this one and whatever uh, gases uh, is available during the process of uh, heating if it is condensed then the bio oil type of material is uh, uh, can be collected and whatever is not condensed is uh, basically the gases which can be burned uh, which can be used uh, for giving the heat to uh, the same system itself that i will discuss further so uh, whatever charge that we are producing it can be used for uh, four purposes mainly here it is important that char and biochar is a two term which is normally used interchangeably but it is not so char is a broader term that and uh, biochar is a uh, we can say a subset of the char uh, char is everything that uh, we have uh, obtained from 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 the pyrolysis but uh, uh, normally if we use uh, the char as a as a as a energy source as a uh, that means as a charcoal then it is a as a fuel then it is a char and uh, if we are we are using the same char uh, uh, for soil amendment because nowadays the scientists have recommended that if we use the char with a fertilizer in a top soil then crop productivity increases by 10% so this type of recommendation has already come there are lot of studies available at a global level and uh, there is another concept which is called uh, the carbon sequestration in which uh, the biomass is converted into the carbon and then carbon is basically uh, kept uh, or uh, we can say uh, that means uh, uh, placed at a at a at a very high depth of the soil so that the carbon uh, what has been produced uh, from the crop residues uh should remain uh long for uh, that means 1000 years in a in a in a soil so that we can create a carbon negativity in a carbon neutral cycle and uh, which is basically leading to carbon sequestration to save our world uh, from the global uh, that means global warming and the use of uh, uh, the pyrolyzed material is uh, we can have a pyrolysis of the material biomaterial then it can be activated using Uh, the chemical steaming and thermal processes and then this is a uh, after activation this becomes a very uh, like activated carbon and it is a very good material for cleaning nowadays also like uh, the uh, ro systems and other system uh, there are uh, few companies they are directly using the biomass by after uh, doing the activation particularly uh, if you see the carbon filter and also the pre carbon filter and uh, post carbon filter we, we can find that uh, uh, those are based on uh, biomass so that is a very uh, high value product actually so uh, particularly uh, if uh, i will show further uh, that uh, uh, at present uh, if we see that uh, if we are doing the charring then uh, then uh, then you can say the quality of the char that means uh, biomass is available we are doing we have a uh, some system in which we are giving some uh, parameter some uh, that means uh, like temperature like uh, pressure like uh, what is the environment what is the gas inside that and uh, what is the size of the raw material and other things it basically changes the quality of the what is output is coming uh this is particular table which shows that if we use uh, the biomaterial in a different processes like the fast pyrolysis like the moderate pyrolysis like the slow pyrolysis like the gasification those basically changes the productivity in a percentage uh for example like gasification is uh, being uh, used for mainly for mainly for uh, generating the gas whereas uh, slow pyrolysis is used mainly to generate the solid nature or charcoal we we can say here like 30 per 35% whereas a fast pyrolysis is uh, normally used for for having, having a liquid fraction more uh, if you are doing the thermal degradation so this type of uh, uh, variation in a in a in a share of liquid solid and gas uh, will come if we use the different techniques and these all are the conversion technique of the biomass into the different products this is one system in which we can Uh, basically create the chart 
and these are the some and the systems that uh, we have at the ci bhopal from where we can change the temperature and we can effectively effectively regulate all the conditions and from where we can operate the we can obtain a different kind of char different kind of char means for example like this figure has been shown this is a figure which shows that we have uh, generated the char at a 300 350 400 450 degrees centigrade by looking all looks like a blackish in nature but uh, those all are not same their properties are totally different if we change the temperature for example here that uh, their adsorbency nature changing their ph is changing and also their recovery is changing so basically uh, the process conditions are important to obtain a different properties in a char like here if we do we have conducted the experiment which shows that uh, if we are changing the different conditions uh, we can easily regulate and modulate modulate uh, the properties <coughs> of the char so like uh, we can change the uh, adsorbency also for example if we do that means uh, the charring in a uh, air uh, particularly in nitrogen so iodine value is coming low in a air it is coming high that means uh, in a nitrogen uh, we uh, basically subsided the adsorbency uh, nature whereas uh, in the air type of things then we have enhanced the adsorbency parameter uh this is a one system that we have in which uh, we can create the char at a different temperature different level this is another system it is a pilot level scale which uh, basically creates uh, around 2 250 kg char per batch uh these are the char that we can see here and now here is an experiment which uh, very clearly state that uh, we create uh, uh, the raw char from a biomaterial at uh, around at uh, 300 uh, degree centigrade and then again it is activated thermally activated then we can see we can enhance the adsorbency up to uh, we can say 650 uh, 650 uh, iodine number so this is a very good one this type of uh, basically if we see porous spaces this type of porous spaces are available on a activated uh, material and uh, basically number of uh, porous spaces uh, uh, is uh, directly related with the adsorbency nature so that it can uh, basically trap or capture the pollutants and other other things into this one and make clean the water or maybe maybe other things and like uh, this is uh, uh, our uh, recent work which states that uh, uh, we can obtain uh, iodine value of 809 which is basically at par with the uh, activated uh, charcoal available in the market of a uh, uh, that means uh, from a merc company this is another one uh, till now we were discussing that uh, charcoal can be created in a charring clean and then it can be activated so the cost enhancer uh, at present for example if we see that value addition let me let me tell you about the value addition Uh, in a market uh, activated charcoal is coming uh, that means a lower level of activated charcoal is coming uh, around uh, 540 uh, uh, rupees per kg whereas in a our process or uh, the process that uh, we can do that means first charring and then uh, been activating we can generate the char around at a uh, 400 rupees per kg so uh, about uh, 100 to 140 rupees uh, per kg can be saved if uh, we use the crop residues so uh, this is another figure which shows that uh, while we are doing the operation in a gasification systems uh, we also have uh, some uh, uh, that means the uh, uh, charred material uh, with a, with a, with a, uh, ash which is also a good uh, material that can be used but uh, it is applicable only in a in a case of uh, large systems so Uh, we are also we can take that material we can activate that and that can be sold in the market very effectively particularly to have a economical gain so this is another view which shows that if we have a honeycomb of structures uh, the adsorbency of the material is uh, very high now coming to the liquid portion i will not discuss much about this one because this uh, will be probably discussed by pawar sahab and i think uh, in this session itself uh, so we can basically convert the biomass into the liquid fraction uh, liquid portion uh, that means solid to liquid 
uh, can be done using a fast pyrolysis. Fast pyrolysis is a pyrolysis in which the material is basically being heated quickly. That means the temperature of the biomaterial is enhanced uh, within the seconds can be enhanced the biomaterial temperature within a one second, two second, three second, four second, up to from room temperature to 500 degrees centigrade. If we are able to do it, then we can generate 60 to 70 percent of uh, the biomaterial uh, uh, bio oil from, from the biomaterial. These are the few technologies which are available at present, uh, which can convert the biomaterial into the bio food. And uh, uh, basic concept with this one. Basic concept is here, which is that we have a biomass. This will be pyrolyzed. And this pyrolysis, basically, uh, if we are doing, uh, suppose, at this temp particular temperature, which is 486 centigrade, then if it is a slow pyrolysis, pyrolysis itself, then we can obtain a char, which uh, can be sent back to the soil. And whatever is uh, available, that means the gaseous, gaseous portion that is condensed, and that is basically sent to co-processing in a refinery, and then Whatever material is in gas, like type of things is, uh, uh, if generating, it is being again basically used to give the heat of 400 to 600 degree centigrade in a, in a, in a system. So this is uh, basically a concept that is need to be implemented if you want to basically manage uh, the complete biomass in a holistic manner. This is the uh, system in which uh, uh, concept which shows that how we can uh, generate uh, the bio crude uh, using the floodized bed. So basically the flooding gas is coming from uh, uh, lower side and the material is in a floodized state here. Uh, we have a free board and uh, then heat is being given, then a gas, char and oil is being uh, generated and we are now condensing, then we are obtaining. I will uh, basically, uh, now it's, uh, uh, I will leave all these things uh, so now let me go to another, which is important thing. The final concept is like this one. That our aim is to have <coughs> complete emission-free biomass utilization, in which we will do, we should do basically, and it is, uh, uh, we should do uh, the thermochemical conversion because thermochemical conversion is the faster technology to utilize the biomass uh, because we can, uh, that means convert the biomass, uh, I think, uh, within the hours, uh, uh, like two hours, three hours. Uh, it will not take the days. So the biomass can be converted into three portions, like the char, like the bio crude, like the uh, gases. And all these need to be used very properly because they have a, a fuel, high value, adsorbency, a little more high value a soil amendment. Yes, giving uh, the better picture for our soils. Carbon sequestration, it is a basically globally accepted fact that carbon sequestration saves our environment and that is beneficial for human race. Bio crude obviously can directly be used as a furnace oil. We can extract uh, the phenols and ketones, uh, though the research is going on that how to extract the pure phenols and pure ketones from uh, the bio crude by doing the uh, downstream processing or upgrading uh, the system uh, like uh, with the help of different catalysts. A gaseous portion. If uh, one thing is that gas can be directly uh, sent back and then can be used for giving the heat to the thermochemical conversion. And the concept is uh, whether uh, this particular gas uh, can be segregated using the molecular uh, technology, molecular sieve technology in a methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen. So it becomes basically an industrial application and it gives a high amount of, uh, you can say, value addition for particularly our process. And Moreover, the complete system should be should be should be 100% uh, emission free. That means there should not be anything that should go out. So virtually there is a need to do work on this one, and there also need to do uh, the implementation of such type of things at a at a national level. Now it is a gasification technology that uh, I think uh, Madam Nara will uh, discuss. So I will not discuss uh, much about this one. Uh, Particularly, just I want to mention that uh, on the basis of using the biogas route, we can generate the electricity. The electricity cost is again coming around six to eight kilo, uh, rupees per kg. And this time, one system is available at uh, Fazilka in uh, Ludhiana. Uh, but uh, bio CNG, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, I'm not sure, there, but it can be the better route for uh, utilizing uh, the crop residues, particularly from bio, that means uh, biochemical uh, route in which uh, we can uh, produce the bio CNG up to 46 to 50 rupees per kg. 
but whether it is a, a practically uh, that means uh, implementable at a larger scale that uh, i am also not sure uh, so these are the technologies available now let me uh, basically show the last slide which basically state that uh, if uh, uh, we are able to collect 40 to 60 percent of crop residues what is being burnt at a uh, uh, field level at present then uh, we can have a reduction of co2 of 30 uh, 7 million ton per year and this is a very high amount of uh, the CO2 reduction that we can take. So our renewable energy gadgets plays a very important role if implemented properly at a national level. And uh, uh, you will be surprised that this much of reduction in a CO2 is uh, basically equivalent to if we have 25 crores of the trees. So this is very important to be highlighted and uh, I would request uh, that uh, if uh, we are able to highlight uh, the benefit, particularly the environmental, environmental benefit of uh, uh, our, uh, that means uh, renewable energy technologies, that will be giving a big boost to us, big boost to funding to us. Basically, the main problem of uh, uh, utilization of renewable energy technologies at our national level in a, in a deeper sense is that lack of the investment, basically, that I understand. So it was in brief that uh, I want to share uh, today. So uh, because uh, now I think time is also over. So uh, we can have a, a, a very quick uh, uh, if uh, we want to have a discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep Gandil. I think we keep discussion at the end. That will be better because. Okay, okay, okay. But uh, sir, actually. Uh, I may be, because I have another meeting, so maybe I will not be available. Maybe I can get to that last stage. Uh, then let us have five minutes for that. So any students or any faculty has any questions from Dr. Sandeep? Anybody? Text me, dekho, koi aaya hota. So thank you, sir. There is no question from anybody's side. Thank you, sir. So I am also thankful to you, sir, uh, that you have given me the opportunity uh, for presenting here that my ideas and uh, whatever we have at CI Gopal and whatever uh, we understand that it should be implemented at a national level. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, the second speaker is Dr. Madhuri Nara. She will speak on holistic approach to valorize agri waste into bioenergy for Swachh Bharat mission. So I invite Dr. Madhuri Nara. Yeah, good afternoon to all. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, please, madam. Yeah, I take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee of Fujinakad Agricultural University for inviting me to speak on agriculture residue and uh, uh, waste utilization under the technical session one of the today's webinar. And myself, uh, Madhuri, I'm from Sadhar Patel Renewable Energy Research Institute, Vallabhidyanagar. Uh, sir, before I get into my presentation, I will put you through a few slides about our organization since uh, students are also participating in today's event and they will come to know if they can, if they want to pursue their MTech or PhD programs at our institute. Okay, can you see? Yeah. So this is our, uh, our uh, the Sadhar Patel Renewable Energy Research Institute was uh, actually established in 1979 by Dr. Uh, the late Dr. H.M. Patel and uh, also Shinanu Bhai Amin. And uh, if you see the credentials of the Dr. H.M. Patel, he was a former finance minister and home minister government of India. 
and this institute actually when it was established in 1979 no one was even thinking of uh, about having a uh, renewable energy uh, related uh, things and that was actually inaugurated by these two legendaries uh, in the hub of Vallabh uh, Vidyanagar. And if you see the organization, it's a not-for-profit organization. We are registered as a society and also public trust under the yeah, yeah, yeah. public trust. Yeah. And uh, the yeah, mission yeah. of this yeah. institute yeah. is to develop environment-friendly renewable energy technologies so, uh, through the efficient economic and economically viable for society. So this is the organization structure. We, we have three major divisions who are working on solar energy and converting of the biomass through biological and thermochemical routes. And we have an, another important division, which is a technology transfer division, which looks after uh, the whatever the technologies or the processes or the renewable energy gases that we have been developed at our center has been taken to the fields or the industries. So what Spready can offer other than the research, we do collaborate to and contract research and we take up technical surveys. We also take up the preparation of feasibility and detailed project reports. And we also evaluate and testing of RE systems and uh, do carry out the impact analysis. At the same time, our vision is to promote and demonstrate uh, RE technologies to end users. So if you see the strength of the, our institute, we have a highly qualified research team with a multidisciplinary background because we are uh, working on solar, biochemical and thermochemical. So that is important to have a multidisciplinary background a scientist. And we have a very close linkages with the local and outside universities and industries, even the entrepreneurs as well. And we do have um, well-equipped uh, facilities to carry out uh, high-end of the advanced research as well, in especially in bioconversion and thermochemical conversion routes. So these are the important technologies that have been developed under uh, solar bioconversion, thermochemical conversion technology divisions of our institute. I'm not getting into the details of any of these technologies. And now I'll get into the the topic and. Um, so this, these are the biomass. Uh, yeah, if you see the current uh, uh, So if you see the biomass resources by origin, biomass resources can be classified into three classes of feedstock, determine their origin, the crop residue and waste, and the second is the forestry. And forestry, which is including the biomass streams generated in forest management. And when it comes to the agriculture, it is includes the crops, lignocellulosic uh, plants, such as fast growing grasses and trees. In addition to these biomass, even a number of potential new resources are being explored. Uh, for example, algae, and now that is also considered as a biomass, and the other aquatic biomass, which could uh, provide the sources of raw materials uh, for a number of high, uh, higher uh, added value applications, including food, which is a potential contribution to energy supply. So this is a con current scenario of agri-waste. India is facing the daunting challenge because of the increasing municipal, industrial, and agricultural waste generation. So that is happening because of the increase in the population, urbanization, and uh, economic growth. And if you see in urban areas, India is generating more than 10,000 metric tons of solid waste every day. But if you see that only 70 to 90% of this waste is removed by municipal services because of the insufficient physical and logistical resources. And we often see this majority of these wastes are dumped in an hygienic manner without proper treatment or containment. On the other hand, we also see the large proportion of agricultural waste, including the crop and animal residues, they are burned in the fields, or sometimes they're used as, as a traditional household fuels. But if you see in India, the burning of crop residue is a major problem. And it is uh, nowadays drawing the attention of the policymakers and the researchers uh, as well. And we also often see the open field burning, especially in the months of October and November, and especially in Punjab and uh, Haryana, and which leads to greenhouse gas emissions. And also the particulate matter, 
So because of that, the formation of ozone and nitric acid, which is contributing to the acid deposition, and it also uh, poses a risk to human and ecological health. In addition to that, and uh, we, we do get the fruit and vegetable waste, which are also produced in abundance. And that is because of overproduction caused by climate change, insu insufficient skills, natural calamities, and a lack of proper infrastructure. And uh, most of the time, these waste, this kind of waste is also dumped into landfills, which is leads to methane and carbon dioxide emissions and the surface water contamination, groundwater contamination, odor, and soil contamination. And we can see that approximately 60% of the global methane emissions, which are coming from agriculture landfills, wastewater, and the production and the transportation of fossil fuels. So this is a state-wise per capita crop residue bioenergy potential in India. So from this map, you can see very clearly that Uttar Pradesh produces the highest amount, that is, which is around 40 uh, metric ton, followed by Maharashtra and Punjab. And if you consider the northern states, Assam has the highest potential. And there is also significant variation per capita bioenergy availability is observed among the states, which ranges from the lowest, which is in case of West Bengal, and the highest is in case of Punjab. So this is another slide which shows the availability of the crop residue production when in the, in the year 2010, which was around 556 million metric tons, it has been increased to 708 by the year 2020. So the projected figures for the 2030 is around 868 million metric tons. So the bottom graph, which is showing the projected total residue production in million dry tons for the major crops of India. So these are the uh, Indian major crops and uh, their uh, agro residues. And if you see the Indian crops, rice, wheat, sugarcane, banana, mustard, groundnut, bajra, jowar, and all these crops are producing some sort of residue either during the post harvesting or the post processing uh, time. Uh, most of them are used as a paste material and they are used as for generating the heat or but if you see all these materials like the husk, hull, straw, leaves, stalks, and all these have a potential for the energy uh, generation. So this is another slide which is showing the annual bioenergy potential of selected Indian agro residues. Uh, so when it comes to the bioenergy, there is biomass power, bagas, cogeneration, and waste to energy. And Punjab is the uh, highest potential in terms of biomass power, which is followed by Maharashtra and Uttar Pradesh in terms of bagas cogeneration and uh, waste to energy. So this is uh, another slide which is showing the sustainable biofuel feedstock potential in India in 2030. See here the, we can clearly see the quantity of uh, sustainably available residue is much smaller than the production potential from each resource. So that it shows that one tenth of India crop residue potential may be realized. So this is maybe due to the high rates of soil erosion and existing demand for other uses. If you see together, the, uh, the sustainably available quantity of crop residues, energy crops and MSW could theoretically contribute approximately 55 billion liters of liquid fuels in 2030. On the other hand, the smaller quantities of forest residues and the used cooking oil, they would supply the remaining portion of low impact to feedstocks. So this is an optimistic scenario for advanced biofuel development in India. Uh, it clearly shows that the cellulosic ethanol in India could scale up to nearly 2 million tons uh, of production by 2030 and exceeding a 5% volumetric blend rate and so this falls short of 20% of the target, which is given by the government, but it would still require approximately 50 commercial scale facilities, each producing around 50 million tons of ethanol to begin, uh, though they have to be operation within next decade. So if you see the other side, the synthetic biodiesel production would ramp up more slowly as the facilities are smaller. But when it comes to the MSW derived synthetic uh, diesel deployment would increase up to 1% diesel demand on a volumetric basis by 2030.
So if you see the India's stand in biofuel and agro waste, this is the, our our country is the third highest in the use of biofuel and agro waste as compared to the uh, other countries. So these are the projected use of uh, bio biofuels. So this graph we can clearly see that the pattern of biofuel production also changing. Uh, to meet the specific end, end uses and the conventional biofuels such as the bioethanol or fatty acid, methyl, ester, biodiesel are likely to be unsuitable for some of these applications such as we cannot use them as an aviation or a shipping purpose. So only those biofuels which may have very low associated life cycle emissions will be compatible with the low carbon scenario. When it comes to the ethanol, conventional fuel ethanol production will have a continuing role where the production costs are low and where the uh, strongest greenhouse gas air reductions can be provided, which is likely to be a favor sugarcane feedstock. So where in case of the role of biomethane, which is likely to expand, especially in applications such as capital fleets and heavy freight trucks where the fossil compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas vehicles are uh, available. So this is another figure which shows the projected use of biofuels, the bioenergy and waste dominate in renewable energy supply in India, but the share of these renewables has been uh, dropped here. So these are the another slide which is showing the potential bioenergy pathways from biomass to final energy. So there are n number of feedstocks which can be used for the production of biofuels, either it biodiesel, bioethanol, biogas, pellets, pyrolysis oil, syngas, and even other advanced biofuels and these feedstocks have to go through some sort of a uh, biological or thermochemical uh, process conversions where we get the end use products like uh, uh, biofuels which can be used for a transportation purpose and we also do get the biomass based materials and products which has a value. So this is an another innovative biofuel production pathway, which is uh, uh, shown here in a clear, uh, clearly in expanded way. So again, here the figure shows considering the major, uh, the crop waste that is agriculture residue, municipal waste, forestry residue, and energy crops. And since these materials will have a cellulose, hemicellulose, and also the lignin, which is a barrier which has to be uh, broken down by some sort of uh, the treatment and um, so biochemical processes, they usually concentrate on the conversion of lignocellulosic materials to get sugars. And these sugars can be used for the production of ethanol through the fermentation process. And these sugars indirectly or directly, they can be uh, converted into other hydrocarbon fuels as well. And uh, when it comes to the pyrolysis, through the pyrolysis process, we can get the pyrolysis oil which is produced by heating the raw material in the absence of air and can be upgraded by breaking down the larger molecules and then reduction at high temperatures with a catalyst. So this, this can either done by feeding them as a small percentage of feedstock into the fluid catalytic cracking unit of a petroleum refinery or in a standalone hydro treating plant as well. So when it comes to the gasification, the synthesis gas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, methane and water, which is produced by biomass gasification. So this can be transformed into a fuel and chemical products, which is including the biomethane, methanol, and dimethyl ether. And they can also be processed to co-produce gasoline, diesel, and aviation fuels, for example, the Fisher crop process, or by using microbial process to directly produce ethanol or higher grade alcohols or hydrocarbons. So this is another route where the important fuel nowadays people are focusing on production of the aviation fuel. So again, you consider the agro waste, it has to be again subjected to the pretreatment to remove the lignin and separate the hemicellulose and the cellulose portion. And the removed, extra, the removed lignin can be used for heat or power generation in the boilers or generators. And whereas in case of the extracted hemicellulose, again, it will undergo many steps and to get uh, the aviation fuel. On the other hand, the extracted cellulose, which will be uh, subjected to the hydrolysis and um, there you get the acids, livonic acid and all, and the extracted products will be again, go to the hydrogenation, solvent recovery, decarboxylation, oligomerization, and the hydrogenation, uh, hydrodeoxygenation and, and hydroisomerization to get the aviation fuel. 
so this is an import another important area where the uh, agri waste can be used for the production of the aviation fuel and this is the fourth generation biofuels where the energy engineered crops can be considered again they can be again um, pass through different processes either through pyrolysis gasification or digestion where we do get the hydrogen either methane or carbon monoxide and these fuels can be upgraded using either the gas cleaning or the liquefaction processes uh, to get ultra clean carbon negative fuels which are of bio hydrogen bio methane and the synthetic biofuels and during the process of the production of these fuels we do get a carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide can be captured and it has again value so this is another important um, uh, area where um, uh, biomass emission with carbon capture and uh, storage and this is actually carbon capture and storage is uh, discussed in the context of avoiding the carbon dioxide emissions from the combustion of fossil fuel but the technology can also be Uh, deployed in bio bioenergy conversion plants of uh, biomass emission with the carbon capture and storage what happens here is during the uh, biofuel production using the biomass carbon dioxide will be generated that can be collected and compressed and it can be stored and when you are using the biomass for uh, electricity generation again the uh, um, produced co2 can be separated and uh, it can be compressed and it can be uh, stored as well so this is another um, option here the biomass emission with carbon capture and utilization so the this is another in, interesting possibility is here to recycle the capture captured carbon via chemical or biological processes to form fuels or chemicals using the hydrogen such carbon dioxide usage option not only lead to permanent storage of the carbon dioxide it could also deliver other important benefits including more efficient use of bio based carbon so when it comes to the biogas usually uh, the earlier times uh, people use people used to use the cattle dung as a substrate for the production of bio um, biogas but the shift has been moved to use of uh, the agro waste that is uh, lignocellulosic biomass uh, which can be used for the generation of um, biogas and what are the Uh, the existing biomethanation technolo technology is usually takes place in a single stage biomethanation uh, digesters and uh, there the inoculum is undefined and there are uh, there are also major limitations for the, with the existing technology such as um, it requires larger uh, reactor volume and uh, a high hrt that is uh, hydraulic retention time and the capital investment is also high and uh, it also it also used to produce low methane content uh, in the raw biogas and uh, low biogas yield and uh, because the methane content is low and if you want to purify that and it involves uh, high purification cost and a large footprint what we need is to understand the behavior of complex anaerobic microbiome against uh, the environmental and the process disturbances in order to achieve high process stability so that is very important to have a balanced microorganisms in the digester to tackle the temperature variations of the um, the regions and and it is also important to set microbial indicators for the optimal performance of the reactors and we should also have a better reactor designs to achieve the optimum performance so if you see the biofuel production and especially when it comes to the biogas so this is a pathway the complex organic matter will be break down into soluble monomers and oligomers and then it goes to the intermediates then finally you get the end product that is the methane and the carbon dioxide this is again the same uh, pathway and uh, why the circular bioeconomy is very important uh, because in any product either it become whether you consider solid liquid or gaseous biofuel and getting from any waste material is not economically viable as a single product so during the process we do generate a huge amount of other waste streams as well so it is important to consider all these waste streams into a value added products we can generate that so it is one of the example that i have shown here is if you take the agriculture residue if you put it in an anaerobic digester what we do get is you get biogas and you also get the digested material 
and since the biogas we will have a um, the methane and carbon dioxide and the methane can be used for thermal applications you can upgrade it and you can now uh, use it as a transport fuel once it is bottled and the separated co2 can be used for the carbon dioxide sequestration and at the same time the digestate which is again which will have the solid and liquid depending upon the type of the uh, loading that we are operating in the anaerobic digester so the liquid can be separated where uh, the nutrients can be recovered because it is uh, rich in nutrients and pk we are uh, high there and uh, by supplementing some microbial or fungal cultures and again you can enrich that liquid fertilizer and it can send it back to the same agriculture field as a nutrient at the same time the solid which is extracted from this plant can be used for the pyrolysis studies you can get bio oil char etc so if you compare either bioethanol or biogas any of the processes it is very important to uh, consider the bio refinery approach to make the uh, the process techno economically viable so these are the barriers of uh, the biogas so we know that the anaerobic digestion technology has a strong commercial viability not only get the biogas but uh, also in various aspects like uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions production of heat electricity transportation fuel and waste management besides various social economical and environmental issues but still there are many uh, challenges that india is facing to utilize its potential full potential based to energy so that is because of the lack of awareness and about the anaerobic digestion technology and where, where people do not follow the practices of proper proper waste segregation at a household level and that resulted into mixing of biodegradable and non biodegradable waste and which leads to uh, imbalance in the digester to get a low gas production besides this india is also lack of practical institutional setup for waste management planning and the designing in urban local bodies lack of efficient uh, biogas technology lack of technical and trained manpower and has outdated management uh, information systems less funds that resulted into improper planning of waste management and costly faulty operations in maintenance that ultimately affects the logistics of uh, this biogas technology but recently the government has created various uh, uh, the policies and uh, they started various schemes as well under various uh, departments to transform this waste uh, into energy but still it will take some time to uh, those to implement effectively so that the people and the industries take benefits of these schemes to strengthen the waste to energy mandate of the indian government so the what are the opportunities for effective implementation of agri waste into biogas based circular economy as i already told information is uh, lacking here awareness is very important and it is also important to have a cost benefit analysis before we get into any sort of a commercial plants and best technology showcase is important demonstration activities and promotional programs outreach and education and the last one is very important to have a research and development it is to be continued and the stakeholder environment it is also important to parameter uh, to make it effective implementation of this agri waste into biogas based circular economy so you know, when it comes to the stakeholders the farmers aggregators equipment manufacturers suppliers entrepreneurs and agri extension agencies and uh, other uh, organizations involvement is must So if you see the India biomass market, 2019 to 2030, uh, so which is an average 8 percent um, average growth rate, if you see by 2030, the market value is uh, 40 billion US dollars. Um, so what are the key market challenges? If we can see here the lack of year-round supply chain result into slowdown of market growth in India, and uh, the key market insight is new schemes support biomass based uh, cogeneration in sugar mills. and other industries so if you see the india biomass market segmentation even here the uh, focusing on the agriculture based so this agriculture based can be converted into various products like biodiesel bioethanol biogas and others to various technologies either through thermochemical or biochemical which can be used for the power generation heating and uh, others including the transportation sector so 
this is a uh, uh, funding that uh, the government is uh, spending huge amount of money on clean energy r and d here and uh, we can see here from uh, starting from dst to mop mos mnre dbt csr and uh, and if you see the uh, funding has been increased uh, from 2015 to 2018 and uh, Uh, so that it clearly shows that the government is uh, majorly focusing on the having a clean energy technologies using the uh, um, agriculture based uh. so now i'll uh, just brief about the technologies that we have what is very can offer and what are the technologies that are available at our institute for this kind of waste materials so when we talk about the waste to energy technologies through biological route we have a technology readily available for kitchen and dining hall residue fruit and vegetable residue agro industrial waste which comes to dairy effluent scum water hyacinth crop residue paddy straw and wheat residue and uh, when it comes to the municipal solid waste uh, and especially the organic fraction of the msw we do have a technology available for agro industrial effluent which is uh, Uh, covering the dairies and the potato processing industries and uh, so these are the benefits of uh, the technologies that have been developed at uh, sprayry and it reduces the carbon footprint that the technologies are eco friendly and they are producing more um, methane rich biogas and along with the biogas you do get the good quality organic fertilizer and uh, the operation op operating cost of these plants are very low and it also recovers the capital investment in a very short span of time less than 4 years and which is usually depending upon the capacities that we are going to install so this is the scene of the paddy field and uh, during harvesting and the paddy field of the after the harvest and we usually see this kind of uh, scene in the month of uh, october and november and especially in haryana and punjab and this is a smoke we cannot see anything other than the smoke here and this is a smoke scene again so paddy field after the burning of uh, straw so we have we spready has developed a technology for converting rice straw to uh, methane rich biogas and uh, the advantages of this technology is it requires a 70% 75% less water as compared to the conventional uh, biomethanation uh, systems and conventional biomethanation processes usually which takes 35 to 40 days whereas in this case it only requires 20 days to uh, get the biogas and uh, 24% more biogas per kg of uh, straw as compared to the conventional processes um, so but what the system that we have developed here is is a batch type and along with the biogas we do get good quality organic fertilizer as well and this system has been tried at a sprayry at a 100 kg per batch system where we have installed a six similar kind of reactors where we used to handle 1.8 ton per batch so these are the estimates of the inputs and outputs of the technology that we have developed at our uh, uh, institute to convert 1 ton rice straw per hour per hour into fuel gas and compost so if you see the input so we have considered the rice straw and water and since the system has been operated at thermophilic temperature to maintain 50 degree centigrade so we have provided some electrical so heating source and so therefore we have considered the electrical energy input as well so if you come to when when you when you see the output in terms of biogas and compost and the electricity electrical energy see the output electrical energy is higher as compared to the input the input energy is very low to compensate and also to make the plant more uh, economically viable so this is another estimated rice straw yields and tentative cost of setting up a biogas generation plant so in if you see the punjab the yield of rice straw in punjab is around 2 tons per acre of land so if you want to uh, cater around 28 to 30 ton per day so you require around 12 to 15 acres of land so based on the results that we have achieved from our uh, biomethanation uh, process so if you want to set up a power generation plant and you need around 6.5 to 7 crores and uh, then only for the biogas generation we you require around 5 to 5.5 crores 
So uh, very recently, um, uh, we developed another uh, technology uh, which can be operated in a continuous mode. And uh, the process which we have developed has been uh, applied for a patent as well. And uh, the beauty of this uh, process is that it only requires three days HRT as compared to the conventional process. Uh, and also the process which we have developed our own at uh, Spurry, which is of a batch type, uh, 20 days. Uh, here it is the HRT is very low and biogas yield is also found to be higher. That is 43% more biogas per kg of rice straw and the methane content is, uh, methane content is also found to be higher, which is around uh, 13 to 17%. So not only biogas and you also get the biofertilizer uh, from this process have the potential to improve the farmer's income and also reduce the dependency on the use of the chemical fertilizer. So we are still, we, as uh, in the morning, the um, DDG, Dr. Alaga Sundaram has mentioned that it's very important to have a uh, microbial consortia to convert the paddy straw into uh, good fertilizer. And uh, at our uh, institute, to the, we have been working since uh, uh, six months to get an efficient microbial consortia to convert the paddy straw into efficient biofertilizer in a very short span of time. And we did the studies uh, using a 0.5 ton um, uh, per batch. And uh, we could able to uh, com convert this uh, rice straw into compost in 30 days uh, of time. And our focus is now to reduce the duration from 30 days to 20 days. And uh, in the first batch, and we have studied a few batches and we also analyzed the NPK of this uh, uh, obtained uh, fertilizer, we found the it has a good amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, the potash. And if you can see here, the potash content was 3.954%, which usually is retained in the um, fertilizer. Usually, uh, the now India is importing on uh, potash. So, this is a good sign uh, of um, composting of the paddy straw, which retained the high content of uh, potash. So these are the metagenomic profiling of the microbial consortia that we have been developed. And uh, we also worked on uh, uh, bioethanol from uh, the paddy straw. So usually when we uh, convert any lignocellulosic biomass or the agro residue, because of the presence of the lignin, the availability of the carbohydrates is minimal. So it is very important to break the lignin bond so that the carbohydrates can be easily available for the uh, next process system. So what we did here was usually pretreatment, generally people use either alkali or acid. So instead of alkali or acid, we developed green solvents and uh, which has uh, advantages for the conventional pretreatments. So if you see that they are 100% non-toxic, they're biodegradable and renewable, non-corrosive and they're also eco-friendly in nature and they're low cost, recyclable and reusable. So these are the, we tried to synthesize more than um, 25 solvents, green solvents using these uh, green solvents. Even we tried the pretreatment studies using the, uh, the pretreatment reactor that we have designed and developed at our uh, uh, spray. And we separated uh, the cellulose, lignin and uh, uh, xylan from the, um, the paddy straw and the cellulose which has been separated from this um, uh, using this nate splitted biomass was used for the ethanol fermentation and the lignin which we have extracted uh, through this process um, uh, we are now working on producing the nanoparticles from this lignin and also the lignin to lignin uh, nanofibers and the lignin uh, nanogels as well and we're also working on uh, xylan to xylitol other products uh, so this is the environmental or the societal impact uh, because of using of these green solvents because uh, it has advantage uh, it can be replaced the acid and alkaline free treatments of biomass and uh, uh, and it can be even recycled also so we have tried those experiments also and we found that at least three, three to four times the green solvents can be recovered and reused for the treatment of the fresh paddy straw and it also addresses the agro residue utilization for the pretreatment of biomass for 2G bioethanol production and for the value added production. 
at the end it impacts the functioning and products developed from a bio refinery and may reduce the cost of bioethanol production since we have using the concept of bio refinery here so uh, what are the other importance of this agricultural waste for the production of value added products other than the modern, modern biofuels and this agri agricultural waste can also be used for the production of biopolymers and value added products which i already told sugar so sugar alcohols furfurals aldehydes and phenols can be produced and we can also get the industrially important raw materials such as uh, uh, the high purity lignin cellulose xylan silica and biofertilizer as well so when it comes to the msw this is uh, again msw contains uh, or the wet organic fraction so the material which is an organic waste um, organic waste is in, of bio origin and biodegradable in nature so we can extract the energy from this organic waste and um, which can be a potential contributing factor to realize the objective of uh, safe waste disposal and energy independence and uh, import substitution so to convert to msw or organic fraction uh, biomethanation is one of the potential option for harnessing the energy from this material uh, through the advanced technological interventions so if you see the situation in gujarat gujarat is generating around 10000 uh, 10145 metric tons per day solid waste and out of this waste only 18% is put into treatment system that is uh, towards composting and uh, 63% is uh, thrown into open dumps only 1.63% is disposed into scientific uh, landfill sites um, so if you see the these are the suggested ways of waste treatment because since it, it, it contains wet organic fraction usually the wet organic fraction comprises of um, kitchen waste fruits and vegetable waste uh, and it is a good source for the biogas generation through biochemical conversion processes and uh, dry organic fraction it can be assembled for composting and when it comes to the plastic we can have a plastic pyrolysis unit we can get a bio oil and dry waste it comprises of again paper and cardboards etc and uh, it can be recycled and uh, and especially when it comes to the hazardous waste or the biomedical waste Uh, it is very important to to send it to them to the recognized facilities approved by the pollution board so we made uh, some uh, uh, estimate if you consider uh, 100 ton per day municipal waste so you can get uh, many products here so if you consider the 100 ton per day plant you can get around 40 ton per day of wet organic fraction and you can get the plastic at around 1 uh, ton per day recycled plastic and 2 ton per day waste plastic and uh, around 4 ton per day you can get the rdf and 3 ton per day paper waste and 50 ton per day the inert material and when it comes to the wet organic fraction as i already told that can be used for the biomethanation to get biogas and biofertilizer and we can clearly see the revenue generation of uh, this uh, converting this wet organic fraction into uh, the biofertilizer and biogas when it comes to the plastic and waste plastic through thermochemical processes we can uh, try for the pyrolysis and we get pyro oil and uh, we can also use the pelletizer machine to get the pellets as well and the paper waste when it comes to paper waste and uh, it can be recycled and you can get the recycled paper and in that material there is no option we have to send it for the landfilling so this is a uh, one one of the technology that we have available at our institute and which is a patented and which can be this technology can be tried for the treatment of multiple feed stocks so so what is this the uniqueness of this technology is that it is a 3d 3g technology and um, the initial capital investment if you see that it is 30% less than the conventional technology and it also requires 50% less water and the biogas yield also comparatively higher uh, at 14% higher biogas can be achieved and if you see the quality of the biofertilizer it has a good amount of nitrogen phosphorus and potash and the payback is less than 4 years again it depends on the capacity and uh, the the beauty of this technology is that it can be scalable to any size that is uh, down scale or up scale like uh, 0.5 ton per day 200 to 210 per day 
So based on this technology, now we are proposing to install a 3.5 ton per day plant, which will be installed very soon at Shri Krishna Hospital, Karamsat, Gujarat. And uh, we the expected biogas generation is 245 cubic meter per day. And uh, uh, we, this, the produced biogas will be supplied to the uh, existing, the thousand bed charity hospital where they are using 150 cubic meter of PNG. It will be replaced by the uh, produced biogas from this um, wet organic fraction of the municipal solid waste. And uh, the biofertilizer, which is going to produce uh, or which is going to come, which, which, which comes out from this plant will be uh, solid at a subsidized prices as well. And for that, we are looking for forwarded linkages will be provided as well. So the most important aspect of this um, plant is we are planning to have a segregation as well because municipal solid waste is a difficult material. Even in, uh, when you consider wet organic fraction, you will not get the um, complete wet organic fraction in a pure form. So therefore, it is very important to have a segregation. So we will be training the ULBS sanitation team, which are appointed by the urban local bodies. And uh, our emphasis will be segregation collection and uh, transportation and uh, so the, the societal impact we know that it will uh, clean the big heaps of the garbage inculcating the habits of segregation of waste uh, generating skill levels and cleanliness karmacharis and creating employment opportunities and uh, creating awareness among the citizens for waste segregation benefiting the stakeholders improve the farmers income and also to meet the thermal needs of the respective industries or the canteens, depending on the installed capacities through the generated biogas. So we uh, also worked on uh, solid state uh, domestic biogas plants, which is usually using the cattle dung as a material. This is also waste. So it is an uh, MNRE approved design as compared to the uh, common designs, it requires 80% uh, less water and uh, you get um, 30% more gas and uh, it is especially because it, the system is uh, operating under solid state. So it is uh, it is the best design for uh, wherever the water is scared. And uh, the our institute has install, installed more than um, 80 number of plants of different capacities uh, of uh, two, two and six cubic meter in different parts of Gujarat. Even we also installed 10 numbers of uh, two and four cubic meter capacity biogas plants, which are linked to the toilets in different parts of Gujarat. So these are the images of the PLD demonstrations that have, that, that have been carried out by Spray. And uh, this is an image, which, uh, image where the biogas plant has been connected to the toilets where the, uh, to reduce the water requirement. Um, so we also developed a technology for kitchen waste and uh, we installed uh, uh, different capacities like ranging from 50 to 1000 kg per day. So this is a, um, one of the uh, installed plant at um, Sri Krishna Hospital Karamsat. The capacity of this plant is 10 cubic meter. So we also have uh, another technology or the process, uh, we should say, the Mandi waste treatment plant. It is uh, depending on the two stage anaerobic digestion, where we have separated the acid phase and the methane phase to get uh, the to avoid the difficulties which we usually see in a single stage uh, anaerobic digesters. So again, we have a technology which is available for water hyacinth treatment plant, uh, which is again a two stage anaerobic digestion and um, which we have uh, uh, tried at uh, Spurry itself uh, uh, where to treat 500 kg per day of the water hyacinth to generate biogas. So when it comes to the agro-industrial effluent, and if you see the dairy industries, we, we usually, uh, they, the dairies are usually generated dairy effluent and dairy waste is come, and uh, there is, we do often get the cattle dung as well. So we did some financials of these waste materials which are generating from these dairy industries. We can clearly see here that which, which can be, to, it has a tremendous potential uh, for using these materials for the uh, production of uh, biogas. 
what the dairy industry is usually they do is when the dairy is generates dairy effluent they simply send it to the raw effluent collection tank and from there it goes to the fat, uh, fat trap unit and from there it goes to the equalization tank and uh, from the equalization tank they finally send it to the etp that is the effluent treatment plant so what we are trying to put is instead of sending the water from the equalization tank to the effluent treatment plant you can have a a biogas digester in between since this dairy effluent will have uh, organic material so that can be uh, used for the production of biogas um, one way is that and uh, the other option is that since this dairy effluent will also have the fat material if you don't remove this fat material it may block the anaerobic digesters as well it may create a problem in long run so instead of that if you can remove the fat material that is a top layer Uh, when the dairy effluent is reaching the fat trap unit and uh, then separately you can have uh, one more anaerobic digester where you can extract the energy in the form of biogas and then you can have a common biogas gas storage unit to, to store the gas produced from these two digesters and uh, it can be used for the thermal application or the um, uh, industry uh, the the application where the industry is interested So if you see the cost savings of the anaerobic process or the aerobic process, because if you, um, uh, then generally these dairy industries they go for ETP, because ETP in the sense they have they have to go for the continuous aeration. They uh, even add chemicals to, to reduce the COD to meet the CPCB norms. So we made the calculation for the one lakh liter per day. so the cost is coming around 3230 rupees through etp process that is a conventional process when they opt for the anaerobic digestion the cost is around only 338 rupees but if you see the cod outlet still through anaerobic process this is not meeting the cpcb norms which is of 250 mg per liter so that what we can propose is since through anaerobic digestion you can only able to reduce the cod load up to 75 to 80% so once that load has been reduced so that can be again sent it back to the utp uh, for the uh, reducing the cod of uh, the cpcb cpcb norms where if you see that the cost is around 1000 rupees so if we combine the dual process that is anaerobic followed by utp the cost is coming around um, uh, 34 1400 rupees whereas uh, if you opt only for the utp which is around Uh, 3230 rupees we can save around uh, 1900 rupees uh, per day to treat uh, during the treatment of the one lakh liter so these are the installed plants by uh, sprayery at vidyadari anand to treat the dairy effluent uh, and this is a scum based treatment plant again we have installed at vidyadari anand and uh, where uh, they are feeding uh, around 500 kg of material uh, every day so we also uh, you developed a um, uh, dairy of into clean water process through microalkyl treatment so this is uh, what we have uh, screened many microalkyl strains and which have been used for the cultivation of the microalgae and they have been cultivated in a different pellet cell cultivation systems um, like ranging from 3000 liters to 5000 liters and uh, uh, after the cultivation Uh, the the biomass has been uh, harvested and it has been dried using the solar dryer which has been developed by again uh, our institute and uh, the and lipids were extracted and uh, the extracted lipids were used for the uh, microbial uh, the microalgal biodiesel production and at the same time we are also since we are uh, focusing on bio refinery concept to make it to make the complete process more economically viable we are also focusing on other by products as well that is bio hydrogen and uh, biomethane pigments and protein from the uh, the and also on the aqua feed uh, from the dry biomass as well as the delipidified microalgal biomass so these are the uniqueness i have already told so this is a eco friendly process no use of harsh chemicals are required here and the treated water can be directly used for irrigation purpose because it is meeting the cpcb norms of uh, type b water so type b water in the sense it can be used for the irrigation purpose 
it also reduces the groundwater consumption no harmful discharges into the environment and you can uh, have a revenue generation because uh, we are focusing on other value added products from these uh, biomass to get a derived products um, so very recently we um, installed a uh, biomethanation plant to treat the potato waste water and uh, the capacity of this uh, biodigester is uh, uh, 2 to 1.5 lakh liter of potato waste water which has been installed at goodrich cereals canal and uh, since we have been i have been talking on the biogas if you see the versatility of the biogas and when you get the raw biogas it can be used for the electric electricity generation using the 100% biogas engines or even it can be upgraded once it is upgraded it can be bottled and the bottled biogas can be again um, uh sent it for electricity generation in remote areas otherwise it can be injected into the natural grid as well if uh, the quantity of this upgraded biogas is in use and uh, the bottled biogas can be used for the transportation fuel as a, for the vehicle as well so now the ministry of petroleum and natural gas launched the sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation in 2018 to um, to promote the compressed biogas as an alternative green transport fuel so the target of this ministry is to have um, 5000 commercial plants to be set up and uh, each will be producing around the 7 to 10 tons of uh, compressed biogas so it will process around 70 to 100 tons of feed stock by 2025 so there is no technology choice and the ministry is also uh, focusing on uh, getting the cpg from the agriculture residue and the cattle dung and also the municipal solid waste so what is compressed biogas is biogas after purification is called compressed and compressed biogas is exactly which is similar to the commercially available natural gas in its composition and energy potential and the compressed biogas can be used as an alternative renewable automotive fuel as well and it has potential to replace the cng in automotive industrial and commercial uses in the country so if you see the benefits of uh, the compressed biogas responsible waste management reduction in carbon emissions and pollution and uh, it can uh, generate the additional revenue source for the farmers and it's a boost to the entrepreneurship rural economy and employment and uh, it is uh, it also supports to national commitments to achieving the climate change goals and the reduction in import of natural gas and crude oil and it can also act as a good buffer for the crude oil and gas pricing fluctuations um, so besides cooking and industrial applications uh, cpg can be used as a transport fuel as well so if you see the waste streams and uh, the compressed biogas potential and again the agri residue is coming in the picture msw is also there and if you see the potential bio cng potential from surplus agri residue it is around 20 million metric tons whereas in case of msw it is 5 million metric tons so, so at the end the bioenergy technology r and d priorities if you see conventional biofuels continuing r and d to improve conversion efficiencies reduce cost and improve uh, greenhouse gas benefits and uh, improvements in efficiency of biofuel use in engines and other conversion devices and when it comes to the advanced biofuels development at a laboratory and pilot scale of efficient biofuel technology based on thermal roots such as pyrolysis and uh, gasification and uh, of hybrid thermal and uh, biochemical processes so um, so and uh, when it comes to the r and d requirements for the advanced biofuels development and demonstration routes to diesel and biojet with improved cost better c efficiency and um, uh, greenhouse gas performance including integration of bioenergy with renewable based hydrogen identification of potential and uh, development paths for cost reduction when non bio based low carbon fuels the r and d requirements are development of processes for low carbon fuels from waste gases and other sources so when it comes to the uh, bio refineries uh, the r and d requirement is identification of range of efficient integrated bio refinery approaches is very important and uh, for the studies of the role of bioenergy within the integrated bio economy is also uh, important in in the r and d phase uh, 
thank you. And now I would like to, I, uh, once again, I thank the organizing committee for uh, giving me this opportunity to deliver a talk during the today's webinar. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, I think the uh, questions we want to take. Uh, anybody has quick, any question, please? Any text questions from the student? So, thank you, madam. Very nicely, you have narrated all the things about this prairie also and what the work it is doing on different aspects of uh, biomass. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Now, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Anil Pawar. He will give his uh, address on thermochemical conversion of biomass, sustainable routes for biofuel production. He's a research scientist from MPAUT. I invite him, Dr. Anil Pawar, please. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, respected dais and uh, dear students and uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, sir, very uh, Good evening to all. Uh, I am presenting uh, this talk on uh, this thermochemical conversion uh, of this biomass, a sustainable uh, route for biofuel production from agricultural crop residue. So as uh, uh, earlier speakers and even in the inaugural session, a lot of discussion has been initiated on the crop residue management and the energy generation, particularly from crop residues. So as, as in the morning uh, we dis uh, is, uh, discussed that uh, the India uh, is an agrarian country and about uh, 140 million hectares as an air zone area and with a wide uh, diversity of uh, types and uh, different type of crop uh, is being cultivated and product producing across the country. And as uh, earlier in the morning session it was well mentioned that uh, the India's uh, the agricultural produce approximately 683 million tons of the crop residues on an annual basis. So there are huge amounts and there is a good potential uh, for the energy generation. And uh, out of this, this, most of this crop residues mainly uh, used for animal feed, to feed our animals, and for soil mulchings, and for manuring, hatching our uh, rural homes, and fuel for domestic and industrial use. And thus, there is a tremendous uh, value uh, for the farmers that farmer can enhance their income uh, by effective and proper utilization of this crop residue. Uh, uh, and this, if we look around the country in one more, uh, this uh, report uh, presented by TIFEC and IRA peoples, uh, they clearly found that one third of this crop residue remain uh, unutilized for the energy uh, or for economic purpose. And the utilized of the crop uh, biomass is, is can be reduced to power generation or the second generation of the fuel. And now in more advanced, uh, we go for fourth generation of the fuel from the crop residue through using different uh, conversion process, including a bioconversion, thermochemical conversion also. So there is a huge scope for, for energy generation or converting the crop residue into the uh, bio, uh, biofuel. So it's how globally uh, the year they're increasing as energy uh, demand continuously increasing. And uh, uh, if we use this as an fuel, uh, that's reduce the vehicular emissions and increase the transport sustainability. And as our honorable uh, transport minister, Nathan Gadigri Sab is always mentioning on that how we can use uh, this uh, uh, kind of crop residue for uh, converting into the bioethanol, butanol. So, or it's a kind of other uh, transportable or vehicle fuel to reduce the vehicular emissions and maintain the sustainability. So transport sectors, if we look around uh, the transport sectors in the countries, so one third of the global, uh, this energy utilization and half of the oil consumptions in approximately one fourth of the CO2 emissions is specifically uh, combustion of the fossil fuels. And this is contributed by the transportation sector. 
So if we produce the vehicular quality fuels, as, as earlier speaker mentioned, the bio CNG and on the liquid biofuel and this kind of things that we can initiate and we can utilize uh, this crop residue for energy generation. So as uh, always uh, making this kind of the noise that's uh, burning the crop residues in the Punjabs uh, and this is in the Western UP and, and the Punjab and Haryana states, they are burning this crop residue and this creating the nuisance in the environment and that uh, PM 2.5 and other noxious gases, they're stunned in the daily peripheries. Uh, so it's create uh, problems. So it can uh, use this kind of uh, converting this into the form of energy. So uh, as far as the biomass is concerned, there's many speakers mentions on this biomass. That's a organic containing carbonous material, which comprises or agriculture residues, your sewage, uh, municipal solid waste, animal dung, and forest residues. These are some source of the uh, bio resources and that you can actually uh, use. So the plant such materials, that is a grass, agricultural crops, and biological materials, and can be used as in a soil fuel or in converting the liquid or in gaseous form uh, for the production of electric power, and heat, uh, thermochemical, these are chemicals or uh, fuels. So there's a different route as earlier, uh, Dr. Gangal sir has already mentioned that the combustion, gasification, pyrolysis, liquefaction, there are different uh, route uh, is there to convert into the form of the heat. So uh, combustion has earlier discussed that thermochemical, yeah, this combustion means the conversion of this organic matter with an oxidants or a plenty air maintaining excometric air fuel ratio, and then combust uh, to get the heat and and the pyrolysis, this is a destructive distillation kind of things. So in absence of uh, the oxygen, the organic material that thermally degraded, so we can get uh, the solid as well as a liquid fuel. So this biomass community is commonly referred to the low temperature thermal process for producing the liquid and primary. Now is more advanced technologies there for going from the uh, ultra pyrolysis or vacuum pyrolysis process for different product. And we're getting different product with the different uh, resonance uh, times and different heating rates. So and the gasification is concerned, there's a partial combustion uh, and uh, it is a temperature goes about 100, uh, 700 degrees Celsius. And in primary categories, the partial oxidation or indirect heating of things is, is, is in place in the gasification process is concerned. So, so that the fuel and the chemicals, some other materials, for the power that can be achieved from the biomass. So we use this kind of different feed stock, you know, uh, trees, forest residues, grasses, agricultural crops, that residues, animal waste and municipal waste. So to different thermochemical conversion route, different conversion routes, that's maybe your gasification, combustion or co-firing in the cement industries and some other sugar industries are also using and pyrolysis, enzymatic fermentation and other. So we are getting a value added product so like ethanol in the renewable form, but the diesel is because your biodiesel through uh, energy crops using the jetropa seed or mahua seed or other uh, seeds. And for electricity generations, uh, bio CNG, they directly burn the engines is 100% biogas engine is available. So that can convert the electricity or heat for thermal applications from some valuable chemicals, so then some plastics, solvents, pharmaceutical product, some phenolic groups, adhesive, fatty acid, acetic acid, and carbon black, some paints, dyeing pigments and detergents that can achieve uh, through the biomass or different, thermo, uh, different conversion routes. So these are some value products and the conversion uh, technologies uh, either go for the physical conversion of the biomass or thermochemical or biochemical conversion. So as far as physical conversion is concerned, so we're crushing the biomass as a loose biomass is available Plentily, as, it, as uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned that uh, 683 million tons of crop residues available across the country. So, the, if uh, the partial uh, the thing says the seven or 30 percent uh, biomass is a surplus in nature, so 178 million tons approximately is available as a uh, surplus biomass, and 40 percent used for feeder uh, domestic energy requirement, and 30 to 35 percent considers a your um, animal uh, uh, feed materials. So this uh, this remaining surplus biomass, so is in loose in loose forms, or some woody sticks or forest residue, they should grind it 
and cr crushing and grinding so we can make the pellets uh, it can be in the solid fuel so we can try this uh, biomass to achieve the solid pelletizing and cricketing because the loose biomass is a huge volume so transportation logistic issues is there and if we transports is more than 30 km or so then it is not economically viable so convert into the pelletization or briquetting so we achieve the solid fuel and as far as thermochemical is concerned so it is either, either it is an indirect combustion process to achieve the heat energy and gasification to achieve the synthetic gas that is your syn gas as, as, as in a fuel gas so uh, further it can be in downstream process we can convert into the pure hydrogen or pure as a kind of gas to remove all impurities and it can fit into the engine and torrefaction is another option so torrefaction is basically as heating the biomass up to 280 to uh, 230 to 250 degrees celsius for 15 to 30 minutes in absence of air so that all biomass is being uh, uh, converting is uh, in the hydrophobic nature so is a thermal treatment of the biomass so it improves the grindability and increase the energy content and it, when it turned into the combustion process, it's need a clean combustion in the in, uh, in the boiler or in the furnace. And the pyrolysis, as others go for the slow pyrolysis process, then we are achieving the biochar. And if we go to the fast pyrolysis or ultra fast pyrolysis, then we get the quality bio oil. And some sort of the, the gas is also uh, is available. And hydrothermal liquefications. Uh, and the biogas process so in thermochemical uh, process uh, we can see the bio uh, this pyrolysis so in uh, slow pyrolysis the temperature uh, varies in the range of uh, 350 to 700 degrees celsius for the 30 minutes and that varies the heating rate so heating rate play major role by deciding whether it is a cross pyrolysis process or slow pyrolysis process so in case of uh, the heating rate uh, is less than 25 uh, degree Celsius per minute, then it is a slow pyrolysis process. So the main product in slow pyrolysis process is the biochar or charcoal. Here, uh, say the charcoal and the biochar, uh, if it, but the feed material uh, remains same. Uh, if we use uh, the crop residue, then that we produce the biochar. So biochar is specifically intended for the agriculture purpose. Then only we can say that it is the biochar. And if it is used for the fuel purpose, then it is a charcoal. But the feed material and operating condition was the same. But it depends and classified on the basis of what their application only. And in the fast pyrolysis is concerned, it is the residence time is uh, even less than one second. And heating rate it has to be greater than 10 degrees per second. So this much heating rate is required in fast pyrolysis process. So we can get the liquid and quality charge. And torrefaction so 200 to 300 degrees Celsius for uh, 15 to 16 minutes, 60 minutes, sorry. Uh, then hydrothermal liquefaction is maintaining the pressure and gasification, atmospheric pressure and temperature, then the oxidation zone sometimes lead to 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius and the oxidation zone and different zone has been established as discussed earlier by Dr. Gangi sir. And another uh, important uh, topic uh, issue this. Uh, is a dendrothermal power generation. And then the morning session, Professor Athor, Sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor of MPUT, discussed that dendrothermal power generation. So dendro basically is the getting the energy or the power from the biomass only. Dendro means the late words related to your uh, biomass. So if we, uh, this is uh, say the external combustion process. So we are generating the heat and passes to the gas turbine. And then it is called a thermodynamic cycle, is a Britain cycle. If you use the gas as a working media to turn the turbine. And if uh, we pass it through heat turbine and uh, through heat exchanger and run the gas turbine, uh, then it is a sterling engine. And if we use this uh, heat and heating the organic uh, um, fluids or steam or organic vapor and turn into the steam turbine, then it is a Rankine cycle. So that all couples with thermodynamically Brayton cycle, Stirling cycle, or Rankine the electricity, and then all can achieve through uh, the combustion of the biomass. It is an external combustion uh, process. So uh, this is one option that uh, we, if we convert this loose biomass into 
the briquettes on the pellets and filled in the furnace to generate the steam or that direct heat and transferring to the gas turbine or steam turbine then we can achieve the this electricity generation uh, through the biomass so as far as we uh, discussing the first generation uh, generation of the fuel so first generation fuels uh, this is from the food crop and two main type of the first generation biofuel uh, are commercially as a biodiesel or ethanol it is well known and established technology and uh, biodiesel is a substitute of the diesel and produced through transesterification process of the vegetable oil and residues and fats with the minor engine modification so and butanols and bioethanols is substitute of the gasoline fuel and it is to be derived from your sugar or a starch uh, through fermentation process and more easily be blended uh, with a gasoline fuel and as far as second generation is concerned uh, the fuel from non crop uh, food source and there is a marginal crop land uh, or the land which is unsuitable for food production that can be used uh, uh, for generating the second kind uh, generation of the fuel and through thermochemical and biochemical conversion are the route to achieve this 2g uh, fuel process and third generation is uh, your algal or microorganism based technology and is still is in developing stage it's not totally stabilized and biodiesel butanol ethanol vegetable soils there is a try to the algae so a different uh, mode or either the open pond or closed loop or photobio reactor to cultivate this uh, algae uh, to generate the third generation of the fuel and fourth generation uh, is a kind of fuel uh, this is you say the carbon sequestration uh, fuel uh, so but that's genetically engineering or genetically modified uh, is a kind of the crop uh, which has a high biomass yield low lignin content and enhance the carbon storage capacity and this can be achieved through genetically modified which absorbs more carbon dioxide from atmosphere and through pyrolysis process the gasification and digester so uh, we upgrade the fuel through cleaning cleaning or or gas cleaning or liquefaction process so we dump uh, separating the carbon dioxide and this carbon sequestration is depleted in the uh, you are depleted oil or gas field or unmined coal uh, the same sort of saline aquifer so ultra clean uh, carbon negative fuels or bio biohydrogens or bio methane or synthetic biofuel that is due to the end user for transportation or electricity generation so carbon sequestration is, is quite possible if you use for third and gen fourth generation of the uh, fuel so carbon sequestration means you have to observing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so we develop such a kind of the fuel or a kind of the things which observe the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide or atmospheric carbon so these are the thermal conversion route as already discussed so simple see this uh, what is the biomass gasification so the basic process and the chemistry is concerns that uh, conversion of the solid fuel into the combustible gases mixture is called producer gas which uh, mainly compresses with uh, carbon monoxide hydrogen and the methane it in all partial combustion and four different zones is your drying pyrolysis combustion and uh, the reduction zones that are well established in the all kind of uh, this uh, uh, gasifiers whether it is a downdraft updraft or cross draft uh, type of uh, gasifier so in this uh, things the gasifier the basic process and the chemistry schematic you see in upper zone this one is the downdraft type gasifier and the centers the at this positions the allowing the air and this position being the red one is a com combustion zone at the throat so that's all biomass uh, is, is being combusted though it is the partial combustion process and upper yellow is thing see is your uh, pyrolysis zone and greenery is so your as a kind of drying zone so and after drying that's all heat is in accumulated upper side then see is no air is available in this zone so it is all biomass dried biomass that it can say this of completely burnt dry biomass it is converted to the charcoal and that charcoal move toward in the oxidation zone and being combust and then it partially in the reduction zone so it uh, in during the reduction zone basically this reduce or the cracking this carbon dioxide in the carbon monoxide some uh, things uh, that is during production during this uh, pyrolysis process uh, some sort of the acetic acid or methanol or this is being produced 
because it's a part of destructive distillation. So it converted and splitted uh, during the oxidation. Johns is fully combust. Whatever tar is being produced is fully combust. And whatever other impurities there, that completely combust and cracked. So let's give a clean gas. There is a low tar content in the outer type gasifier and low uh, kind of impurities is there. However, it is a uh, ash content in this one is more. So I have to pass this gas into the cyclone separator. So uh, it, uh, once you pass in cyclone separator, the foreign ash particle will deposit and then clean and uh, cool the gas. Once you cool this gas, then can feed into the engine. So uh, because uh, just below it, we are getting the gas just below the oxidation, this reduction zone. So the temperature of the gas outlets may be 300 to 400 degrees Celsius, and it is not possible to feed this gas into the engine. So we have to uh, cool this gas to atmospheric temperature. And uh, if uh, some sort of, say, the air conditioning type of cooling or chiller is there, then uh, that purely cooled gas that can feed into the engine and uh, ultra cleaning is there of ultra cool, you know, say, in terms of the turbo tar charging type system, then ultimately uh, to give a clean and uh, uninterrupted nature of the uh, electricity supply. So this novelty in downdraft gasifier is that that is give a clean gas though the temperature is very high, but we can reduce this temperature by water scrubbing process or some other uh, uh, cooling method so that can feed into the engine. So tar is not a big issue in downdraft type gasifier, but updraft and this cross draft has a big uh, dealing with the tar. So that can be used for thermal application, but this is recommended for engine application. And uh, if we compress uh, comprising this uh, producer gas compositions, so see the carbon monoxide, uh, if we go for the woody biomass, that 50 to 20 percent carbon monoxide and 15 to 20 percent hydrogen, up to uh, 3 percent is the methane uh, uh, content and nitrogen contributing the 50 uh, 45 to 50 percent. So I would like to mention that why this nitrogen is more high in producer gas because this. Uh, when it's dealing with the combustion, though it is a partial combustion process, but that nitrogen is high because the air is containing 78% of the nitrogen. So the nitrogen is neither help in combustion nor is a combustible gas. So it is actually inert gas. That, that's why the, uh, the content of the nitrogen in producer gas is much, much higher than the other uh, combustible gases. So the calorific value, you know, it is around your, nine, uh, your 900 to 1100 kilocalorie per normal cubic meter. And gas generation per kg of the biomass, it can generate uh, 2 to 2.5 uh, normal cubic meter of the gas uh, per kg. So by this uh, way, I took from the Angkor gasifier models so how they clean this gas, so different uh, cooling mode is there. Uh, and see the, what, what is the application of this uh, producer gas? So power generation that just can be due to the irrigation, uh, rural uh, village electrification, capacity power generation, and grid fed uh, from the energy plantation or wasteland. Simultaneously, we can achieve the charcoal and the power production. And thermally, we can uh, generate the hot air, and that hot air can feed in the tire. So we can dry the agricultural crop uh, crops or uh, to enhance that value. So value due to product uh, through the dryer that can be achieved, and we can supply the constant uh, temperature hot air in the dryer and the boiler for uh, generating the steams or other kind of uh, the unit operation is uh, heat processed heat and thermic fluid heaters or in oven furnace or clean that can be used in the thermal for thermal application purpose so these are the environmental uh, issues if we clean the gas or cool the gas through the water so recirculation uh, that can be uh, possible uh, so the zero discharge is there. Occasionally, we just to adjust the pH, uh, simple treatment is required for water treatment to uh, uh, set the pH level. And gasifier does not release the gas in the atmosphere. So combustion uh, in the user equipment, so connector gas is much cleaner as compared to other liquid fuel. So solid waste only charcoal and ash. So the biological ash that can return to the soil. And the noise, noise level is, as compared 100% lower than the liquid fuel. So now it's just coming to this uh, biochar. Uh, so uh, I specifically working on this production and utilization of the biochar. 
so this biochar basically uh, that charcoal is generated by heating of the organic matter in oxygen or limited oxygen conditions so it enables this soil biota and flourishing and assisting the process for nutrient flow and increase the cation exchange capacity and water nutrient retention so this is the importance of the biochar if we add in the soil so certainly it increase the quality of the soil or improve the health of the soil so the role of this biochar you see this soil uh, basically it containing about 2000 uh, 344 gigatons of uh, this organic carbon at global level so slight changes in the organic this uh, carbon content in the soil biota it uh, totally disturb the eco ecological imbalance so atmospheric carbon concentration significantly effective slight change in the carbon content so uh, we uh, our focus uh, as a result so more and more organic carbon is to be added into the soil uh, so that biochar is a quite uh, emerging uh, technology so if we uh, feed into biochar into the soil then it increase the quality so why this biochar is uh, playing the major role in in, in the indian uh, uh, agriculture so it uh, leads the mitigation of the climate change soil improvements energy uh, productions and waste management so uh, as in the previous slide i mentioned that uh, people are burning this crop residue in the field so if we collect this crop residue or in through the self help group or some other uh, conversion mode so that waste management issue that can be solved and if we properly managed it converted into solid fuel and then certainly that uh, mitigating with this the uh, uh, that feed into the boiler also so the fossil fuel reduction is will be there so we the, we lead for the mitigation uh, purpose and we feed the biochar is soil into the soil then the, the improving the soil and certainly if we are not using the soil then can feed in the boiler or some other application for fuel generation then the energy is quite possible so social beneficial and uh, social and financial benefit that can be achieved if we manage this crop residues or the uh, for uh, agricultural waste uh, for waste management mitigations and soil so we can achieve the social financial benefit through the biochar so uh, primarily study is uh, to compare the char in different thermal process so in slow pyrolysis process in all this uh, external heating source as we there so the up to 500 degrees celsius for 30 minutes and then slow pyrolysis process is taking place and in fast pyrolysis so 2 to 3 seconds this is residence time so whatever vapor is being generated during the heating process that is to be escape out from uh, the reactor within 2 to 2 seconds then it condenses it then we get the liquid bio oil and then we get uh, residual parts is your uh, biochar and gasification or combustion or infiltration the air Is there for few minutes for 750 degrees Celsius onward. So we, uh, this thermochemical process that can be achieved, uh, this biochar through this process, and uh, see this carbon uh, neutral uh, versus the carbon negative. If we use this bio biomass as such feed into the soil, see in the uh, this slides that this carbon cycle is there. So during the respiratory process, the carbon. Uh, dioxide is being released and 50% of this is heated by the soil and then remaining 50% lit in the atmosphere and again it being utilized so this may a carbon neutral net withdrawal from the atmosphere is zero but if we convert this crop residue or the some things into the pyrolysis process through the biochar and 25% in the biochar 25% bioenergy carbon neutral residues emission this 25% again this is is from uh, this carbon to 25 and this 5% so net withdrawal uh, is from the atmosphere is 25% 20% so if we add this biochar into the soil so we can see the 20% net uh, withdrawal from the atmosphere if we not convert this biochar uh, the crop residue into the biochar then it is a carbon neutral or say that there is no uh, 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 you say the withdrawal the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere but if we convert into the biochar and feed in the soil then the plant will absorb the 25% more uh, withdraw the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere now this is uh, the uh, the carbon neutral versus the carbon negative cycle so biochar plays a major role in the carbon sequestration uh, things so see in this case this uh, 
simple uh, way and that the, the biomass economics or say the rural refineries so the mobile uh, forestry uh, things so that you can go for this uh, say kind of biomass uh, mobile pyrolysis unit so we can achieve to your biochar and that's bio rural bio refineries we can liquid bio can fill the refineries or forest residue stationary pyrolysis unit or mobile pyrolysis units and then modified this modification is required because if we achieve the or the product produce or getting the bio oil from the pyrolysis process it contain water content in this liquid is much much higher up to 42 uh, 40 to 45 percent oil having the uh, this uh, water content so we have to separate the oil and upgrade it through the catalytic process then uh, that it can be use in uh, as in a gasoline or diesel or in jet fuel so uh, refinery modified refinery is, is, is required in uh, the in case of the bio oil is concerned so uh, if it time uh, we see this uh, timeline uh, for this so if we burn this fossil fuel then 100 uh, millions years is required if biomass is converted into the fossil fuel or the mines coal and 200 uh, plus 200 years of fossil fuel consumption the carbon so car more carbon uh, is being released while burning the mines coal and if we burn this uh, the biomass and convert in the biocarbon uh, fraction of hours you know, say the 100 within 100 minutes we can convert uh, this biomass into the uh, biocarbon but 100 millions here is, is required to convert the biomass into the coal so if add the biochar in the soil so it is sustained for hundreds or thousands of years for long term carbon sequestration one study uh, the research published in the nature journals um, professor spock uh, they conduct the study and mentioned that if the oc ratio or oxygen to the carbon uh, ratio on the molar basis is point, uh, one, 0 0.1 is there then it can sustain up to 1000 years in the soil so that uh, well established uh, study they have conducted and so if we maintain the proper uh, oxygen to carbon ratio then certainly it's uh, sustain the longer uh, period in the soil and use as a carbon sequestration agent so more carbon this can be withdrawal uh, from the atmosphere so we can contribute a lot being an agriculture engineer or scientist we can contribute a lot to the country and we can meet the, whatever things is being considered in the Copenhagen or Chicago meetings uh, in, regarding this uh, carbon mitigation option. So this can play the major role. And another uh, thing is the prosperous juliflora is a main source and it is a traditionally converting, uh, cutting this uh, materials and making the homes and making the earthen ports and converting these things into the biochar. Uh, so, or in the charcoal, so transportation or mold cleans they are using. But the efficiency of this one is uh, not uh, uh, favorable. Or sometimes it's lead to the complete combustion, sometimes it's not complete converted to the biochar or in charcoal. So uh, sometimes uh, when we burn this uh, uh, charcoal, it's really the smoke because all material is being not volatilized. It's not being released. So the all volatile material is not released. It means it, while burning, it will release the smoke. So uh, this kind of the huge nuisance is creating the environment if we uh, producing the biochar or the charcoal, uh, this two traditional methods. So we can think on uh, the modified or uh, uh, latest technology on this one. So these are the few, few, uh, few uh, advanced technology kind of things. So autothermal, a clean type of thing. So a metallic cleans uh, properly being used and through combustioning process, retort with direct heating, using the pyrolysis gases and we uh, in Udaipur uh, we develop this continuous type of biochar production system uh, where we feed the biomass uh, into the hopper and this two co-centric cylinder is there so uh, this red red is the diesel burner and this is a plenum chamber where biomass this uh, uh, diesel is being combusted and generating the hot air and that hot air passes through this long way it is around 2.6 meter is length is there so it generating the hot air and passing through the thermal process that uh, inside the we are achieving the 450 degrees Celsius temperature then we feed this crop residue uh, and and a screw conveyor is there 
so they once they are heating in indirectly and we are getting the biochar so uh, this is uh, the way that how uh, I'm showing one video, please. See, this one is, is a kind of things. Uh, later on, we shifted uh, one things on this automatic screw conveyor. So they directly, uh, that's can be fit into the hopper. And in this one is basically, we are maintaining the residence time for four minutes. So we are fitting this groundnut shell. So we tested it with the groundnut shell. And uh, uh, this uh, chopped mat, uh, mage cobs and uh, chana grams is kind of feed stock we have used. And see this is, uh, this is a kind of red hot, uh, is a kind of char charcoal is produced from the uh, groundnut shell. And uh, uh, at this stage, initially uh, we observed that the considerable amount of smoke is being generated. So later we uh, shifted uh, to collect this smoke, condense this, things and uh, uh, condenses, we're getting the liquid and whatever uh, uncondensable uh, but combustible gas is there that feed, feed into the uh, hop with this uh, plenum chamber. So it reduces the fuel consumptions. Uh, so it can move to, uh, turn into the sustainability uh, mode. So through third party evaluation, we uh, found that this carbon uh, uh, that's produced through continuous type of biochar production system that is having around uh, uh, 80 to 82 percent of the organic carbon and if we go for the traditional one it's, uh, it's going around 65 to 70 percent of the organic carbon in the uh, the biochar so we are getting much higher level of the organic carbon so it has a great potential uh, to uh, in in the carbon sequestration process and uh, it is uh, say and uh, go through the internet and found that this biochar the cost of the biochar somewhere it is around to Amazon's or some Google websites they are mentioning that uh, 250 to 300 rupees a kg. But if if we sell this kind of things uh, even in 30 rupees a kg, then considerable margin that the farmers that can achieve. So uh, this is the way that how we can convert uh, this kind of things within a four minutes. Within a four minutes, it is a continuous type of process. Uh, we convert this uh, biomass in, into uh, this is a kind of, uh, see, we are feeding from this end in a continuous manner. So uh, indirect heating is there, it converting this crop residue into the biochar. And once it achieved at this point, we sorting the water, cooled it, and uh, uh, feed or in, uh, collect in the uh, cylinder. So in a drum and chopped it and we can sell it in the market and one this uh, our, our organ director research is working on organic farming so they tested this biochar in their their field and they're getting an encouraging result in the crop yield so we can think on it uh, that's is a new research area and uh, this is uh, say some dimension the length of this screw is to 40 cent to 2.4 meter is, is the length and this diameter screw pitch also and proximate analysis uh, of this groundnut shell uh, before fitting into the reactors. Uh, we have checked this one. And this is the biochar that is produced from the groundnut shell. So it's a quality uh, biochar. And, and I once uh, I have gone through the, some internet literature that is found that they, according to this uh, Nakasai Bhaskar Reddy, uh, the member of this Munda tribes living in the Orisha Jharkhand, and they in West Bengal, they use the biochar for enriching their cow and uh, chicken dunks for increasing the crop productivity. But they are not doing this scientifically. But they traditionally, they, their ancestors, their our ancestors also using that organic uh, this ash in the field. So they are getting the encouraging results. And even their tribals are. Uh, this studies was conducted in two thousand nine. So this has a good potential if we feed, use this biochar into the soil and that increase the crop productivity and help in carbon sequestration. So this the two way that win-win uh, situation that can be achieved. If we convert this crop residue into biochar or if we are introducing the biochar as in biochar, then we 
use as in a fuel. So that uh, smart, this climate is smart benefit of this biochar as your uh, biofertility, that biochar is improve the soil fertility, stimulating the plant growth, and which uh, then consume the more carbon uh, dioxide and in a positive feedback effect. And certainly that reduce the fertilizer input as our honorable prime minister always has, uh, emphasized to increase the income of the farmers or the doubling the income of the farmers by 2022. But so we can contribute uh, being an energy engineers or being an agriculture scientist, we can contribute that it can reduce the input cost of the farmer. Once you reduce the input cost, chemical or the fertilizer input, if you reduce using this biochar, that raw material is ours, we have technology with us, we can convert this into the biochar and put it into the soil. So certainly the input cost, chemical fertilizer cost will increase, uh, will reduce, and that, that output certainly will increase. So, uh, and certainly that whatever energy is required for production of the chemical energy, chemical fertilizer, that during this production, the greenhouse gas certainly will uh, reduce and reduce this NOx and uh, methane emissions. So biochar can reduce the emission of uh, this nitrous oxide and methane and, and to potent greenhouse gas from the agricultural soil science. So, and, and certainly the microbial life of the soil certainly will be enhanced. So it increased the resulting the more carbon storage in the soil. And it reduced the soil emission from the feed stocks. So uh, see this emissions, the converting agricultural and forest waste into the biochar, it can avoid the CO2 and methane emissions. Otherwise it's generated uh, by the natural decomposition or burning of the waste. So if it dumped the biomass in the field, so it naturally it will decompose and generate the carbon and I, or, or methane. So certainly we are contributing the increasing the greenhouse gas. So if we convert uh, through this mode, so we can reduce this methane emission and no doubt the energy generation is there. So heat energy and also the bio oil and synthetic gases, as we discussed in the, some as a kind of phenolic groups, uh, things, cosmetics, uh, things, and that can be achieved uh, through different uh, uh, mode by upgrading this uh, bio oil or production process. So uh, this can be achieved in the positive energy from the fossil fuels. So uh, with our study, we found that uh, that's our that what we developed that there's a machine, a continuous pyrolyzer that is, uh, is in position to handle the 20 to 25 kg hour per hour of the crop residue. And uh, we're achieving the 30% of uh, uh, this recovers when the biochar uh, produced through the groundnut shell and with the residence time is your four uh, minutes. And uh, sufficiently we are uh, maintaining the temperature as 450 degrees Celsius constantly. And calorific value, if you use this in an energy fuel, so uh, the calorific value uh, it is around uh, 600 kilocalorie per kg is estimated in 58.29% higher than the calorific value of the initial biomass or initial mass fed into the reactor. So the considerable energy enhancement is there. So that can be achieved and 30% uh, is a optimum FE conversion or the yield from the biomass. So as we uh, is well mentioned that uh, is approximately 70% is volatile matter and 30% is the fixed carbon. So 30% uh, we are achieving uh, using this kind of uh, this continuous type of biochar reactor. And uh, another option is the biohydrogen production through thermochemical uh, route. So uh, if we talk about the biohydrogen, so and the hydrogen, this is not uh, hydrogen is an energy carrier, is a not a source of the energy. Uh, so is an energy carrier and it has produced uh, one of the primary source, either it's the fossil fuels or from the nuclear or from the solar or from biomass or from hydrogen, hydro or from your uh, geothermal or urban waste materials or uh, resources. So that is, uh, is a primary source. So further we process it. Our focus is from the biomass only that how we can uh, produce the hydrogen uh, through the biomass. So pure hydrogen gas burning in the air and producing water and heat. So the combustion that uh, heat enable hydrogen act as a fuel. If we combust it, then it act as a fuel. Otherwise, it is an energy carrier, is a no uh, source of the energy. And there's a higher heating value. See the considerable is a 
massive amount of this uh, heating values around 140 megazoos per kg as much as the calorific value and fuel generated the uh, the least pollutions pollutants and compared to the other uh, kind of other fuels and it can store three times more energy in terms of the volume than the gasoline fuel and seven times more than the coal so this is the novelty in the hydrogens and it can produce from water splitting using a biological agent or biologically produced hydrogen is known as a biohydrogens so so it is we have discussed so this is some uh, pathway that how the hydrogen is being generated to the renewable uh, source either in a direct source so splitting direct splitting the water to catalytic process so that can be uh, produce the hydrogen and biomass no doubt uh, in in case of uh, the gasification process uh, we insert the uh, change the gasification media if we go to the steam gasification then certainly uh, the hydrogen uh, production will increase uh, or doubling the hydrogen production uh, if we use the steam as a gasification media then it is around 40 to 45 percent hydrogen is there so that hydrogen can be put into the fuel cell and can generate the electricity or or, or can uh, use for another application in solar photovoltaic wind and in geothermal so we can generate the electricity and then through the electrolytic electrolysis process we can split the water and this can produce the hydrogen so nuclear is no doubt the radioactive, radioactive waste is there the electricity generation coal oil natural gas and fossil fuels so energy input through chemical cracking and steam reforming and then carbon sequestration then uh, we can produce the hydrogen so hydrogen uh, production path this your uh, electrolysis of the water steam reforming of the light hydrocarbon gasification of the coal and thermal cracking and it required more energy uh, if we go for the electrolysis process then certain energy input is more steam steam generation itself is a combustible process more combustible and more energy is required because it is not a dry and saturated steam it is a purely dry steam or uh, then only it can easily be splitted and uh, your gasification of the coal certainly the uh, gasification in, in case of the coal inserting the water then the certainly temperature will reduce and more energy is required then biological process you see this uh, most of the hydrogen pro pro produced uh, from the hydrocarbon is about 95 percent followed uh, followed by the electrolysis so the hydrogen is produced from the hydrocarbon on 95 percent of the hydrogen is produced from the hydrocarbon and only 4% of through electrolysis and only 1% is through the biomass uh, through the biological process. There is a tremendous uh, potential uh, for the research uh, in, in the production of hydrogen through uh, the biomass. So when uh, we can lead in, uh, in the production of the biohydrogen through the biomass. And hydro, see the hydrogen from the biomass uh, uh, pyrolysis. So, so simply the pyrolysis of the biomass thermal decomposition as we discussed and some uh, gasifying agent so as i discussed we can inject the steam but we temp maintain the temperature up to 400 to 600 degrees celsius and uh, that the pressure as 0.1 to 0.5 megapascal this much pressure is required so biomass uh, through this process we can produce this carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, methane, hydrocarbons, and S in the gasification. So hemicellulosic materials that biomass are degraded at temperature of 250 to 300. And cellulosic, that is 325 to 400. And lignin uh, cellulosic or lignin materials that is degraded at 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. So the selection of the material is play a major role. If we go for uh, this lignin, uh, high lignin content material, then certainly more energy is required to degrade this kind of the biomass. So we should select a, that biomass which is the, having the less require less temperature for degradations. So the methane and hydrocarbon produced uh, this can be used for further uh, generation of the hydrogen. So we can further split these things. And pyrolysis of the biomass require less heat than the case of the steam reforming, but uh, for more than the dark fermentation. Dark fermentation is other uh, another options and pyrolysis produce pollutants such as carbon dioxide and other gases. But we assume that whatever CO2 is being 
produced during the combustion of bio biomass or through the gasification process or through pyrolysis process, it being consumed by the coming crop. So let's make it complete carbon neutral process. Uh, so then and the option for greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. So these are some uh, options that uh, practice that reduce the net amount of the heat uh, trapping through the gases releases into the atmosphere. So uh, we can, uh, is a complete conservation measure. So better fuel efficiency that can be achieved, clean burning, so we can improve the efficiency of the combustion process. We can conserve then carbon capturing and produce production efficiency that is to be increased and carbon sequestration and fertilizer efficiency. These are some mode that, that is the path and that can reduce the, uh, or we can tap the uh, greenhouse gases. So climate change uh, uh, mitigation is consisting the action to limit the magnitude or the rate of global warming and its related effects. So this generation, this generally involves the reduction of in the human emissions uh, through the greenhouse gases and fossil fuels. Uh, this is account 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. The main challenges in this uh, substitution is a low carbon economy source. So this is the way that's why it's not popularly, uh, you can say it's not majorly po po is being popularized uh, because it's kind of the low carbon energy in this one. If we compare this kind of the coal, that carbon credit much, much higher than uh, the, the biomass. So the source of greenhouse gas emissions through the carbon dioxide or methane, the fossil fuels, it has in potential, you see 30, 4.6 gigatons carbon dioxide is being produced through the fossil fuel. The cement industries uh, uh, contribute 1.5 tons, deforestation uh, 3.8, wildfire 7, and flaring of the crude oil uh, production, the vast amount of uh, the association gas uh, is a commonly flared as a waste or unusable gas. And methane is no doubt the fossil fuels, 33% contribution is coming from the your fossil fuels and 21% the cattle, they account for two thirds of the methane emitted by the livestock, followed by the buffalo, sheep, and goats. And the human waste and waste water is so 21%. And see the rice cultivation contributing 10% of methane emission in the atmosphere. So, nitrous oxide, uh, this most emissions by the agricultural, especially the meat production, cattle, uh, or fertilizer and animal manure, and uh, some F gases. So, you see the in case of the switch gears of the power sector, semiconductor manufacturing, aluminum productions, and large unknown as kind of uh, source. An option uh, for that, what kind of the option uh, that can be uh, opt uh, for their mitigation purpose. So the reduction is that the industrial process for modification, so we can improve their efficiency, use or introduce the more renewable energy in the process. So demand side efficiency is to be improved. Then there's an option for the reduction. As far as sequestration is concerned, so forest sequestration, more plantation is to be planted and go for uh, engineersly or a genetically modified energy crop, which consume more carbon dioxide and so which yield the more uh, biomass and we can produce the more energy, more biomass, both gasifications process also then agricultural sequestration and CO2 injection into the geological formation. So dumped kind of uh, this uh, soils or put into the aquifer or so. And mineral, mineral carbonization and ocean sequestration. And or through the capturing or the use, so we can capture the methane. Uh, uh, methane capturing means if we dump this biomass in open conditions, certainly will naturally will degrade it. So, but by this degradation, natural degradation of the biomass, is certainly it will release the carbon dioxide, this methane gas. So if we convert into the usable form of the fuel or the other kind of the product, then certainly we can in position to capture the uh, methane. So biomass to energy and biomass to the product. So either go for the liquid products or solid products or direct energy. So throw this one. So that is a option for capturing uh, or the use of the biomass to reduce uh, the uh, carbon emission and we lead for mitigation purpose. An option for the reduction is the industrial process uh, modification. So we can modify this process. Uh, what existing is there for process that we can 
go through energy uh, auditing process as it may be walking through or the mini or maxi auditing so you can identify this, uh, the things that where is the most energy is being is going fast so you can minimize the energy losses so improving uh, the existing uh, process so uh, we can improve the overall efficiency of the systems and this uh, volatility of the fossil fuels and certainly the price increases in difficult to implementing the fuel so switching strategies to be uh, opted uh, so uh, we can give a kind of the strategies to the industries okay being an ag agricultural uh, scientist okay this much is biomass is there and uh, you can switch in prices increasing or non availability of the fossil fuel you can switch to the biomass only minor modification so uh, with the existing systems so that that can use in dual purpose so that kind of things we can suggest to the entrepreneurs or the businessmen and the renewable, renewable energy transitions you know, certainly is play the major role to individual or in the group uh, a customer to reduce the criteria of the pollutants emissions so uh, if we use uh, so for example uh, is, is a kind of dairy industries or a food processing industry so different unit operation require different kind of the heat so for milking uh, or for say the generating the process heat uh, okay it's maybe for milk industries is pasteurization is required so fill more pasteurization is highly less energy is required compared to other steam generation process so that can be fed into uh, there's kind of solar water heating or some gasification uh, based heat exchanger to heat the uh, water and retain their uh, energy or to meet out their energy requirement so high cap what the unfortunate part is that high cost uh, capital cost uh, discourages the use of renewable resources at industrial scale and no doubt is uncertain is there uh, during night time solar solar level energy is not available so if we store this kind of energy then bulk of the storage material is required and certainly increase the capital cost and another option is that uh, reduction mode is the demand side efficiency is to be improved so efficiency approaches provide the environmental ancillaries uh, benefit the opportunity the positive public relationship if we okay on basis of the demand side oh, we can improve uh, that efficiency and generally the energy saving approaches will also accomplish in the greenhouse gas uh, mitigations however this uh, it might not be a case if reduction in the energy uses come from the non fossil fuel based supply that is hydro or the nuclear uh, part of the system and another is a uh, sequestration uh, options the forest agriculture and mineral uh, sequestration is there so i am not discussing in depth uh, so co2 mitigation option that is all so this is all about today's uh, my talk sir so i welcome the questions from audience thank you dr pawar very thank nice. you you have presented all the second generation third generation and fourth generation production of uh, bio biomass based uh, energy systems uh, is there any questions from uh, students or faculty side anybody text questions any text questions so uh, thank you dr pawar there is no thank you sir thank you nice thank you have explained and uh, thanks again for your so nice lecture thank you sir thank you very much and i sincerely express my sincere gratitude to the junagadh agriculture university uh, to uh, professor ian uh, chauhan sir uh, dr dulawat is giving me this opportunity to interact with all you uh, peoples and i am very much happy to share my talk with you thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you thank you next uh, speaker is uh, dr s dadich who is head of the department of soil science and agricultural chemistry from sknu jobnair he will speak on biodegradable waste management biodegradable degradable waste management for production of energy fuel and organic manure am i dr s dadich hello yes i am 
you are muted press l to ah okay so for my side very good afternoon to all and uh, am i audible to you sir yes yes please yes uh, thank you sir thank you and thank you for inviting me to deliver very important talk in this national webinar my topic is biodegradable waste management for production of energy fuel and manure share just a minute sir so yeah i need share now फोकस इज द Uh, we have different kind of biomass uh, recently so many speakers uh, would have um, told very better about all these so i would not waste much more time on this however the forestry resources crop waste and agriculture residues sewage sludge is a very important source then industrial residues which is of organic kind and then animal residues and municipal solid waste these are the waste which are very important and they contain soil nutrients and they can be converted into energy and manure also so presently what we are practicing are the decomposition in aerobic way which is a fresh organic matter in presence of oxygen is converted into compost and carbon dioxide is evolved and energy is liberated during this process now the thing is that uh the process is uh, however it is good process but it is uh, time consuming labor consuming that is why farmers are not adapting well this process and that is why most of the residues are being burnt or thrown and we can opt one more management option that is anaerobic decomposition which will lead to production of biogas uh, which is a methane and also as slurry having good content of nutrients bio slurry which will be a good manure so the i would not waste time but however the history of biogas in 1808 it was discovered as methane then in 1957 a british british inventor he modified his car to run based on biogas and now we are running in india also in my project also we have run car very well in Uh, running based on fuel which is bio cng purified gas so when we talk about the composition of organic residues it contains 75% moisture rest remaining 25% they are containing carbon oxygen hydrogen nitrogen and 1 to 3% mineral matter which is very important which is mined from the soil which should be recycled otherwise soil health is deteriorating so this compound now further what happens this contains cellulose hemicellulose they are less and slow decomposure that is why the decomposition process is lengthy we can go for anaerobic decomposition by narrowing down the cn ratio and we can con convert this carbon dioxide of this cellulose also into methane gas which is ch4 flammable gas a very we all know very Uh, complex process of carbon assimilation by the plant only the plant they have capability to synthesize and assimilate uh, atmospheric carbon into organic carbon which is a rich source of uh, habitat and source of plant nutrients in the soil presently in india what we are seeing here so much this much of the surplus of the waste are being generated annually and almost about 700 million ton gross potential of the agricultural waste are generated annually which has great potential for conversion into manure as well as in conversion in biogas further uh, our indian strength is we are having 300 million numbers of total bovines 
and total livestock population reaches up to 512 million numbers this is big resource for energy production as well as manure production and by this what we can convert 300 million bovine population uh, we are having in india they can uh, they are uh, excreting 980 million tons of dung annually this 980 million ton of dung if converted which will generate 6.38 into 10 about 10 cubic meter of biogas this is a very good um, um, very good quantity further this will produce 350 million tons of the manure which can be utilized for restoration of soil fertility and production of uh, crops so biogas what we have discussed is a clean environment friendly fuel that can be obtained by anaerobic decomposition and it is a very important renewable energy source for rural india and further um, the contribution of biogas in uh, technology for rural india it will be cheap source because nowadays what we are seeing here is uh, we are getting 850 almost the lpg gas cylinder cost has reached up to uh, 825 rupees more than 800 rupees so in that context it will be a very good and cheap source and uh, further the it will be a effective convenient way for sanitary disposal of human excreta for improving hygiene conditions and for uh restoration of soil fertility and more more important is smoke less domestic fuel which will reduce incidence for eye and lung diseases in india so these are the present situations all over the country and you can see what we uh, are disposing cattle dung which is uh, i have uh, just uh, quoted that 300 bovines they are producing 980 Million ton of the cattle dung and uh, dung with the dung situation is this one. The farmer are throwing this here and there. Proper decomposition is not inhibited, and due to this, uh, due to this pollution is a one problem. Further, the nutrient mining from the soil and soil is getting in fertile. Further, we are throwing uh, cattle dung in this way. Then. very important is non edible feed for animal and the crop waste which are generating and we are that is not edible for the animal this is being burnt in eat butta brick battas or being burnt by the farmer these are the very common pigs of all over the india this is the burning situation what we see this burning not only burns nutrients of the soil but a unique Uh, property of the plant for assimilation of carbon is also being burnt here then so many of the soil microbes here they are also lost due to the high temperature by burning in the soil so soil biota is also being disturbed this due to this situation these are some of the pigs we every year see by the farmers and even in case of rajasthan when i talk rajasthan maybe of the gujarat all right Uh, bajra husk pearl millet husk is one of very important crop residue it has higher cn ratio so the decomposition rate is very low that is why after bajra farmers burn bajra husk which is a potential source of soil nutrient and a potential source for energy and fuel generation these are uh, some of the pics of the mandis what we see we are generating farmer is producing from his field and the, they are containing many more nutrients in the soil and energy itself also what we'll i we have discussed which can be converted into methane and can be converted in electricity and all those this is being thrown or being burnt which is ultimately loss of our soils these are the common pigs of the cattle dung further very important here is that post harvest losses through the fruits and vegetables in india almost 18 to 25% of the post harvest losses are there which are uh, mined from the soil this is a rich source biodegradable waste but it is um, almost lost in this way we see somewhere uh, the post harvest losses whatever not useful but it is of a biodegradable kind it can be converted into manure and energy it is being thrown or dumped somewhere creating pollution which is not eco friendly also 
So this is the farmer's pick. Uh, what I have taken is very important. When surplus of the fruit and vegetable or crop paste is generated, this kind of picks are very common. Farmers throw these somewhere uh, nearby field or nearby roads and all those because farmer is having surplus or it is somewhat defected pieces, but it is biodegradable. It is very good and rich source of uh, resource as a manure resource maybe as producing for energy fuel etc so this one this is a we generally see somewhere on a juice centers and all these kind of waste are being generated further the kitchen waste which is also a biodegradable waste but which is a very important uh, having high calorific value for production of biogas and uh, even fuel this is being thrown this kind of pigs are very common in Mary's gardens and somewhere in social functions. This much of high calorific value, nutrient rich, biodegradable uh, products, they are being thrown, dumped into lagoons and all this. After all, they have come from the soil. And due to these practices, what is happening here is in 1950, we observed deficiency of nitrogen. Then in 1960, we observed deficiency of iron along with nitrogen. Then up to the 1965 deficiency of phosphorus and zinc was observed. And up to the 70 deficiency of K also included in this group. Up to 75 sulfur deficiency included in this group and up to 80 manganese deficiency is also has also included in this group. And uh, do, uh, up to 2020 these much nutrients are deficiency and what can be product up to 250 2050, so many of the nutrients will be deficient, which will cause multi nutrient deficiency. How will we will cope up is a challenging situation for India. Presently, here almost we are <coughs> producing 300 million ton of food grains. 300 million ton of food grain, they require almost 40 million ton of the nutrient. So, there is initially at present gap of 8 to 10 million tons. And up to 2025, the requirement of nutrient for production of 350 million ton food grain will be 45 million ton nutrients around. So nutrient deficiency is there. There is already deficient. We are deficient almost 10 million ton nutrients. So this is a good technology. We can convert this biodegradable waste into manure as well as in energy. And we can make our soil fertile and maintain soil health also. That is the thing. And even in India, what a very interesting data is that 67 million tons of food is wasted every year, which is valued around 92,000 crore rupees, which is enough to feed all the Bihar. And what will be due to this, the pollution, what we are observing, our water bodies are being polluted, bacteria and some other microbes are also being multiplied and disseminated, creating and uh, spreading diseases. All the water bodies, they are also being <clears throat> polluted and due to this, biodiversity loss is also a very important factor here because polluted uh, water is there in water bodies. So, loss of biodiversity is there due to spreading diseases in birds, which is very common nowadays. We are listening in India. Before few days, we were listening that um, birds are dying. Last year in Sambar Lake, we have heard that migratory birds, so many in the lakes, migratory birds have died. And economic loss, definitely it is economic loss also. And the opportunity is we must uh, convert this waste, very important biodegradable waste, into compost as well as in biogas. And it will give freedom. Biogas technology will give freedom from the smoke. Then very interesting is that World Health Organization um, Jason WHO has estimated that about 5 lakhs deaths in India alone, it is due to indoor air pollution caused by unclean cooking fuel. These com common picks are there and I would like to share my experience also here. Um, almost all the catretic problems in women are many more in India. This is due to because of this smog and recently before one month, my mother also Mm, uh, passed through catretic operation because she is cooking fuel on chula. So this is smoke is a major problem. So it, it is all over the country. So we can shift into biogas technology. 
by managing biodegradable waste for production of energy, fuel, and organic manure. So this is rich potential, which is very common. We are throwing. We can convert this all in aerobic mode. And further, what nowadays technological advancement is there? Uh, some of the centers have prepared consortia of rapid decomposers. So we can add these decomposer in uh, into the waste, and we can convert that in compost. Particularly, cellulose decomposing fungi and actinomycete uh, decomposers are also available all over the country. We can opt this option. Now, very important is that how to get segregated waste. So, initially, this we have told that this was of the waste 700 million tons of the um, uh, residues or agro waste are there. Further, or if we generally talk about per capita per day generation is 500 gram of biodegradable waste 500 gram of the waste out of this 500 gram waste being generated per capita per day almost 50 percent we can say that almost about 250 gram of the biodegradable waste is being generated uh, daily per capita and municipality level we can plan to collect this biodegradable waste separately for decomposition either in anaerobic way or in aerobic way. In aerobic way, we can have vermicomposting also, we can have composting, we can have NADAP composting, aerobic method also. And then this Mundi waste or whatever waste is there, anaerobically we can convert it into biogas and the technology is very simple. Steps are there, hydrolysis, acetogenesis, acetogenesis and methanogenesis. Uh, I think so many of the researchers are here joined in this <clears throat> webinar. Here, very important things are there. Whatever the biodegradable waste is there, hydrolysis is a, a thing. Then acetogenesis process and acetogenesis process. In these processes, acid is formed. Then methanogenic bacteria acts on that produced to um, produce methane gas. Here, what is happening? Acid is being produced here. Methanogens require some higher uh, pH. So it is also a researchable issue that how can we maintain pH of the digester at this stage so that um, a more quantity of methane can, can be produced. These are the biogas plants which we see in our India. This is our Rajasthan plant in Bilwara. Goshala is making CNG gas from this biodegradable waste. And initially, this raw biogas, uh, I think what we have discussed, you, you all know if it is more than 50% methane, it is flammable. So other rest of impurities are there, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and water vapor. So this is methane directly. We can use it in cooking as a fuel. Um, in a burner also, we can lighten our lamp. and. The slurry coming out from this plant can be directly used in the field. This, this can be done here. The lamp can be burned and it will it will be lighten our uh, the room. And uh, this biogas directly can be paid to the generator, which can produce electricity also. But the life of generator decreases because hydrogen sulfide and moisture is there. Then um, this can be purified for making CNG also. The slurry coming out with this plant, very advancement is there. This is dewatering system. Basically, main problem is that of this in this system is that liquid slurry is coming out and a handling problem is there. So this slurry can be dried in dewatering system. That water which is dewatered can be recycled and reused in the director no, digester. Then this slurry coming out by this biodigester, it is having many more nutrients and nitrogen, particularly when talk, we talk, it is having 1.4 to 1.8% of the nitrogen almost. And whereas our FYM farmyard manure, which we are preparing in aerobic decomposition method, as well as compost, they are containing only 0.5% nitrogen. So it is having three times higher nitrogen, which is very important uh, manure for the purpose and can be directly used. Rest of the other nutrients are also higher because losses of nutrients is checked in this process. Presently in India, what we are opting floating dome type and fixed dome type biogas plants. 
and at farmer level uh, uh, fake dome type biogas plants are very successful if we can see here the digester inlet tank and outlet tank and we have constructed some of the uh, biogas plants like this and this is our own biogas plant which we have made at our institution here also um, fixed dome type some complicated process is there during the construction by <clears throat> making this round shape however it is long and durable plant and this is one case study what i want to share in bilwada district of rajasthan one farmer is using this technology although he is having a floating dome type biogas plant but since 1984 since 1984 so we can say here it is almost 35 years so he is using since the, for almost 35 years and he is saving almost 1400 rupees per month and manure is preparing that is another thing this is a very simple technology and even we can transport this biogas in balloon somewhere also that's also very um, very very important and very relevant in present context further when we if we uh, purify this biogas by technology purification methods vpa technology and other we can maintain more than if we can maintain more than 90% of the methane it is it may be used for automobile purpose also and uh, we can use for our this is what they plan we can use in our motorcycle bike even in our uh, trucks and we can fill cylinders also even in student train is being run on based on biogas similarly we in rajasthan also in uh, bilwada when i was working at bilwada in research station at mpt udaipur we have constructed a 120 cubic meter per day biogas plant which is re having recent ad advanced features in that um, for maintaining temperature this is galvanized pipes have been um, spread over this and uh, the warm water is being flowed here to maintain the temperature because very important is that in biogas production in winter season or cooler temperature when temperature falls below 20 degree celsius production of biogas is uh, lesser so the maintaining the temperature in digester is very important so this is circulation of water heat hot water maintains the temperature this can be used and likewise here we can see here we have also started filling cylinders by biogas at bilwada when i was there and the same was um, inaugurated by sri om prakash ji mathur a national leader and mp of rajya sabha on Seventeen mm, March two zero one eight, two thousand eight. And here we have demonstrated vehicle based of um, running based on the bio CNG because bio CNG is a very good fuel for the cars. And nowadays also the prices of uh, petrol, diesel they are um, reaching up to the highest level. Price hikes are there in that condition. biodegradable waste which is being generated at our, our household can be a good and potential source for cng making for fulfilling the demand of fuel of our vehicles at farm level this was our uh, inaugural and what we have produced 80 units of electricity if this what is important when this cng uh, bio cng it is fed to the generator life of generator is also not disturbed it is long life and that can be con uh, converted into electricity also that we can do then there are so many schemes we have organized some winter schools of icr for uh, um, uh, production of bio cng and organic manure from biodegradable here in this peak this is a uh, farm goshala they are you know preparing food. they are producing biogas from the cattle dung this biogas is being used for cooking fuel and other purposes slurry is being used in integrated farming system model of that particular goshala farm and this is a, um, being practiced very nicely so this was our uh, some of the glimpses of icr summer school on bio cng where our honorable vice chancellor of mpt udaipur 
all dr ernas ratod sir also chaired the session and at that time he was deputy director general of ic then further in durgapura jaipur also same kind of um, winter school be organized here advances in organic manure production and biogas technology for entrepreneurial development and empowerment of farmers so we tried to cope up that the technology should reach to the farmer for entrepreneurship development and this was also our very good um, winter school and in this our winter school program honorable governor of rajasthan sri kalraj misra ji chaired he was the chief guest of inaugural session because he was very much impressed that winter school on advances in organic manure production from biogas technology is being organized so it was our proud moment that honorable governor inaugurated winter school um, program of icr on biogas technology so some of publications we released at the same time which were very useful for the farmers one was for biogas technology and one publication for organic manure all the organic manures have been in included in this booklet and uh, for the uh, whoever wants i will share pdf copy to all of the audience and delegates who can use this uh, folder uh, for their purpose so this was our program and then then what i want to focus here for the entrepreneurs and all that one government of india scheme is there gobardhan yojana which is galvanized organic bio agro resource uh, gobar and it is uh, considered as dhan means money so this is very important scheme of government of india under swachh bharat mission so each gram panchayat they can get benefit of this uh, gobardhan yojana for product for um, installing biogas plant or for uh, making compost plant at uh, panchayat level there are different different subsidy levels less than 150 household level there is subsidy of 7 lakh Uh, up to 300 more than 300 household levels there is subsidy of 10 lakh and so on so the panchayats can of this so our actions and agencies can help in this work also for extending this technology to the panchayat level and even entrepreneurs can also avail the benefit of this scheme for the production of um, for the production of biogas as well as for production of manure further mnre one important in scheme of mnre is there um, which is new national biogas and organic manure program scheme i think it is all over spread all over the country in this scheme biofuel agencies are structured in each state which is monitored by different department like in rajasthan they are through rural development and panchayati raj vibhag in gujarat also i think this is from rural development and panchayati raj vibhag and in other states also similar pattern is there here the 2 to 6 cubic meter by on 2 to 6 cubic meter biogas plant an amount of subsidy 12000 to 13000 is released by this mnre through the state level agency so a farmer can avail the benefit of this subsidy for production of dean bandu model or fixed dome type biogas plant or whatever he wants in this budget limit now my very important uh, slide here i would like to discuss to all the delegates is that some of the researchable is issues which i found during my work uh, at the time of biodegradable waste management is one very important issue which is researchable issue is collection of biodegradable waste nowadays all the waste biodegradable or non biodegradable they are collectively kept uh, collected means mixed by the uh, users panchayats or nagar palikas municipality <coughs> and dumped somewhere here at initial level what can be intervention can be done here for collection of biodegradable waste separately what can we do some extension researchers can also work in this some social researchers can also work in this or and this is some engineering side personals can also develop some such kind of uh, um, engineering side technology which can se segregate biodegradable waste at low cost this is very important then segregation of this waste can be done if not uh, segregated this can be done 
then very important is the pretreatment of substrates so what happens here most of the organic waste agricultural waste are having high cellulose content and lignin content so lignin is a, such a substance which is not degraded decomposed easily so how can we degrade this lignin at initial level which is important further um, this hydroxy methyl perfural formation how can we check this hmf formation at the time of decomposition is also very important and it is also a researchable issue then compression and bottling in india the problem is that licensing issues the process is very lengthy and one um, individual entrepreneur uh, he easily he cannot get license so some simplicity some simplification is required in process of licensing issues in compression and bottling of biogen and what i have focused earlier regulation of ph of the digester because during the acidogenesis and acetogenesis acid is formed how can we maintain ph at that time and initially at the time of uh, hydrolysis in digestion ph requirement uh, you know we all the biodegradable waste are coming and being dumped in the digester being fed in the digester so some acid forming uh, substances are also there so the acidic condition will arise already the acidogenesis and acetogenesis will form acid and acidic components are also there already so the methanogens will not multiply fast so initially to maintain the ph is important and very important decomposers are available for aerobic decomposition but isolation and multiplication of rapid waste decomposing microbes in under anaerobic condition is required so some research may be done in this field also then reduction of hydraulic retention time in now higher cn ratio substance they are having higher hrt and cattle dung and they itself have almost 30 days hrt how can we reduce this hrt to produce more biogas to fulfill our fuel demand is very important then methane enrichment techniques in some of the calorific high calorific value substances are there some low calorific value substances are there how can we um, mix and how can enrich methane content uh, in biogas technology because uh, more of the methane will be there more of the potential of gas will be there this is very simple so this is very important researchable issue then the thing is that dissemination of technology and demonstrations is still in india many of the farmers and many of the stakeholders are not aware that it is the viable technology so some demonstration and the dissemination in technological advances are required then all over in the agriculture sector since we are agriculture released this so effect of slurry in the field some research is required because less of the research is being done has done in this field then this slurry how can we fortify this slurry this slurry can be fortified with so many of the minerals iron sulfate and likewise that and what can we do by fortifying this slurry this fortified bio slurry will be a good source of plant nutrients so it is also very important researchable issue further the researchable issue is slurry dewatering system because this is a costly instrument which is slurry dewatering system so some uh, low cost uh, dewatering system should be developed so that at small uh, biogas plants also it can be installed and a farmer can use very easily that he is getting dried slurry and the water which is the water coming out that is being recycled and reused or that water can be directly used in the field further what i observed is that government initiatives for promotion of biogas technology is required so that the dissemination can be made fast these are some of the researchable issues what i found and with this i would like to thank you and i would like to welcome the questions of the delegates thank you sir abu isko band kar there are any questions please from dr dadij okay Any text questions, 
uh, with your own work also you have substituted it very nicely uh, here i want to request my thank you sir thank you very much uh, sir for having patience to listen me because the time is, time constraint is there i reduced slide because already there was a meeting of asia pacific organization team uh, so the time was late. however at this time at 5 o'clock all the audience uh, they were listening delegate me so thank you all sir for listening me and giving me opportunity to share my words and my thoughts with you all thank you very much sir obviously it's our pleasure thank you again dr dadish uh, now i request our co-chairman dr sudhir jain if he wants to say something dr. yeah sudhir jain thank you thank you very much sir i was listening to all the speakers and uh, really i congratulate uh, first of all to the organizers and particularly dr pm johan saab uh, that uh, he arranged uh, such unmute yourself dr sudhir uh, unmute uh, mute ho jata hai sir uh thank you very much sir ha ji uh, that was uh, really nice to listen all the speakers of this particular session and before that i would like to congratulate to all of you and to the organizers and particularly to dr pm chohan uh for arranging uh, such a nice event and particularly with the relevant topic uh, on energy issues so that is very much required and all of us know and really the speakers uh, presented nicely that is uh, my comment and it was really a worth information to jot down and put up in a nice shape so that all uh, i wanted to tell on this occasion because all the scientists uh, uh, dr sandeep gangil and dr madhuri nara and dr dadish and dr anil pawar so all are working in this particular field uh, for a very long period and their work is really commendable the only thing i would like to mention here uh, that uh, whatever research is being done that now it is very much required that in a very concrete way how we are in a position to deliver the things to really uh, users so they can take away the technology now this uh, this is the right time uh, because uh, if we talk of biogas technology then uh, really i have seen the time in the year 85 uh, to 90 so it was being forced by the government just that the targets were given that uh, the farmers should uh, agencies government agencies should install forcefully biogas plant to uh, their fields their households uh, so that was a very uh, critical phase but nowadays what i am observing because i am also running uh, biogas development and training center uh, that is a mnre project so now the demand is coming from user side even uh, just now i was having uh, during the past one hour two three calls that they constructed already the biogas plant and they are now uh, requesting me that how they will get the subsidy so about uh, 30 to 40000 is being invested by the user so that is uh, acceptable technology and whenever we talk of cng and uh, that that uh, technology is yet to be uh get popular in the uh, user area and uh, biochar also is a lot of work is being done and now it is time that it should be implemented it should be carry over to the farmers field that's all from my side thank you very much uh, thank you dr sudeep jain again uh, i thank all the speakers very nicely they have uh, summarized the work what they did in their field and presented the and very elaborated uh, about their uh, topics and uh, justified what uh, topic they have chosen particularly suppose dr sandeep gangil he is gone waste to wealth and very nicely he has discussed these uh, things in his speech 
Dr. Madhuri Nara, he, he also uh, given a very good approach that how the spready is working and what uh, on-field work spready is doing uh, with all technology developed and they are establishing plants in different uh, with different organizations. Similarly, Dr. N. L. Pawar, oh, he talked about the thermochemical conversion of biomass and all types of uh, all generations uh, uh, con conversion of different systems. He also very well elaborated. Dr. Dadij also slightly he told on different aspects of like biodegradable waste management. And what work he did, he's also elaborated that work in his uh, speech. So I think all the four speakers, they did justice with their uh, topics and very nicely they have presented. I again thank all of them. And I thank our uh, co-chairman and Dr. Sudhir Jain with patience. He was with us for more than three and a half hours. So thank you, sir. And uh, our well done, sir. report here also. Professor Yudi Dobaria, he also very nicely uh, noting down everything whatsoever is the proceedings are going on. So thanks to all of them and all the uh, faculty members here. I thank all of you for uh, remaining present in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So now the formal. Thank you, uh, Dr. N.K. Gautia Saab, the chairman of this session, uh, for handling this session very nicely. And, uh, uh, in, and all the four speakers, particularly in Dr. Uh, uh, Gagil Saab, the LCPC of the CRP project, and the head of department in CI Bhopal. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anil Bawar, the assistant professor at the MPUAT Udaipur. Dr. Uh, S. Dajit, Dajit. Uh, he is the uh, uh, head of department at the soil and, uh, and chemistry department, as well as the uh, Dr. Madhuri Nara at uh, Sprary. Uh, you know, we have selected this uh, uh, speakers uh, since uh, we are we know that uh, their uh, uh, expertise in this area and uh, in, in really as uh, the chairman sir has said that they have delivered the very nice topic and, uh, and uh, the students are benefited uh, with their uh, expert uh, uh, knowledge. I'm very much thankful to all the four speakers and uh, especially the chairman sir that uh, handling the chairman uh, this session since last uh, uh, as a three and a half hours. Uh, I'm also thankful to the uh, uh, professor, uh, Dr. Sudhir Jensab, uh, is my good friend and uh, on only one phone call, he's uh, associated with us and uh, give the full time today. So thank you very much, Jensab. Uh, Welcome. I'm also thankful to all the, my friends and colleagues, particularly Dr. Uh, uh, K.V. Jhala Saab, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, all the all the Dulawaji, then the Dr. Dobaria, uh, Professor Kelaya, and uh, all the friends. Thank you very much for uh, joining this session. And uh, tomorrow we will assemble at uh, nine o'clock for the technical session two. And uh, I hope that everybody will be uh, available. All the audience, students, and faculty, and uh, the industry session and tomorrow evening there is an industry session and then after a, a there is a uh, plenary session and uh, in morning session there is a very important uh, talk is there by uh, Miss Neelam Patel at 11 o'clock the member of the Niti IO. so I request all of you to join in morning thank you all thank you thank you